Acid Bath by Vasilos Garson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Feaster. Acid Bath. <laughs> the Starway's lone watcher had experienced some odd developments in his single nerve-fraught job in the asteroid, but nothing like the weird twenty-one-day liquid test devised by the invading Steel Blues. John Carl was bolting in a new baffle plate on the stationary rocket engine. It was a tedious job, and took all his concentration, so he wasn't paying too much attention to what was going on in other parts of the little asteroid. He didn't see the peculiar blue spaceship, its rockets throttled down, as it drifted to land only a few hundred yards away from his plastic igloo. Nor did he see the half-dozen steel-blue creatures slide out of the peculiar vessel's airlock. It was only as he crawled out of the depths of the rocket power plant that he realized something was wrong. By then it was almost too late. The six blue figures were only fifty feet away, approaching him at a lope. John Carl took one look and went bounding over the asteroid's rocky slopes in fifty-foot bounds. When you're a lone watcher and strangers catch you unawares, you don't stand still. You move fast. It's the watcher's first rule. Stay alive. An Earth ship may depend upon your life. As he fled, John Carl cursed softly under his breath. The automatic alarm should have shrilled out a warning. Then he saved as much of his breath as he could, as some sort of power wave tore up the rocky sward to his left. He twisted and zigzagged in his flight, trying to get out of sight of the strangers. Once hidden from their eyes, he could cut back and head for the underground entrance to the service station. He glanced back, finally. Two of the steel-blue creatures were jackrabbiting after him, and rapidly closing the distance. John Carl unsheathed the stub-ray pistol at his side, turning the oxygen dial up for greater exertion, increased the gravity pull of his spacesuit boots as he neared the ravine he'd been racing for. The oxygen was just taking hold when he hit the lip of the ravine and began sprinting through its man-high, bush-strewn course. The power ray from behind ripped up great gobs of the sheltering bushes, but running naturally, bent close to the bottom of the ravine, John Carl dodged the bare spots. The oxygen made the tremendous exertion easy for his lungs as he sped down the dim trail, hidden from the two steel-blue stalkers. He eluded them, temporarily at least, John Carl decided, when he finally edged off the dim trail and watched for movement along the route behind him. He stood up, finally pushing aside the leafy overhang of a bush and looked for landmarks along the edge of the ravine. He found one, a stubby bush shaped like a Maltese cross, clinging to the lip of the ravine. The hidden entrance to the service station wasn't far off. His pistol held ready. He moved quietly on down the ravine until the old water course made an abrupt hairpin turn. Instead of following around the sharp bend, John Carl moved straight ahead through the overhanging bushes until he came to a dense thicket. Dropping to his hands and knees, he worked his way under the edge of the thicket, into a hollowed-out space in the center. There, just ahead of him, was the lock leading to the service station. Slipping a key out of a leg pouch in the spacesuit, he jabbed it into the center of the lock, opening the lever housing. He pulled strongly at the lever. With a hiss of escaping air, the lock swung open. John Carl darted inside, the lock closing softly behind him. At the end of the long tunnel, he stepped to the televisor, which was fixed on the area surrounding the station. John Carl saw none of the steel-blue creatures, but he saw their ship, it squatted like a smashed-down kid's top, its lock shut tight. He turned the televisor to its widest range and finally spotted one of the steel blues. He was looking into the stationary rocket engine. As Carl watched, a second steel blue came crawling out of the ship. The two steel blues moved towards the center of the televisor range. They're coming towards the station, Carl thought grimly. Carl examined the two creatures. They were of steel blue color from the crown of their egg-shaped heads to the tips of their walking appendages. They were about the height of Carl, six feet, but where he tapered from broad shoulders to flat hips, they were straight down. They had no legs, just appendages, many jointed, that stretched and shrank independent of each other, but keeping the cylindrical body with its four pairs of tentacles on a level balance. Where their eyes would have been was an elliptical-shaped lens, covering half the egg head, with its converging ends curving around the sides of the head. Robots, John gauged immediately. But where were their masters? The Steel Blues moved out of the range of the televisor. A minute later, John heard a pounding from the station upstairs. He chuckled. They were like the wolf of pre-atomic days who huffed and puffed and blew the house down. The outer shell of the station was formed from stearolite, 
the toughest metal in the solar system. With the self-sealing lock of the same resistant material, a mere pounding was nothing. John thought he'd have to look-see anyway. He went to the steel ladder, leading to the station's power plant and the televisor that could look into every room within the station. He heaved a slight sigh when he reached the power room, for right at his hand were weapons to blast the ship from the asteroid. John adjusted one televisor to take in the lock of the station. His teeth suddenly clamped down on his lower lip. Those steel blues were pounding holes into the stearolite with round-headed metal clubs. But it was impossible. Stearolite didn't break up that easily. John leapt to a row of studs, lining up the revolving turret which capped the station so that its thin fin pointed at the squat ship of the invaders. Then he went to the atomic cannon's firing buttons. He pressed first the yellow, then the blue button, finally the red one. The thin fin, the cannon's sight, split in half as the turret opened and the coiled nose of the cannon protruded. There was a soundless flash, then a sharp crack. John was dumbfounded when he saw the bolt ricochet off the ship. This was no ship of the solar system. There was nothing that could withstand even the slightest jolt of power given by the station's cannon on any of the sun's worlds. But what was this? A piece of the ship had changed. A bubble of metal like a huge drop of blue wax drifted off the vessel and struck the rocket of the asteroid. It steamed and ran in rivulets. Then he pushed the red one again. Then, abruptly, he was on the floor of the power room, his legs strangely cut up from under him. He tried to move, then lay flaccid. His arms seemed all right and tried to lever himself in an upright position. Damn it! He seemed as if he were paralyzed from the waist down. But it couldn't happen that suddenly. He turned his head. A steel blue was facing him. A forked tentacle held a square black box. John could read nothing in that metallic face. He said, voice muffled by the confines of his plastic helmet, Who are you? I am. There was a rising inflection in the answer. A steel blue. There were no lips on the steel blue's face to move. That's what I have named you, John Krell said. But what are you? A robot, came the immediate answer. John was quite sure that the Steel Blue was telepathic. Yes, the Steel Blue answered. We talk in the language of the mind. Come, he said peremptorily, monitoring the square black box. The paralysis left Carl's legs. He followed the Steel Blue, aware that the lens he'd seen of the creature's face had a counterpart on the back of the egg head. Eyes in the back of his head, John thought. That's quite an innovation. Thank you, Steel Blue said. There wasn't much fear in John Carl's mind. Psychiatrists had proved that when he'd applied for his high-paying but man-killing job as a lone watcher in the solar system's starways. He had little fear now, only curiosity. These Steel Blues didn't seem inimical. They could have snuffed out my life very simply. Perhaps they and Solarians can be friends. Steel Blue chuckled. John followed him through the sundering lock of the station. Carl stopped for a moment to examine the wreckage of the lock. It had been punched full of holes, as if it had been some soft cheese instead of a metal, which Earthmen have spent nearly a century perfecting. We appreciate your compliment, Steel Blue said. But that metal also is found on our world. It is probably the softest and most malleable we have. We were surprised you, Earthmen, is it? Use it as a protective metal. Why are you in the system? John asked, hardly expecting an answer. It came anyway. For the same reason you Earthmen are reaching out further into your system. We need living room. You have strategically placed planets for us to use. We will use them. John sighed. For four hundred years, scientists had been preaching preparedness as Earth flung her ships into the reaches of the solar system, taking the first long step towards the conquest of space. There are other races somewhere, they argued, as strong and smart as man, many of them so transcending man in mental and inventive powers that we must be prepared to strike the minute danger shows. Now, here was the answer to the scientists' warning, invasion by extraterrestrials. What did you say? asked Steel Blue. I cannot understand. Just thinking to myself, John answered, it was a welcome surprise. Apparently his thoughts had to be directed outward rather than inward in order for the Steel Blue to read it. He followed the Steel Blue into the gaping lock of the invader's spaceship, wondering how he could warn Earth. The space patrol cruiser was due for refueling at its service station in twenty-one days, but by that time he would probably be moldering in the rocky dust of the asteroid. 
It was pitch dark within the ship, but the Steel Blue seemed to have no trouble at all maneuvering through the maze of corridors. John followed him, attached to one tentacle. Finally, John and his guide entered a circular room, bright with light, streaming from a glass-like, bulging skylight. They apparently were near topside of the vessel. A Steel Blue, more massive than his guide and with four more pairs of tentacles, including two short ones that grew from the top of its head, spoke out. This is the Violator. John Steelbluke nodded. You know the penalty. Carry it out. He also is an inhabitant of this system, John's guide added. Examine him first, then give him the death. John Carl shrugged as he was led from the lighted room through more corridors. If it got too bad, he still had the subray pistol. Anyway, he was curious. He'd taken on the lonely, nerve-wracking job of service station attendant just to see what it offered. Here was a part of it, and it was certainly something new. This is the examination room, his steel blue said, almost contemptuously. A green effulgence surrounded him. There was a hiss. Simultaneously, as the tiny microphones on the outside of his suit picked up the hiss, he felt a chill go through his body. Then it seemed as if a half-dozen hands were inside him, examining his internal organs. His stomach contracted. He felt a squeeze on his heart. His lungs tickled. There were several more queer motions inside his body. Then another steel-blue voice said, He is a soft metal creature, made up of metals that melt at a very low temperature. He also contains a liquid whose markup I cannot ascertain by ray probe. Bring him back when the torture is done. John Carl grinned a little trifly. What kind of torture could this be? Would it last twenty-one days? He glanced at the chronometer on his wrist. John's steel blue led him out of the alien ship and halted expectantly just outside the ship's lock. John waited, too. He thought of the subray pistol holtered in his hip. Shoot my way out? It'd be fun while it lasted. But he toted up the disadvantages. He either would have had to find a hiding space in the asteroid, and, if the Steel Blue wanted him bad enough, they could tear the whole place to pieces, or somehow get aboard the little life ship hidden in the service station. In that, he would just be a sitting duck. He struggled off the slight temptation to use the pistol. He was still curious. And he was interested in staying alive as long as possible. There was a remote chance he might warn the SP ship. Unconsciously, he glanced towards his belt to see the little power pack which if under ideal conditions, could finger out 50,000 miles into space. If he could somehow stay alive the 21 days, he might be able to warn the patrol. He couldn't do it by attempting to flee, for his life would be snuffed out immediately. The Steel Blue said quietly, It might be ironical to let you warn that SP ship you keep thinking about, but we know your weapons now. Already our ship is equipped with a force field designed especially to deflect your atomic guns. John Carl covered up his thoughts quickly. They can delve deeper than the surface of the mind. Or wasn't I keeping a leash on my thoughts? The Steel Blue chuckled. You get absent-minded, is it? Every once in a while. Just then, four other Steel Blues appeared, lugging great sheets of plastic and various other equipments. They dumped their loads and began unbundling them. Working swiftly, they built a plastic igloo, smaller than the living room on the larger service station igloo. They ranged instruments inside, one of them John Krall recognized as an air pump from within the station, and they laid out a pallet. When they were done, John saw a miniature reproduction of the service station, lacking only the cannon cap and fin, and with clear plastic walls instead of the opaqueness of the other. His steel blue said, We have reproduced the atmosphere of your station so you can be watched while you undergo the torture under the normal conditions of your life. What is this torture? John Carl asked. The answer was almost caressing. It is a liquid we use to dissolve metals. It causes joints to harden if even so much as a drop remains on it long. It eats away the metal, leaving a scaly residue which crumbles, eventually, into dust. We will dilute it with a harmless liquid for you, since Number One does not wish you to die instantly. Enter your... The Steel Blue hesitated. Mausoleum. You die in your own atmosphere. However, we took the liberty of purifying it. There were dangerous elements in it. John walked into the little igloo. The steel blues sealed the lock, fingered dials and switches on the outside. 
John's spacesuit deflated. Pressure was building up in the igloo. He took a sample of the air, found it was good, although quite rich in oxygen compared to what he'd been using in the service station in his suit. With a sigh of relief, he took off his helmet and gulped huge draughts of air. He sat down on the pallet and waited for the torture to begin. The Steel Blues crowded about the igloo, staring at him through elliptical eyes. Apparently, they too were waiting for the torture to begin. John thought the excess of oxygen was making him light-headed. He stared at a cylinder which was beginning to sprout tentacles from the center. He rubbed his eyes and looked again. An opening, like the adjustable eyepiece of a space scope, was appearing in the center of the cylinder. A square glass-like tumbler sat in the opening, disclosed a four-foot cylinder that had sprouted tentacles. It contained a yellowish liquid. One of the tentacles reached into the opening and clasped the glass. The opening closed, and the cylinder, propelled by locomotor appendages, moved towards John. He didn't like the looks of the liquid in the tumbler. It looked like an acid of some sort. He raised to his feet. He unsheathed the subray pistol and prepared to blast the cylinder. The cylinder moved so fast John felt his eyes jump in his head. He brought the subray gun up, but he was helpless. The pistol kept on going up. With a deft movement, one of the tentacles had speared it from his hand and was holding it out of his reach. John kicked at the glass in the cylinder's hand, but he was too slow. Two tentacles gripped the kicked leg. Another struck him in the chest, knocking him to the pallet. The same tentacle, assisted by a new one, pinioned his shoulders. Four tentacles held him supine. The cylinder lifted a glass-like cap from the tumbler of liquid. Lying there helplessly, John was remembering an old fairy tale he'd read as a kid, something about a fellow named Socrates, who was given a cup of hemlock to drink. It was the finish for Socrates, but the old hero had been nonchalant and calm about the whole thing. With a sigh, John Carl, who was curious unto death, relaxed and said, All right, bub, you don't have to force-feed me. I'll take it like a man. The cylinder apparently understood him, for it handed him the tumbler. It even reholstered his subray pistol. John brought the glass of liquid under his nose. The fumes of the liquid were pungent. It brought tears to his eyes. He looked at the cylinder, then at the steel blues crowding into the plastic goo. He waved the glass at the audience. To earth! Ever triumphant! he toasted. Then he drained the glass in a gulp. It was bitter, and he felt hot prickles jab at his scalp. It was like eating very hot peppers. His eyes filled with tears. He coughed <coughs> as the stuff went down. But he was still alive. He thought in amazement. He drunk the hemlock and was still alive. The reaction set in quickly. He hadn't known until then how tense he'd been. Now, with the torture ordeal over, he relaxed. He laid down on the pallet and went to sleep. It was one lone steel blue watching him when he rubbed the sleep out of his eyes and sat up. He vanished almost instantly. He, or another like him, returned immediately, accompanied by a half-dozen other, including the multi-tentacled creature known as Number One. One said, "'You are alive,' the thought registered amazement. "'When you lost consciousness, we thought you had—' "'There was a hesitation. "'As you say, died.' "'No,' John Carl said. "'I didn't die. "'I was just plain dead beat, so I went to sleep.' "'The Steel Blues apparently didn't understand. "'Good it is that you live. "'The torture will continue,' spoke Number One before loping away. The cylinder business began again. This time, John drank the bitter liquid slowly, trying to figure out what it was. It had a familiar, tantalizing taste, but he couldn't quite put a taste finger on it. His belly said he was hungry. He glanced at his chronometer. Only twenty days left before the SP ship arrived. Would this torture, he chuckled, last until then? But he was growing more and more conscious that his belly was screaming for hunger. The liquid had taken the edge off his thirst. It was on the fifth day of his torture that John Carl decided he was going to get something to eat or perish in the attempt. The cylinder sat passively in its niche on the circle. A dozen steel blues were watching as John put on his helmet and unsheathed his stub ray. They merely watched as he pressed the stub ray's firing stud. Invisible rays licked out of the bulbous muzzle of the pistol. The plastic splintered. John was out of the goldfish bowl and striding towards his own igloo adjacent to the service station when a steel blue accosted him. Out of the way, John grunted, waving the stub ray. I'm hungry. I'm the first steel blue you met, said the creature who barred his way. Go back to your torture. But I'm so hungry, I'll chew off one of your tentacles and eat it without seasoning. Eat? The seal blue sounded puzzled. 
I want to refuel. I've got my own... I've got to have food to keep my engine going. Steel Blue chuckled. So the hemlock, as you call it, is beginning to affect you at last. Back to the torture room. Like our dust, John growled. He pressed the firing stud on the stub ray gun. One of the Steel Blue's tentacles broke off and fell to the rocky sward. Steel Blue jerked out the box he'd used once before. A tentacle danced over it. Abruptly, John found himself standing in a pinnacle of rock. Steel Blue had cut a swath around him fifteen feet deep and five feet wide. Back to the room, Steel Blue commanded. John resheathed the subray pistol, shrugged noncommittally, and leapt the trench. He walked slowly back and re-entered the torture chamber. The Steel Blues rapidly repaired the damage he'd done. As he watched them, John was still curious, but he was getting mad underneath at the cold egotism of the Steel Blues. By the shimmering clouds of Earth, by her green fields and dark forests, he'd stay alive to warn the SP ship. Yes, he'd stay alive until then, and send the story of the Steel Blues' corrosive acid to it. Then hundreds of Earth ships could equip themselves with spray guns and squirt citric acid and watch the Steel Blues fade away. It sounded almost silly to John Carl the fruit acid of Earth to repel these invaders. It doesn't sound possible. That couldn't be the answer. Citric acid wasn't the answer, John Carl discovered a week later. The Steel Blue who had captured him in the power room of the service station came in to examine him. You're still holding out, I see, he observed after poking John in every sensitive part of his body. I'll suggest to number one that we increase the power of the... Ah, hemlock. How do you feel... Between the rich oxygen and the dizziness of hunger, John was a bit delirious. But he answered honestly enough. My guts feel as if they're chewing each other up. My bones ache. My joints creak. I can't coordinate. I'm so hungry. That is the hemlock, Steel Blue said. It was when he qualified the new and stronger joke that John knew that his hope that it was citric acid was squelched. The acid taste was weaker, which meant that the citric acid was the diluting liquid. It was the liquid he couldn't taste beneath the tang of the citric acid that was the corrosive acid. On the fourteenth day, John was so weak he didn't feel much like moving around. He let the cylinder feed him the hemlock. Number one came to see him again and went away chuckling. Decrease the delusion. This Earthman is at last beginning to suffer. Staying alive now had become a fetish with John. On the sixteenth day, the Earthman realized that the Steel Blues also were waiting for the SP ship. The extraterrestrials had repaired the blue ship where the service station's atomic ray had struck, and they were doing a little target practice with plastic bubbles only a few miles above the asteroid. When his chronometer clicked off the beginning of the 21st day, John received a tumbler of the hemlock from the hands of Number One himself. It is the hemlock, he chuckled. Undiluted. Drink it and your torture is over. You will die before your SP ship is destroyed. We have played with you long enough. Today we begin to toy with your SP ship. Drink up, Earthman. Drink to enslavement. Weak though he was, John lunged to his feet, spilling the tumbler of liquid. It ran cool along the plastic arm of his spaceship. He changed his mind about throwing the contents on Number One. With a smile, he set the glass to his lips and drank. Then he laughed at Number One. <laughs> the SP ship will turn your ship into jelly. Number One swept out, chuckling. Boast if you will, Earthman. It's your last chance. There was an exultation in John's heart that deadened his hunger and washed away the nausea. At last he knew what the hemlock was. He sat on the pallet adjusting the little power pack radio. The SP ship should now be within range of the set. The space patrol was notorious for its accuracy in keeping to schedule. Seconds counted like years, but they had to be on the nose, or it meant disaster or death. He sent out the call letters. AX to SP-101, AX to SP-101, AX to SP-101. Three times he sent the call, then began sending his message, hoping that his signal was reaching the ship. He couldn't know if they answered. Though the power pack could get out a message over a vast distance, it could not pick up messages even when backed by an SP ship's power, unless the ship was only a few hundred miles away. The power pack was strictly a distress signal. He didn't know how long he'd been sending, or how many times his weary voice had repeated the short but desperate message. He kept watching the heavens and hoping. Abruptly, he knew the SP ship was coming, for the blue ship of the Steel Blues was rising silently from the asteroids. 
up and up it rose. Then flames flickered in a circle from its curious shape. The ship disappeared, suddenly accelerating. John Carl strained his eyes. Finally, he looked away from the heavens to the two steel blues who stood negligently outside the goldfish bowl. Once more, John used the stub ray pistol. He marched out the plastic igloo and ran towards the service station. He didn't know how weak he was until he stumbled and fell only a few feet from his prison. The Steel Blues just watched him. He crawled on, around the circular pit on the sward of the asteroid where one Steel Blue had shown him the power of his weapon. He'd been crawling through a nightmare for years when the quiet voice penetrated his dulled mind. Take it easy, Carl. You're among friends. He pried open his eyes with his will. He saw the blue and gold of Space Guard's uniform. He sighed and drifted into unconsciousness. He was still weak days later when Captain Ron Small of SP-101 said, "'Yes, Carl, it's ironical. They fed you what they thought was sure death, and it's the only thing that kept you going long enough to warn us.' "'I was dumb for a long time,' Carl said. "'I thought that it was the acid, almost to the very last. But when I drank that last glass, I knew they didn't have a chance.' They were metal monsters. No wonder they feared that liquid. It would rust their joints, short their wiring, and kill them. No wonder they sh stared when I kept alive after drinking enough to completely annihilate a half-dozen of them. But what happened when you met the ship? The space captain grinned. Not much. Our crew was busy creating a hollow shell filled with water to be shot out of a rocket tube converted into a projectile thrower. Those steel blues, as you call them, put traction beams on us and started tugging us towards the asteroid. We tried a couple of atomic shots, but they just glanced off. We gave up. They went expecting the shell of water. When it hit the blue ship, you could almost see it oxidize before your eyes. I guess they knew what was wrong right away. They let go the traction beams and tried to get away. They forgot about the force field, so we just poured atomic fire into the weakened ship. It just melted away. John Carl got up from the divan where he'd been lying. They thought I was a metal creature, too. But where do you suppose they came from? The captain shrugged. Who knows? John set two glasses on the table. "'Have a drink of the best damn water in the solar system,' he asked Captain Small. "'Don't mind if I do.' The water twinkled in the two glasses, winking as if it knew just what it had done. This is the end of Acid Bath <laughs> by Vasilov Garson. This has been a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Feaster. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, Share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. The Alternate Plan by Jerry Madrin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Engulfsland The Alternate Plan by Jerry Madrin. Bart Neely was fighting the hypo. They slipped that over on him. Now he had to struggle to keep his brain ready for plan B, the alternate plan. He nodded feebly at his reflection in the mirror over the white enamel dresser. This throat trouble wasn't going to lick him. He lay back on the cool white pillow. Medical men always thought theirs was the final answer. Well, psychologists like himself knew there was a broader view of man than the anatomical. There was a vast region of energy at man's disposal. The switch to turn it on, located in the brain. Rubber-soled shoes squished across the bare floor as Dr. Jonas Morton came into Bart's room. His hair was hidden by a sterile cap, his arms bare to well above the elbows. Looks like a damn butcher, thought Bart. Bart, I want you to reconsider the anesthetic. I think you ought to be out for this one, completely out. The doctor's voice became a shade less professional. I don't tell you how to run your perception experiments. I think you ought to let me judge what's best in the surgical area. No, Bart whispered hoarsely. It was a hell squeezing the words out. Lifting his voice these days was harder than lifting a half-ton truck. Must be conscious, able to decide. Jonas had to lean down to catch all the words. Not going to let you take my voice while I'm unconscious, helpless. Dr. Morton shook his head. You're the boss. How soon? Twenty minutes. The professional tone became pronounced again. 
Your wife's outside waiting to see you. Don't get emotional. I don't want your endocrine system in uproar. The doctor stepped out into the corridor. Emotional. He mustn't think about it. He might weaken, consent to linger on. An invalid, just to be with Vivian a few extra years. Extra years of indignities calculated to twist the man-woman relationship into an ugly distortion. How romantic it would be. He and Vivian locked in an embrace, the silky softness of her hair falling across his arm, the pressure of her fingers on his back. And then, instead of placing his mouth against her ear and whisper familiar intimacies, he would switch on the light, disengage himself so that he could whip out a pad and pencil, and... His heart skipped at the sound of a pattern of high heels on the corridor. Vivian, Vivian. Her perfume pricked his senses and it took effort to shout out the emotional response. Remember the need for an alternate plan, he reminded himself fiercely and then looked upon into his wife's clear green eyes. Without a word, she bent down and lay her face next to his. He was struck with the warmth of her. He gently pushed her head away. V. My lord, his eyes were wet. What a schoolboy performance. V, you know I don't want to go on here. If radical surgery is necessary, I want you to remember he as a whole man, not a dummy. Bart, oh Bart, there was a frown of apprehension on her forehead. She sighed heavily and whispered, Can it make so much difference when I love you, Bart? But don't you see, V? It may not be Bart Neely they wheel back here after the operation. He motioned for her to bend closer for the sound of his voice was becoming weaker. In my field, I've seen a lot of crazy reactions to loss of basic ability. Personality reversals brought about by loss of hearing, impotency, or even the inability to bear a child. He stroked the back of her hand with his fingers. Bart Neely, without a voice box, might be a stranger. I'm not sure you'd like him. I don't think I'd even like him. An intern backed into the room followed by a gurney. Bart shot a look at V. This is plan A. V's eyebrows arched in a question. Exploration and... He paused. The nurse tucked a dark green blanket all around him. He raised his thin white hand and crossed two fingers. And we hope, a negative biopsy. There was no pain. Whatever the anesthesiast had worked out was doing nicely. The overhead light, however, was giving him a headache, and the operating room was damn cold. Jonas and Holesclaw weren't talking much, and what they did say wasn't loud enough for Bart to get. He studied their faces. I'll know by their faces, he assured himself, and if it's widespread malignancy, I'll proceed with plan B. The sweat was heavy on Jonas's forehead. The sterile mask hit his nose and mouth, but his eyes, behind the lenses of his glasses, looked moist and tired. The surgeon's gloved fingers manipulated, probed, cut. Finally, he turned to a waiting nurse. Get this analyzed right away. That was it. The tissue. Was it cancerous or not? The atmosphere grew heavy. Bart watched the second hand on the large wall clock swing slowly around its perimeter. And then around again and again. The nurse re-entered and spoke softly to the doctor. The two doctors whispered, explaining to each other with hand motions what they were going to do. This is it. Bart was certain. Well, he'd fool the hell out of the know-it-all doctors. He closed his eyes and thought. The years he had spent sharpening his perception, his ability to transfer his thoughts, were just the groundwork for this greatest experiment of all. He had transferred thought waves in all forms to all corners of this world with the highest percentage of accuracy. Now plan B, the alternate plan, was to transfer himself. He was willing himself out of his own body. He could feel the perspiration trickle down his arms with the effort. It had to work. He had to cheat them out of their mutilation. No, he couldn't fail. He strained against the confines of his body, burdening his brain with the thought. Then suddenly he was free. Bart wanted to shriek with laughter. He outwitted them. There stood gray-faced Jonas working over that shell, not even realizing that it was an empty body. It was like a television play or something. Everyone clustered around a poor stiff on the operating table, repeating the litany of the sawbones. Scalpel, sponge, clamps... Bart mentally chuckled and fluttered himself upwards, above the square-shaped hospital with its rows of tiny windows, beyond the polluted air of the city, up and up until there was nothing to look back on. Nothing. Now Bart perceived something ahead. It appeared to be a body of land. It looked marvelously appealing, dark greens, bright yellows, and all the shades in between. He hurried forward, eager to explore what lay ahead. But as he drew closer, becoming more excited over its possibilities, he struck a cold, hard surface which repelled him. It was like glass, and through it Bart could see a poorly defined figure some distance away. Bart was intrigued. This was a mental barrier thrown up by the fellow on the other side. Well, he'd give the guy some competition. Bart concentrated on crackling the wall, building a visual picture of the breakthrough in his mind. It's useless. You can't enter here. 
Why do you oppose me? Bart tested the unseen wall, but found no weakness in its structure. We don't care for your sort. Is that so? And how have you classified me? As a coward? A suicide? A man of meager resources? I'm nothing of the kind. In the first place, I did not commit suicide. Bart wished he could kick at the invisible wall. I willed myself away from an imperfect shell. I severed the mind from the body. Why? Because I had a cancer of the larynx, and I'd never have been able to talk again. I'd be less than a man. You are less than a man now. There was a long period of no exchange. Bart decided he had not made himself clear. I didn't want to live without being able to communicate with other men and women. Communicate, communicate. There are a million ways to communicate. Michelangelo communicated. Bach, Beethoven, yes, Elvis Presley communicates. Hemingway, Martha Graham, actors, dancers, even a baby communicates. But speech, speech is the least dependable method of all. Few people can explain their love, their pain, their innermost feelings in words. And often a man speaks his thoughts and having spoken them finds he really thinks the opposite. No, this is a second-rate expression, and my opinion of you has not been altered by your feeble argument. The other fellow's thought came over the wall, pounding against Bart's subconscious. You consider yourself a man of great intelligence, it went on, but your lack of imagination makes you less than mediocre. And as for your mind power, well, you see, you cannot cross my mental barrier. That's not entirely conclusive. There may be a catalyst here in this area, which works in conjunction with your thought processes and not mine. You're familiar with conditions here, while I only know the earth. You are hardly a challenge to me. However, to satisfy you that you have practically no control, let us make a test on your home ground. All right, you propose the test. Let us see. If you can re-enter your former body while I am willing you to stay here on the other side of that wall. Aha, you're trying to trick me. I knew before I proposed my plan you would make exactly that excuse in order to escape my challenge. Even in excuses, you lacked imagination. Okay, it's a deal. Bart was mad. Start concentrating. I'll show you the power of my mind, both now and after I resume that shell. Bart was furious. He had tried to leave that place by the wall. He seemed stuck. There were waves like laughter vibrating against the glass. Bart strained and saw that he had come away a little. He tried again and again. There was a little more distance gained. He tried to build the picture of the operating room in his mind. And while he was doing this, a flash of Vivian exploded in his mind. With that quick image, he felt himself free to drift downward. There indeed was the hospital. Bart hurried to the operating room, hovering near the ceiling light, watching the operating team below. He's gone, doctor. The anesthesiast looked at Jonas. Respiration stopped altogether. No, thought Bart. Don't close me out now. Let's open the chest and massage the heart. Yes, yes. I think it's futile, doctor. We can try. Good old Jonas. Bart floated to the table and forced himself into the shell, which lay white and unmoving under the penetrating light from above. It wasn't easy. Bart tried to move the heavy hand, but it was quite numb. Not a thing. Might as well quit. Paul's claws in a hurry. Damn him. I'll massage a little longer. Bart pushed at the laden eyelid. No go. Come on, come on. He felt a convulsive chill, a throbbing in his head. I'm getting a pulse. Jonah's voice was excited. Bart knew there was a searing pain in his throat, but shutting it out of his consciousness was the steady thumping beat of his own heart. End of the Alternate Plan by Jerry Madron Recording by Jason in Golfsland, Minnesota Visit my blog at ingonotes.blogspot.com B-12's Moon Glow by Charles A. Stearns This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times B-12's Moon Glow by Charles A. Stearns Among the metal persons of Phobos, robot B-12 held a special niche. He might not have been stronger, larger, faster than some, but he could be devious. And more important, he was that junkyard planetoid's only moonshiner. I am B-12, a metal person. If you read Day and the other progressive journals, you will know that in some quarters of the galaxy there is considerable prejudice directed against us. It is ever so with minority races, and I do not complain. I merely make the statement so that you will understand about the alarm clock. An alarm clock is a simple mechanism used by the builders to shock themselves into consciousness after their periodic comas 
to which they are subject. It is obsolescent, but still used in such out-of-the-way places as Phobos. My own contact with one of these devices came about in the following manner. I had come into Argonne City under cover of darkness, which is the only sensible thing to do in my profession, and I was stealing through the back alleyways as silently as my rusty joints would allow. I was less than three blocks from Benny's place, and still undetected, when I passed the window. It was a large, cheerful oblong of light, so quite naturally I stopped to investigate, being slightly phototropic, by virtue of the selenium grids in my rectifier cells. I went over and looked in, unobtrusively resting my grapples on the outer ledge. There was a builder inside, such as I had not seen since I came to Phobos half a century ago, and yet I recognized the subspecies at once, for they are common on earth. It was a she. It was in the process of removing certain outer sheaths, and I noted that, while quite symmetrical bilaterally, it was otherwise oddly formed, being disproportionately large and lumpy in the anterior ventral region. I had watched for some two or three minutes, entirely forgetting my own safety, when then she saw me. Its eyes widened, and it snatched up the alarm clock, which was, as I have hinted, near at hand. "'Get out of here, you nosy old tin can!' it screamed, and threw the clock, which caromed off my headpiece, damaging one earphone. I ran. If you still do not see what I mean about racial prejudice, you will, when you hear what happened later. I continued on until I came to Benny's place, entering through the back door. Benny met me there, and quickly shushed me into a side room. His fluorescent eyes were glowing with excitement. Benny's real name is B.N.E. 96, and when on earth he had been only a servitor, not a general purpose like myself. But perhaps I should explain. We metal people are the children of the builders of earth, and later of Mars and Venus. We were not born of two parents, as they are. That is a function far too complex to explain here. In fact, I do not even understand it myself. No, we were born of the hands and intellects of the greatest of their scientists, and for this reason it might be natural to suppose that we, and not they, would be considered a superior race. It is not so. Many of us were fashioned in those days a metal person for every kind of task that they could devise, and some, like myself, who could do almost anything. We were contented enough, for the greater part, but the scientists kept creating, always striving to better their former efforts. And one day the situation which the builders had always regarded as inevitable, but we, somehow, had supposed would never come, was upon us. The first generation of the metal people, more than fifty thousand of us, were obsolete. The things that we had been designed to do, the new ones, with their crystalline brains, fresh, untarnished, accomplished better. We were banished to Phobos, dreary, lifeless moon of Mars. It had long been a sort of interplanetary junkyard. Now it became a graveyard. Upon the barren face of this little world there was no life except for the handful of hardy Martian and Terran prospectors who searched for minerals. Later on, a few rude mining communities sprang up under plastic aerodromes, but never came to much. Argon City was such a place. I wonder if you can comprehend the loneliness, the hollow futility of our plight. Fifty thousand skilled workmen with nothing to do. Some of the less adaptable gave up, prostrating themselves upon the bare rocks until their joints froze from lack of use and their works corroded. Others served the miners and prospectors, but their needs were all too few. The overwhelming majority of us were still idle, and somehow we learned the secret of racial existence at last. We learned to serve each other. This was not an easy lesson to learn. In the first place, there must be motivation involved in racial preservation. Yet we derived no pleasure out of the things that make the builders wish to continue to live. We did not sleep. We did not eat, and we were not able to reproduce.
reproduce ourselves, and besides, this latter, as I have indicated, would have been pointless with us. There was, however, one other pleasure of the builders that intrigued us. It can best be described as a stimulation produced by drenching their insides with alcoholic compounds, and is a universal pastime among the males and many of the shes. One of us, our forty-seven, I think it was, rest him, tried it one day. He pried open the top of his helmet and poured an entire bottle of the fluid down his mechanism. Poor R-47, he caught fire and blazed up in a glorious blue flame that we could not extinguish in time. He was beyond repair, and we were forced to scrap him. But he was not a sacrifice in vain. He had established an idea in our ennui bursting minds, an idea which led to the discovery of Moonglow. My discovery, I should say, for I was the first... Naturally, I cannot divulge my secret formula for moon-glow. There are many kinds of moon-glow these days, but there is still only one B-12 moon-glow. Suffice it to say that it is a high-octane preparation, only a drop of which, but you know the effects of moon-glow, of course. How the merest thimbleful, when judiciously poured into one's power-pack, gives new life in the most deliriously happy freedom of movement imaginable. One possesses soaring spirits and super strength. Old, rusted joints move freely once more. One's transistors glow brightly, and the currents of the body race about with the minutest resistance. Moon glow is like being born again. The sale of it has been illegal for several years, for no reason that I can think of, except that the builders who make the laws cannot bear to see metal people have fun. Of course, a part of the blame rests on such individuals as X-101, who, when lubricated with moon glow, insist upon dancing around on large cast-iron feet to the hazard of all toes in his vicinity. He is thin and long-jointed, and he goes creak-creak in a weird sing-song fashion as he dances. It is a shameful, ludicrous sight. Then there was DC-5, who tore down the 300 feet long equipment hangar of the builders one night. He had overindulged. I do not feel responsible for these things. If I had not sold them the moon glow, someone else would have done so. Besides, I am only a wholesaler. Benny buys everything that I am able to produce in my little laboratory hidden out in the dumps. Just now, by Benny's attitude, I knew that something was very wrong. What is the matter? I said. Is it the revenue agents? I do not know, said BNE 96, in that curious flat voice of his that is incapable of inflection. I do not know, but there are visitors of importance from Earth. It could mean anything, but I have a premonition of disaster. John, tip me off. He meant John Rogerson, of course, who was the peace officer here in Argonne City, and the only one of the builders I had ever met who did not look down upon a metal person. When sober, he was a clever person who always looked out for our interests here. What are they like? I asked in some fear, for I had six vials of moon glow with me at the moment. I have not seen them, but there is one who is high in the government, and his wife... There are half a dozen others of the builder race, and one of the new type metal persons. I had met the she, who must have been the wife. They hate us, I said. We can expect only evil from these persons. You may be right. If you have any merchandise with you, I will take it, but do not risk bringing more here until they have gone. I produced the vials of moon glow, and he paid me in Phobos credits, which are good for a specified number of refuelings at the central fueling station. Benny put the vials away, and he went into the bar. There was the usual jostling crowd of hard-bitten earth miners, and of the metal people who come to lose their loneliness. I recognized many, though I spend very little time in these places, preferring solitary pursuits 
such as the distillation of moon-glow and improving my mind by study and contemplation out in the barrens. John Rogerson and I saw each other at the same time, and I did not like the expression in his eye as he crooked a finger at me. I went over to his table. He was pleasant-looking, as builders go, with blue eyes less dull than most, and a brown, unruly top-knot of hair, such as is universally affected by them. "'Sit down,' he invited, revealing his white incisors in greeting. I never sit, but this time I did so, to be polite. I was wary, ready for anything. I knew that there was something unpleasant in the air. I wondered if he had seen me passing the moon-glow to Benny somehow. Perhaps he had barrier-penetrating vision, like the Z-group of metal people. But I had never heard of a builder like that. I knew that he had long suspected that I made moon-glow. "'What do you want?' I asked cautiously. "'Come on now,' he said. "'Loosen up. Limber those stainless steel hinges of yours and be friendly.' That made me feel good. Actually, I am somewhat pitted with rust, but he never seems to notice, for he is like that. I felt young, as if I had partaken of my own product. "'The fact is, B-12,' he said, "'I want you to do me a favor, old pal.' "'And what is that?' Perhaps you have heard that there is some big brass from Earth visiting Phobos this week. I have heard nothing, I said. It is often helpful to appear ignorant when questioned by the builders, for they believe us to be incapable of misrepresenting the truth. The fact is, though it is an acquired trait and not built into us, we general purposes can lie as well as anyone. Well, there is, a Federation senator no less, Simon F. Langley. It's my job to keep them entertained. That's where you come in. I was mystified. I had never heard of this Langley, but I know what entertainment is. I had a mental image of myself singing or dancing before the senator's party, but I cannot sing very well, for three of my voice reeds are broken and have never been replaced, and lateral motion, for me, is almost impossible these days. I do not know what you mean, I said. There is J-66. He was once an entertainment. No, no, he interrupted. You don't get it. What the senator wants is a guide. They're making a survey of the dumps, though I'll be damned if I can find out why. And you know the dumps better than any metal person, or human, on Phobos. So that was it. I felt a vague dread, a premonition of disaster. I had such feelings before, and usually with reason. This, too, was an acquired sensibility, I am sure. For many years I have studied the builders, and there is much to be learned of their mobile faces and their eyes. In John's eyes, however, I read no trickery, nothing. Yet, I say, I had the sensation of evil. It was just for a moment, no longer. I said I would think it over. Senator Langley was distinguished. John said so. And yet he was cumbersomely round, and he rattled incessantly of things into which I could interpret no meaning. The she, who was his wife, was much younger, and sullen, and unpleasantly I sensed great rapport between her and John Rogerson from the very first. There were several other humans in the group. I will not call them builders, for I did not hold them to be, in any way, superior to my own people. They all wore spectacles, and they gravitated about the round body of the senator, like minor moons, and I could tell that they were some kind of servitors. I will not describe them further. MS-33 I will describe. I felt an unconscionable hatred for him at once. I cannot say why, except that he hung about his master obsequiously, power-packed smoothly purring, and he was slim-limbed, nickel-plated, and wore, I thought, a smug expression on his visiplate. He represented the new order, the ones who had displaced us on earth. He knew too much, and showed it at every opportunity. We did not go far that first morning. The half-track was driven to the edge of the dumps. Within the dumps one walks, or does not go. Phobos is an airless world, and yet so small that rockets are impractical. 
the terrain is broken and littered with the refuse of half a dozen worlds, but the dumps themselves, that is different. Imagine, if you can, an endless vista of death, a sea of rusting corpses of spaceships and worn-out mining machinery, and of those of my race whose power packs burned out or who simply gave up, retiring into this endless, corroding limbo of the barrens. A more somber sight was never seen, but this fat ghoul, Langley, sickened me. This shame of the builder race, this atavism, this beast, rubbed his fat, impractical hands together with an ungodlike glee. Excellent, he said. Far, far better, in fact, than I had hoped. He did not elucidate. I looked at John Rogerson. He shook his head slowly. You there, robot, said Langley, looking at me. How far across is this place? The word was like a blow. I could not answer. MS-33, glistening in the dying light of Mars, strode over to me, clanking heavily up on the black rocks. He seized me with his grapples and shook me until my wiring was in danger of shorting out. Speak up when you are spoken to, archaic mechanism, he grated. I would have struck out at him, but what use, except to warp my own aging limbs. John Rogerson came to my rescue. On Phobos, he explained blankly, we don't use that word, robot. These folk have been free a long time. They've quite a culture of their own nowadays, and they like to be called metal people. As a return courtesy, they refer to us humans as builders. Just a custom, Senator, but if you want to get along with them. Can they vote? said Langley, grinning at his own sour humor. Nonsense, said MS-33. I am a robot and proud of it. This rusty piece has no call to put on airs. Release him, Langley said. Droll fellows, these discarded robots. Really nothing but mechanical dolls, you know. But I think the old scientist made a mistake, giving them such human appearance and such obstinate traits. Oh, it was true enough, from his point of view. We had been mechanical dolls at first, I suppose, but fifty years can change one. All I know is this. We are people. We think and feel, and are happy and sad, and quite often we are bored stiff with this dreary moon of Phobos. It seared me. My selenium cells throbbed white-hot within the shell of my frame, and I made up my mind that I would learn more about the mission of this Langley, and I would get even with MS-33, even if they had me dismantled for it. Of the rest of that week, I recall few pleasant moments. We went out every day, and the quick-eyed servants of Langley measured the areas with their instruments and exchanged significant looks from behind their spectacles, smug in their thin air helmets. It was all very mysterious and disturbing. But I could discover nothing about their mission, and when I questioned MS-33, he would look important and say nothing. Somehow it seemed vital that I find out what was going on before it was too late. On the third day there was a strange occurrence. My friend, John Rogerson, had been taking pictures of the dumps. Langley and his wife had withdrawn to one side and were talking in low tones to one another. Quite thoughtlessly John turned the lens on them and clicked the shutter. Langley became rust-red throughout the vast expanse of his neck and face. Here! he said. What are you doing? Nothing, said John. You took a picture of me, snarled Langley. Give me the plate at once. John Rogerson got a bit red himself. He was not used to being ordered around. I'll be damned if I will, he said. Langley growled something I couldn't understand and turned his back on us. The she, who was called his wife, looked startled and worried. Her eyes were beseeching as she looked at John. A message there, but I could not read it. John looked away. Langley started walking back to the half-track alone. He turned once, and there was evil in his gaze as he looked at John. You will lose your job for this impertinence, he said with quiet savagery, and added enigmatically, not that there will be a job after this week anyway. Builders may appear to act without reason, but there is always a motivation somewhere in their complex brains. 
if one can only find it, either in the seat of reason or in the labyrinthine inhibitions from their childhood. I knew this because I had studied them, and now there were certain notions that came into my brain which, even if I could not prove them, were no less interesting for that. The time had come to act. I could scarcely wait for darkness to come. There were things in my brain that appalled me, but now I was certain that I had been right. Something was about to happen to Phobos, to all of us here. I knew not what, but I must prevent it somehow. I kept in the shadows of the shabby buildings of Argon City, and I found the window without effort. The place where I had spied upon the wife of Langley to my sorrow the other night, there was no one there. There was darkness within, but that did not deter me. Within the airdrome which covers Argon City, the buildings are loosely constructed, even as they are on Earth. I had no trouble, therefore, opening the window. I swung a leg up and was presently within the darkened room. I found the door I sought and entered cautiously. In this adjacent compartment I made a thorough search, but I did not find what I primarily sought, namely the elusive reason for Langley's visit to Phobos. It was in a metallic overnight bag that I did find something else which made my power pack hum so loudly that I was afraid of being heard. The thing which explained the strangeness of the pompous senator's attitude today, which explained, in short, many things, and caused my brain to race with new ideas. I put the thing in my chest container, and left as stealthily as I had come. There had been progress, but since I had not found what I hoped to find, I must now try my alternate plan. Two hours later I found the one I sought, and made sure that I was seen by him. Then I left Argon City by the south lock, furtively, as a thief, always glancing over my shoulder, and when I made certain that I was being followed, I went swiftly, and it was not long before I was clambering over the first heaps of debris at the edge of the dumps. Once I thought I heard footsteps behind me, but when I looked back there was no one in sight, just the tiny disk of Deimos peering over the sharp peak of the nearest ridge, the black velvet sky outlining the curvature of this airless moon. Presently I was in sight of home, the time-eaten hull of an ancient star freighter resting near the top of a heap of junked equipment from some old strip-mining operation. It would never rise again, but its shell remained strong enough to shelter my distillery and scant furnishings from any chance meteorite that might fall. I greeted it with the usual warmth of feeling which one has for the safe and the familiar. I stumbled over ten fuel cans, wires, and other tangled metal in my haste to get there. It was just as I had left it. The heating element under the network of coils and pressure chambers still glowed with white heat, and the moon glow was dripping with musical sound into the retort. I felt good. No one ever bothered me here. This was my fortress, with all that I cared for inside, my tools, my work, my micro-library. And yet I had deliberately something, a heavy foot, clanked upon the first step of the man-port through which I had entered. I turned quickly. The form shimmered in the pale demos light that silhouetted it. M.S. 33. He had followed me here. What do you want? I said. What are you doing here? A simple question, said MS-33. Tonight you looked very suspicious when you left Argon City. I saw you and followed you here. You may as well know that I've never trusted you. All the old ones were unreliable. That is why you were replaced. He came in, boldly, without being invited, and looked around. I detected a sneer in his voice as he said, So this is where you hide. I do not hide. I live here. It is true. A robot does not live. A robot exists. We newer models do not require shelter like an animal. We are rust-proof and invulnerable. He strode over to my micro-library, several racks of carefully arranged spools, and fingered them irreverently. What is this? My library. So our memories are built into us. We have no need to refresh them. 
So is mine, I said, but I would learn more than I know. I was stalling for time, waiting until he made the right opening. Nonsense, he said. I know why you stay out here in the dumps, masterless. I have heard of the forbidden drug that is sold in the mining camps, such as Argon City. Is this the mechanism? He pointed at the still. Now was the time. I mustered all my cunning, but I could not speak. Not yet. Never mind, he said. I can see that it is. I shall report you, of course. It will give me great pleasure to see you dismantled. Not that it really matters, of course. Now. There it was again. The same frightening illusion that Langley had made today. I must succeed. I knew that MS-33, for all his brilliance and newness and vaunted superiority, was only a secretarial. For the age of specialism was upon earth and general-purpose models were no longer made. That was why we were different here on Phobos. It was why we had survived. The old ones had given us something special, which the new metal people did not have. Moreover, MS-33 had his weakness. He was larger, stronger, faster than me, but I doubted that he could be devious. You are right, I said, pretending resignation. This is my distillery. It is where I make the fluid which is called moon glow by the metal people of Phobos. Doubtless you are interested in learning how it works. Not even remotely interested, he said. I am interested only in taking you back and turning you over to the authorities. It works much like the conventional distilling planets of Earth, I said, except that the basic ingredient, a silicon compound, is irradiated as it passes through zirconian tubes to the heating pile, where it is activated and broken down into the droplets of the elixir called moon glow. You see the golden drops falling there. It has the excellent flavor of fine petroleum, as I make it. Perhaps you'd care to taste it. Then you could understand that it is not really bad at all. Perhaps you could persuade yourself to be more lenient with me. Certainly not, said MS-33. Perhaps you are right, I said after a moment of reflection. I took a syringe, drew up several drops of the stuff, and squirted it into my carapace, where it would do the most good. I felt much better. Yes, I continued. Certainly, you are quite correct, now that I think of it. You knew our models would never bear it. You weren't built to stand such things. Nor, for that matter, could you comprehend the exquisite joys that are derived from moon glow. Not only would you derive no pleasure from it, but it would corrode your parts, I imagine, until you could scarcely crawl back to your master for repairs. I helped myself to another liberal portion. That is the silliest thing I've ever heard, he said. What? I said, it's silly. We are constructed to withstand a hundred times greater stress and twice as many chemical actions as you were. Nothing could hurt us. Besides, it looks harmless enough. I doubt that it is hardly anything at all. For me, it is not, I admitted. But you... Give me the syringe, fool. I dare not. Give it here. I allowed him to wrest it from my grasp. In any case, I could not have prevented him. He shoved me backwards against the rusty bulkhead with a clang. He pushed the nozzle of the syringe down into the retort and withdrew it filled with moon glow. He opened an inspection plate in his ventral region and squirted himself generously. It was quite a dose. He waited for a moment. I feel nothing, he said finally. I do not believe it is anything more than common lubricating oil. He was silent for another moment. There is an ease of movement, he said. No paralysis, I asked. Paral... You stupid, rusty old robot. He helped himself to another syringe full of moon glow. The stuff brought twenty credits an ounce, but I did not begrudge it him. He flexed his superbly articulated joints in three directions, and I could hear his power unit building up within him to a whining pitch. He took a shuffling sidestep, and then another, gazing down at his feet with arms akimbo. 
The light gravity here is superb, 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 he said, skipping a bit. Isn't it? I said. Almost negligible, he said. True. You have been very kind to me, MS-33 said. Extremely, extraordinarily, incomparably, incalculably, kind, kind. He used up all the adjectives in his memory pack. I wonder if you would mind awfully much if... Not at all, I said. Help yourself. By the way, friend, would you mind telling me what your real mission of your party is here on Phobos? The senator forgot to say. Secret, he said. Horribly top secret. As a dutiful subject, I mean servant of Earth, I could not, of course, divulge it to anyone. If I could... His neon eyes glistened. If I could, you would, of course, be the first to know, the very first. He threw one nickel-plated arm around my shoulder. I see, I said, and just what is it that you are not allowed to tell me? Why, that we are making a preliminary survey here on Phobos, of course, to determine whether or not it is worthwhile to send salvage for scrap. Earth is short of metals, and it depends upon what the old mu- the master- says in his report. You mean they'll take all the derelict spaceships such as this one, and all the abandoned equipment? And the r robots, MS-33 said. They're metal, too, you know. They're going to take the dismantled robots? MS-33 made a sweeping gesture. They're going to take all the r robots, dismantled or not. They're not good for anything, anyway. The bill is up before the Federation Congress right now, and it will pass if my master, Langley, says so. He patted my helmet, consolingly, his grapples clanking. If you were worth a damn, you know, he concluded sorrowfully. That's murder, I said, and I meant it. Man's inhumanity to metal people, I thought. Yes, to man, even if we were made of metal. How's that? said MS-33, foggily. Have another drop of moon glow. I said, I've got to get back to Argonne City. I made it back to Benny's place without incident. I had never moved so swiftly. I sent Benny out to find John Rogerson, and presently he brought him back. I told Rogerson what MS-33 had said, watching his reaction carefully. I could not forget that though he had been our friend, he was still one of the builders, a human who thought as humans. You comprehend, I said grimly, that one word of this will bring an uprising of fifty thousand metal people, which can be put down only at much expense and with great destruction. We are free people. The builders exiled us here, and therefore lost their claim to us. We have as much right to life as anyone, and we do not wish to be melted up and made into printing presses and spaceships and the like. The damn fools! John said softly. Listen, B-12, you've got to believe me. I didn't know a thing about this, though I've suspected something was up. I'm on your side, but what are we going to do? Maybe they'll listen to reason. Vera, that is the name of the she? No, they will not listen to reason. They hate us. I recalled with bitterness the episode of Alarm Clock. There is a chance. However, I have not been idle this night. If you will go... Langley, and meet me in the back room here at Benny's. We will talk. But he'll be asleep. Awaken him, I said. Get him here. Your own job is at stake as well, remember. I'll get him, John said grimly. Wait here. I went over to the bar where Benny was serving the miners. Benny had always been my friend. John was my friend, too, but he was a builder. I wanted one of my own people to know what was going on, just in case something happened to me. We were talking there, in low tones, when I saw MS-33. He came in through the front door, and there was purposefulness in his stride that had not been there when I left him back at the old hulk. The effects of the moon glow had worn off much quicker than I had expected. He had come for vengeance. He would tell about my distillery, and that would be the end of me. There was only one thing to do, and I must do it fast. Quick, I ordered Benny. Douse the lights. He complied. The place was plunged into darkness. 
I knew that it was darkness, and yet, you comprehend, I still sensed everything in the place, for I had the special visual sensory system bequeathed only to the general purposes of a bygone age. I could see, but hardly anyone else could. I worked swiftly, and I got what I was after in a very short time. I ducked out of the front door with it, and threw it in a silvery arc as far as I could hurl it. It was an intricate little thing, which could not, I am sure, have been duplicated on the entire moon of Phobos. When I returned, someone had put the lights back on, but it didn't matter now. MS-33 was sitting at one of the tables, staring fixedly at me. He said nothing. Benny was motioning for me to come into the back room. I went to him. John Rogerson and Langley were there. Langley looked irritated. He was mumbling strangled curses and rubbing his eyes. Rogerson laughed. You may be interested in knowing, B-12, that I had to arrest him to get him here. This had better be good. It is all bad, I said. Very bad, but necessary. I turned to Langley. It is said that your present survey is being made with the purpose of condemning all of Phobos, the dead and the living alike, to the blast furnaces and the metal shops of earth. Is this true? Why, you impudent, miserable piece of tin! What if I am making a scrap survey? What are you going to do about it? You're nothing but a rope. So it is true, but you will tell the salvage ships not to come. It is yours to decide and you will decide that we are not worth bothering with here on Phobos. You will save us. I? blustered Langley. You will. I took the thing out of my breastplate container and showed it to him. He grew pale. John said, Well, I'll be damned. It was a picture of Langley and another. I gave it to John. His wife, I said. His real wife. I am sure of it, for you will note the inscription on the bottom. Then Vera is not his wife. You wonder that he was camera-shy. Housebreaker, roared Langley. It's a plot, a dirty reactionary plot. It is what is called blackmail, I said. I turned to John. I am correct about this? You are, John said. You are instructed to leave Phobos, I said to Langley and you will allow my friend here to keep his job as peace officer, for without it he would be lost. I have observed that in these things the builders are hardly more adaptable than their children, the metal people. You will do all this, and in return we will not send the picture that John took today to your wife, nor otherwise inform her of your transgression, for I am told that this is a transgression. It is indeed agreed John gravely. Right, Langley? All right, Langley snarled. You win, and the sooner I get out of this hole, the better. He got up to go, squeezing his fat form through the door into the bar, past the gaping miners, heedless of the metal people. We watched him go with some satisfaction. It is no business of mine, I said to John, but I have seen you look with longing upon the she. That was not Langley's wife. Since she does not belong to him, there is nothing to prevent you from having her. Should not that make you happy? Are you kidding? He snarled, which proves that I have still much to learn about his race. Out front, Langley spied his metal servant, MS-33, just as he was going out the door. He turned to him. What are you doing here? He asked suspiciously. MS-33 made no answer. He stared malevolently at the bar, ignoring Langley. "'Come on here, damn you,' Langley said. MS-33 said nothing. Langley went over to him and roared foul things into his earphones that would corrode one's soul, if one had one. I shall never forget that moment, the screaming, red-faced Langley, the laughing miners. But he got no reply from MS-33. Not then or ever, and this was scarcely strange, for I had removed his fuse. End of B-12's Moon Glow by Charles A. Stearns
The Eyes Have It by Philip K. Dick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. The Eyes Have It by Philip K. Dick. It was quite by accident I discovered this incredible invasion of Earth by life forms from another planet. As yet, I haven't done anything about it. I, I can't think of anything to do. I wrote to the government, and they sent back a pamphlet on the repair and maintenance of frame houses. Anyhow, the whole thing is known. I, I'm not the first to discover it. Maybe it's even under control. I was sitting in my easy chair, idly turning the pages of a paperbacked book someone had left on the bus, when I came across the reference that first put me on the trail. For a moment I didn't respond. It took some time for the full import to sink in. After I'd comprehended, it seemed odd I hadn't noticed it right away. The reference was clearly to a non-human species of incredible properties, not indigenous to Earth. A species, I hasten to point out, customarily masquerading as ordinary human beings. Their disguise, however, became transparent in the face of the following observations by the author. It was at once obvious the author knew everything, knew everything, and was taking it in his stride. The line, and I tremble, remembering it even now, read, His eyes slowly roved about the room. Vague chills assailed me. I tried to picture the eyes. Did they roll like dimes? The passage indicated not. They seemed to move through the air, not over the surface. Rather rapidly, apparently. No one in the story was surprised. That's what tipped me off. No sign of amazement at such an outrageous thing. Later the matter was amplified. His eyes moved from person to person. There it was in a nutshell. The eyes had clearly come apart from the rest of him and were on their own. My heart pounded and my breath choked in my windpipe. I had stumbled on an accidental mention of a totally unfamiliar race. Obviously non-terrestrial. Yet, to the characters in the book, it was perfectly natural. Which suggested they belonged to the same species. A slow suspicion burned in my mind. The author was taking it rather too easily in his stride. Evidently he felt this was quite a usual thing. He made absolutely no attempt to conceal this knowledge. The story continued. Presently his eyes fastened on Julia. Julia, being a lady, had at least the breeding to feel indignant. She is described as blushing and knitting her brows angrily. At this I sighed with relief. They weren't all non-terrestrials. The narrative continues. Slowly, calmly. His eyes examined every inch of her. Great Scott! But here the girl turned and stomped off, and the matter ended. I lay back in my chair, gasping with horror. My wife and family regarded me in wonder. What's wrong, dear? my wife asked. I couldn't tell her. Knowledge like this was too much for the ordinary run-of-the-mill person. I, I had to keep it to myself. N nothing, I gasped. I leaped up, snatched the book, and hurried out of the room. In the garage I continued reading. There was more. Trembling, I read the next revealing passage. He put his arm around Julia. Presently she asked him if he would remove his arm. He immediately did so, with a smile. It's not said what was done with the arm after the fellow had removed it. M maybe it was left standing upright in the corner. Maybe it was thrown away. I don't care. In any case, the full meaning was there, staring me right in the face. Here was a race of creatures capable of removing portions of their anatomy at will. Eyes, arms, and maybe more. Without batting an eyelash. My knowledge of biology came in handy at this point. Obviously they were simple beings, unicellular, some sort of primitive single-celled things, beings no more developed than starfish. Starfish can do the same thing, you know. I read on and came to this incredible revelation, tossed off coolly by the author without the faintest tremor. Outside the movie theater, we split up. Part of us went inside, part over to the cafe for dinner. 
binary fission, obviously, splitting in half and forming two entities. Probably each lower half went to the cafe, it being farther, and the upper halves to the movies. I read on, hands shaking. I had really stumbled onto something here. My mind reeled as I made out this passage. I'm afraid there's no doubt about it. Poor Bibney has lost his head again. Which was followed by, and Bob says he has utterly no guts. Yet Bibney got around as well as the next person. The next person, however, was just as strange. He was soon described as totally lacking in brains. There was no doubt of the thing in the next passage. Julia, whom I'd had thought to be the one normal person, reveals herself as also being an alien life-form, similar to the rest. Quite deliberately, Julia had given her heart to the young man. It didn't relate what the final disposition of the organ was, but I didn't really care. It was evident Julia had gone right on living in her usual manner, like all the others in the book, without heart, arms, eyes, brains, viscera dividing up in two when the occasion demanded, without a qualm. Thereupon she gave him her hand. I sickened. The rascal now had her hand as well as her heart. I shudder to think what he's done with them by this time. He took her arm. Not content to wait, he had started dismantling her on his own. Flushing crimson, I slammed the book shut and leapt to my feet, but not in time to escape one last reference to those carefree bits of anatomy whose travels had originally thrown me on the track. Her eyes followed him all the way down the road and across the meadow. I rushed from the garage and back inside the warm house, as if the accursed thing were following me. My wife and children were playing Monopoly in the kitchen. I joined them and played with frantic fervor brow feverish, teeth chattering. I had had enough of the thing. I wanted to hear no more about it. Let them come on. Let them invade Earth. I, I don't want to get mixed up in it. I have absolutely no stomach for it. End of The Eyes Have It by Philip K. Dick The Guardians by Irving Cox, Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times The Guardians by Irving Cox, Jr. It's not always the truth shall set you free. Sometimes it's want of the truth shall drive you to escape. And that can be dangerous. Rena Brill intended to ride the god car above the rain mist. For a long time she had not believed in the taboos or the earth god. She no longer believed she lived on earth. This paradise of green floored forests and running brooks was sometimes called Rythar. Six years ago, when Myrna was fourteen, she first discovered the truth. She asked a question, and the earth god ignored it. A simple question, really. What is above the rain mist? God could have told her. Every day he answered technical questions that were far more difficult. Instead, he repeated the familiar taboo about avoiding the old village because of the th sickness. And consequently, Myrna, being female, went to the old village. There was nothing really unusual about that. All the kids went through the ruins from time to time. They had worked out a sort of charm that made it all right. They ran past the burned-out shells of the old houses, and they kept their eyes shaded to ward off the sickness. But even at fourteen, Myrna had outgrown charms, and she didn't believe in the sickness. She had once asked the Earth God what sickness meant, and the screen in the answer house had given her a very detailed answer. Myrna knew that none of the hundred girls and thirty boys inhabiting Rythar had ever been sick. That, like the taboo of the old village, she considered a childish superstition. The old village wasn't large. Three parallel roads, a mile long, lined with the charred ruins of prefabs, which were exactly like the cottages 
where the kids lived. It was nothing to inspire either fear or legend. The village had burned a long time ago. The grass from the forest had grown a green mantle over the skeletal walls. For weeks Myrna poked through the ruins before she found anything of significance. A few scorched pages of a printed pamphlet buried deep in the black earth. The paper excited her tremendously. It was different from the film books photographed in the answer house. She had never touched anything like it, and it seemed wonderful stuff. She read the pamphlet eagerly. It was part of a promotional advertisement of a world called Rhythar, the jewel of the Syrian solar system. The description made it obvious that Rhythar was the green paradise where Myrna lived, the place she had been taught to call Earth, and the pamphlet had been addressed to Earthmen everywhere. Myrna made her second find when she was fifteen, a textbook in astronomy. For the first time in her life she read about the spinning dust of the universe lying beyond the eternal rain mist that hid her world. The solid, stable earth of her childhood was solid and stable no more, but a sphere turning through a black void. Nor was it properly called earth, but a planet called Rhythar. The adjustment Myrna had to make was shattering. She lost faith in everything she believed. Yet the clockwork logic of astronomy appealed to her orderly mind. It explained why the rain mist glowed with light during the day and turned dark at night. Myrna had never seen a clear sky. She had no visual data to tie her new concept to. For six years she kept the secret. She hid the papers and the astronomy text, which she found in the old village. Later, after the metal men came, she destroyed everything so none of the other women would know the earth god was a man. At first... She kept the secret because she was afraid. For some reason, the man who played at being God wanted the kids to believe Rhythar was Earth, the totality of the universe enveloped in a cloud of mist. She knew that because she once asked God what a planet was. The face on the screen in the answer house became frigid with anger, or was it fear? And the Earth God said, The word means nothing. But late that night, a very large god car brought six metal men down through the rain mist. They were huge, jointed things that clanked when they walked. Four of them used weapons to herd the kids together in their small settlement. The two others went to the old village and blasted the ruins with high explosives. Vaguely, Myrna remembered that the metal men had been there before, when the kids were still very small. They had built the new settlement, and they had brought food. They lived with the children for a long time, she thought, but the memory was hazy. As the years passed, Myrna's fear retreated, and only one thing became important. She knew the earth god was a man. On the fertile soil of Rhythar, there were one hundred women and thirty men. All the boys had taken mates before they reached seventeen. Seventy girls were left unmarried, with no prospect of ever having husbands. A score or more became second wives in polygamous homes. But plural marriage had no appeal for Myrna. She was firmly determined to possess a man of her own, and why shouldn't it be the earth god? As her first step toward escape, Myrna volunteered for duty in the answer house. For as long as she could remember, the answer house had stood on a knoll some distance beyond the new settlement. It was a square, one-room building, housing a speaking box, a glass screen, and a console of transmission machinery. Anyone in the settlement could contact God and request information or special equipment. God went out of his way to deluge them with information. The simplest question produced voluminous data, transmitted over the screen and photographed on reels of film. Someone had to be in the answer house to handle the photography. The work was not hard, but it was monotonous. Most of the kids preferred to farm the fields or dig the sacrificial ore. A request for equipment was granted just as promptly. Tools, machines, seeds, fertilizers, 
packaged buildings, games, clothing, everything came in a god-car. It was a large cylinder which hissed down from the rain mist on a pillar of fire. The landing site was a flat charred field near the answer house. Unless the equipment was unusually heavy, the attendant stationed in the house was expected to unload the god car and pile aboard the sacrifice oars mined on Rythar. God asked two things from the settlement, the pieces of unusually heavy metal which they dug from the hills, and tiny vials of soil. In an hour's time they could mine enough ore to fill the compartment of a god car, and God never complained if they sometimes sent the cylinder back empty. But he fussed mightily over the small vials of earth. He gave very explicit directions as to where they were to take the samples, and the place was never the same. Sometimes they had to travel miles from the settlement to satisfy that inexplicable whim. For two weeks, Myrna patiently ran off the endless films of new books and unloaded the god car when it came. She examined the interior of the cylinder carefully, and she weighed every possible risk. The compartment was very small, but she concluded that she would be safe. And so she made her decision. Tense and tight-lipped, Myrna Brill slipped aboard the god car. She sealed the locked door which automatically fired the lunching tubes. After that, there was no turning back. The dark compartment shook in a thunder of sound. The weight of the escape speed tore at her body, pulling her tight against the confining walls. She lost consciousness until the pressure lessened. The metal walls became hot, but the space was too confining for her to avoid contact entirely. Four narrow light tubes came on, with a dull red glow, and suddenly a gelatinous liquid emptied out of ceiling vents. The fluid sprayed every exposed surface in the cubicle, draining through the shipment of sacrifice ores at Myrna's feet. It had a choking, antiseptic odor. It stung Myrna's face and inflamed her eyes. Worse still, as the liquid soaked into her clothing, it disintegrated the fiber, tearing away the cloth in long strips which slowly dissolved in the liquid on the floor. Before the antiseptic spray ceased, Myrna was helplessly naked. Even her black boots had not survived. The red lights went out, and Myrna was imprisoned again in the crushing darkness. A terror of the taboos she had defied swept her mind. She began to scream, but the sound was lost in the roar of the motors. Suddenly it was over. The god car lurched into something hard. Myrna was thrown against the ceiling, and she hung there, weightless. The pieces of sacrifice ore were floating in the darkness, just as she was. The motors cut out, and the locked door swung open. Myrna saw a circular room, brightly lighted with a glaring blue light. The nature of her fear changed. This was the house of the earth god, but she could not let him find her naked. She tried to run into the circular room. She found that the slightest exertion of her muscles sent her spinning through the air. She could not get her feet on the floor. There was no down and no up in that room. She collided painfully with the metal wall, and she snatched at a light bracket to keep herself from bouncing free in the empty air again. The god car had landed against what was either the ceiling or the floor of the circular room. Myrna had no way of making a differentiation. Eight brightly lighted corridors opened into the side walls. Myrna heard footsteps moving toward her down one of the corridors. She pulled herself blindly into another. As she went farther from the circular room, a vague sense of gravity returned. At the end of the corridor, she was able to stand on her feet again, although she still had to walk very carefully. Any sudden movement sent her soaring in a graceful leap that banged her head against the ceiling. Cautiously, she opened a thick metal door into another hall, and she stood transfixed, looking through a mica wall at the emptiness of space, pinpointed with its billions of stars. This was the reality of the charts she had seen in the astronomy text. That knowledge alone saved her sanity. 
She had believed it when the proof lay hidden above the rain mist. She must believe it now. From where she stood, she was able to see the place where the god car had brought her, like a vast cartwheel spinning in the void. The god car was clamped against the hub, from which eight corridors radiated outward like wheel spokes toward the rim. Far below the gigantic wheel, Myrna saw the sphere of Rythar, invisible behind its shroud of glowing mist. She moved along the rim corridor, past the mica wall, until she came to a door that stood open. The room beyond was a sleeping compartment, and it was empty. She searched it for clothing, and found nothing. She went through four more dormitory rooms, before she came upon anything she could use. Brief shorts, clearly made for a man, and a loose white tunic. It wasn't suitable. It wasn't the way she wanted to be dressed when she faced him. But it had to do. Myrna was pawing through a footlocker, looking for boots, when she heard a hesitant step behind her. She whirled and saw a small, stooped, white-haired man, naked except for trunks like the one she was wearing. The wrinkled skin on his wasted chest was burned brown by the hot glare of the sun. Thick lens glasses hung from a chain around his neck. "'My dear young lady,' he said in a tired voice, "'this is a men's ward.' "'I'm sorry I didn't know.' "'You must be a new patient.' He fumbled for his glasses. Instinctively, she knew she shouldn't let him see her clearly enough to identify her as a stranger. She shoved past him, knocking the glasses from his hand. "'I'd better find my own ward.' Myrna didn't know the word, but she supposed it meant some sort of sleeping chamber. The old man said chattily, "'I hadn't heard they were bringing in any new patients today.' She was in the corridor by that time. He reached for her hand. "'I'll see you in the sunroom?' It was a timid, hopeful question. And you'll tell me all the news, everything they're doing back on Earth. I haven't been home for almost a year. She fled down the hall. When she heard voices ahead of her, she pulled back a door and slid into another room, a storeroom piled with cases of medicines. Behind the cartons, she thought she would be safe. This wasn't what she had expected. Myrna thought there might be one man living in a kind of prefab somehow suspended above the rain mist. But there were obviously others up here. She didn't know how many. And the old man frightened her, more than the dazzling sight of the heavens visible through the mica wall. Myrna had never seen physical age before. No one on Ryther was older than she was herself, a sturdy, healthy, lusty twenty. The old man's infirmity disgusted her, for the first time in her life she was conscious of the slow decay of death. The door of the supply room slid open. Myrna crouched low behind the curtains, but she was able to see the man and the woman who had entered the room. A woman? Here? Myrna hadn't considered that possibility. Perhaps the earth god already had a mate. The newcomers were dressed in crisp white uniforms. The woman wore a starched white hat. They carried a tray of small glass cylinders from which metal needles projected. While the woman held the tray, the man drove the needles through the caps of small bottles and filled the cylinders with a bright-colored liquid. "'When are you leaving, Dick?' the woman asked. "'In about forty minutes. They're sending an auto pickup.' "'Oh, no!' "'Now don't start worrying. They've got the bugs out of it by this time.' The auto pickups are entirely trustworthy. Sure, that's what the army says. In theory, they should be even more reliable than... I wish you'd wait for the hospital shuttle. And miss the chance to address Congress this year? We've worked too long for this. I don't want to muff it now. We've all the statistical proof we need, even to convince those pinch-penny halfwits. Those pinch-penny halfwits... During the past eight years, we've handled more than a thousand cases up here. On Earth, they were pronounced incurable. We've sent better than 80% back in good health after an average stay of 14 months. 
No medical man has ever questioned the efficiency of cosmic radiation and a reduced atmospheric gravity, Dick. It's just our so-called statesmen always yapping about the budget. But this time we have the cost problem lit, too. For a year and a half, the ore they send up from Rhythar has paid for our entire operation. I didn't know that. We've kept it under wraps so the politicians wouldn't cut our appropriations. Their glass tubes were full, and they turned toward the door. It isn't right, the woman persisted, for them not to send a piloted shuttle after you, Dick. It isn't dignified. You're our assistant medical director, and... Her words were cut off as the door slid shut behind them. Myrna tried to fit this new information into what she already knew, or thought she knew, about the Earth God. It didn't add up to a pretty picture. She had once asked for a definition of illness, and it was apparent to her that this place, which they called the Guardian Wheel, was an expensive hospital for Earthmen. It was paid for by the sacrificial ores mined on Rythar. In a sense, Rythar was being enslaved and exploited by Earth. True, it was not difficult to dig out the ore, but Myrna resented the fact that the kids on Rythar had not been told the truth. She had long ago lost her awe of the man called God. Now she lost her respect as well. Myrna was glad she had not seen him, glad no one knew she was aboard the Guardian Wheel. She would return to Rythar. After she told the others what she knew, Rythar would send up no more sacrifice ores. Let the Earthmen come down and mine it for themselves. Very cautiously, she pulled the door open. The rim corridor was empty. She moved toward one of the intersecting corridors. When she heard footsteps, she hid in another dormitory room. This was different from the others. It showed more evidence of permanent occupation. She guessed it was a dormitory for the people who took care of the sick. Pictures were fastened to the curved metal walls. Personal articles cluttered the shelves hung beside the bunks. On a writing desk, she saw a number of typed reports. Five freshly laundered uniforms, identical to the one she had lost in the antiseptic wash, hung on a rack behind the door. Myrna stripped off the makeshift she was wearing and put on one of the uniforms. She found boots under the desk. When she was dressed, she stood admiring herself in the polished surface of the metal door. She was a handsome woman, and she was very conscious of that. Her face was tanned by the mist-filtered sunlight of Rythar. Her lips were red and sensuous. Her long, platinum-colored hair fell to her shoulders. She compared herself to the small, hard-faced female she had seen in the supply room. Was that a typical Earth woman? Myrna's lips curled in a scornful smile. Let the gods come down to Rythar, then, and discover what a real female was like in the lush green Rytharian paradise. Myrna went to the desk and glanced at the typed reports. They had been written by a man who signed himself Commander-in-Charge Guardian Wheel, and they were addressed to the Congress of the World Government. One typed document was a supply inventory. A second, still unfinished, was a budget report. You won't show a profit next time, Myrna thought vindictively, when we stop sending you the sacrifice or Another report dealt with Rythar, and Myrna read it with more interest. One paragraph caught her attention. We have asked for soil samples to be taken from an area covering 10,000 miles. Our chemical analysis has been thorough, and we find nothing that could be remotely harmful to human life. Atmospheric samples produce the same negative results. On the other hand, we have direct evidence that no animal life has ever evolved on Rythar. The life cycle is exclusively botanical. The soil samples, Myrna realized, would be the vials of earth which the earth god had requested so often. Were the earthmen planning to move their hospital down to Rythar? That idea disturbed her. Myrna did not want her garden world cluttered up with a lot of sick old men discarded by earth. She turned to the second page of the report. The original colony survived for a year. The sickness in the old village developed only after the first harvest of Rytharian ground food. 
it is more and more evident that the botanical cycle of Rythar must be examined before we find the answer. To do that adequately, we shall have to send survey teams to the surface. That requires much larger appropriations for research than we have had in the past. The metal immunization suits, which must, of course, be destroyed after each expedition. And what, may I ask, is the meaning of this? Myrna dropped the report and swung toward the door. She saw a woman standing there, another hard-faced earth woman, with a starched white cap perched on her graying hair. I must have come to the wrong room, Myrna said in a small voice. Indeed, everyone knows this is command headquarters. Who are you? The woman put her hand on Myrna's arm, and the fingers bit through the uniform into Myrna's flesh. Myrna pulled away, drawing her shoulders back proudly. Why should she feel afraid? She stood a head taller than this dried-up stranger. She knew the earth woman's strength would be no match for hers. My name is Myrna Brill, she said quietly. I came up in a god-car from Rythar. Rythar! The woman's mouth fell open. She whispered the word as if it were profanity. Suddenly she turned and ran down the rim corridor, screaming in terror. She's afraid of me, Myrna thought, and that made no sense at all. Myrna knew she had to get back to the god-car quickly. Since the earthmen had built up the taboos in order to get their sacrifice ores from Rythar, they would do everything they could to prevent her return. She ran toward an intersecting spoke corridor. An alarm bell began to clang, and the sound vibrated against the metal walls. An armed man sprang from a side room and fired his weapon at Myrna. The discharge burned a deep groove in the wall. So they would even kill her, these men who pretended to be gods. Before the man could fire again, Myrna swung down a side corridor, and at once the sensation of weightlessness overtook her. She could not move quickly. She saw the armed man at the mouth of the corridor. Frantically, she pushed open the door of a room, which was crowded with consoles of transmission machines. Three men were seated in front of the speakers. They jumped and came toward her, clumsily fighting the weightlessness. Myrna caught at the door jam and swung herself toward the ceiling. At the same time, the armed man fired, the discharge missed her and washed against the transmission machinery. Blue fire exploded from the room. The three men screamed in agony. Concussion threw Myrna helplessly toward the rim again. And the guardian wheel was plunged into darkness. Myrna's head swam. Her shoulders seethed with pain where she had banged into the wall. She tried to creep toward the circular room, but she had lost her sense of direction and she found herself back on the rim. The clanging bell had stopped when the lights went out, but Myrna heard the panic of frightened voices. Far away, someone was screaming. Running feet clattered toward her. Myrna flattened herself against the outer wall. An indistinct body of men shot past her. From Rythar, one of them was saying, a woman from Rythar. And we've blasted the communication center. We've no way of sending the warning back to Earth. They were gone. Myrna moved back into the spoke corridor. She felt her way silently toward the circular hub room and the god car. Suddenly, very close, she heard voices which she recognized. The man and the woman who had been talking in the supply room. You're still all right, Dick, the woman said. She hasn't been here long enough to... We don't know that. We don't know how it spreads or how quickly. We can't take the chance. Then, then we've no choice. Her voice was a small whisper, choked with terror. None. These have been standing emergency orders for twenty years. We always faced the possibility that one of them would escape. If we'd been allowed to use a different policy of education, but the politicians wouldn't permit that. The wheel has to be destroyed and we must die with it. Couldn't we wait and make sure? It works too fast. None of us would be able to do the job afterward. The voice moved away. Marina floated toward the hub room. She found the airlock and pulled herself into the god car. 
The metal lock hissed closed, and light came on. Then she knew she had made a mistake. This ship was not the one she had used when she came up from Rythar. The tiny cabin was fitted with a sleeping lounge, a food cabinet, and a file of reading films. Above the lounge, a mic of viewplate gave her a broad view of the sky. Myrna remembered that the man in the supply room had said he was waiting for an auto pickup. He was on his way back to Earth. Myrna had taken his ship instead of her own. In panic, she tried to open the door again, but she found no way to do it. Machinery beneath her feet began to hum. She felt a slight lurch as the pickup left the hub of the guardian wheel. It swung in a wide arc. Through the viewplate she saw the enormous wheel growing small behind her, silhouetted against the mist of Rythar. Suddenly the wheel glowed red with a soundless explosion. Its flaming fragments died in the void. Myrna dropped weakly on the lounge. Nausea spun through her mind. The man had said they would destroy themselves, because Myrna had come aboard. But why were they afraid of her? What possible harm could she do to them? Myrna had left Rythar to discover the truth, and the truth was insanity. Was truth always like this, a bitter disillusionment, an empty horror? She had something else to say to the people of Rythar now. Not that the gods were men, but that men were mad. Believe in the taboos. Send up the sacrificial oars. It was a small price to pay to keep that madness away from Rythar. And Myrna knew she could not go back. With the wheel gone, she could never return to Rythar. The auto pickup was carrying her inexorably toward Earth. The scream of the machinery slowly turned shrill, hammering against her eardrums. The stars visible in the viewplate blurred and winked out. Myrna felt a twist of vertigo as the shuttle shifted from conventional speed into a time warp, and then the sound was gone. The ship was floating in an impenetrable blackness. Myrna had no idea how much time passed subjectively. When she became hungry, she took food from the cabinet. She slept when she was tired. To pass the time, she turned the reading films through the projector. Most of the film stored in the shuttle covered material Myrna already knew. The Earthmen, clearly, had not denied any information to Rythar. Only one thing had been restricted, astronomy, and that would have made no difference if Myrna had not found the text in the ruins of the old village. The people on Rythar never saw the stars. They had no way of knowing or caring what lay above the rain mist. Myrna was more interested in the history of Earth, which she had never known before. She studied the pictures of the great industrial centers and the crowded countryside. She was awed by the mobs in the city streets and the towering buildings. Yet she liked her own world more, the forests and the clear-running brooks, the vast, uncrowded open spaces. It puzzled her that the people of Earth would give the Rytharian paradise to a handful of children, when their own world was so overcrowded. Was this another form of the madness that had driven the people in the wheel to destroy themselves? That made a convenient explanation, but Myrna's mind was too logical to accept it. One film referred to the founding of the original colony on Rythar, a planet in the Syrian system which had been named for its discoverer. Rythar, according to the film, was one of a score of colonies established by Earth. It was unbelievably rich in deposits of uranium. That, Myrna surmised, was the name of the sacrificial ore they sent up in the god cars. The atmosphere and gravity of Rythar duplicated that of Earth. Rythar should have become the largest colony in the system. The government of Earth had originally planned a migration of ten million persons. But after twelve months, the survey colony was destroyed by an infection. Mariner read on the projection screen, which has never been identified. It is simply called the sickness. The origin of this plague is unknown. No adult in the survey colony survived. Children born on Rither are themselves immune, but are carriers of the sickness. The first rescue team sent to save them died within eight hours. No human being, aside from these native-born children, 
has ever survived the sickness. Now Myrna had the whole truth. She knew the motivation for their madness of self-destruction. It was not insanity, but the sublime courage of a few human beings sacrificing themselves to save the rest of their civilization. They smashed the guardian wheel to keep the sickness there, and Myrna had already escaped before that happened. She was being hurled through space toward Earth, and she would destroy that, too. If she killed herself, that would in no way alter the situation. The ship would still move in its appointed course. Her body would be aboard. Perhaps the very furnishings in the cabin were now infected with the germ of the sickness. When the ship touched earth, the fatal poison would escape. Dolly Myrna turned up another frame on the film, and she read what the Earthmen had done to help Rythar. They built the guardian wheel to isolate the sickness. Seated in metal immunization suits, volunteers had descended to the plague world and reared the surviving children of the colonists until they were old enough to look out for themselves. The answer house had been set up as an instructional device. As nearly as possible, the scientists in charge attempted to create a normal social situation for the plague carriers. They could never be allowed to leave Rythar, but when they matured enough to know the truth, Rythar could be integrated into the colonial system. Rytharian uranium is already a significant trade factor in the colonial market. An incidental byproduct of the Guardian Wheel is the hospital facility, where advanced cases of certain cancers and lung diseases have been cured in a reduced gravity or by exposure to cosmic radiation. Myrna shut off the projection. The words made sense, but the results did not, and she knew precisely why Earth had failed. When they matured, in those three words she had her answer. And now it didn't matter. There was nothing she could do. Her ship was a poisoned arrow aimed directly at the heart of man's civilization. Myrna had slept twice when the auto pickup lurched out of the time drive, and she was able to see the stars again. Directly ahead of her she saw an emerald planet bright in the sun and she knew instinctively that it was Earth. A speaker under the viewport throbbed with the sound of a human voice. Auto Shuttle SC-539, attention, you are assigned landing slot 731, Port Chicago. I repeat, 731, dial that destination. Do you read me? Three times the message was repeated before Myrna concluded that it was meant for her. She found three small knobs close to the speaker, and a plastic toggle labeled Voice Reply. She snapped it shut and found that she could speak to the Chicago spaceport. Her problem was easily solved, then. She could say she came from Rythar. Without hesitation, Earth ships would be sent to blast her ship out of the sky before she would be able to land, but she knew she had to accomplish more than that. The same mistake must not be repeated again. How much time do I have? she asked. Thirty-four minutes. Can you keep this shuttle up here any longer than that? Lady, the auto pickups are on tape pilot. Come hell or high water, they land exactly on schedule. What happens if I don't dial the slot destination? We bring you in on an emergency, and you fork over a thousand buck fine. Myrna asked to be allowed to speak to someone in authority in the government. The Chicago port manager told her the request was absurd. For nine minutes, Myrna argued, with a mounting sense of urgency, before he gave his grudging consent. Her trouble was that she had to skate close to the truth without admitting it directly. She could not, except as a last resort, let them kill her until they knew why the isolation of Rythar had failed. It was thirteen minutes before landing when Myrna finally heard an older, more dignified voice on the speaker. By then, the green globe of Earth filled the sky. Myrna could make out the shapes of the continents turning below her. The older man identified himself as a senator elected to the Planetary Congress. She didn't know how much authority he represented, but she couldn't afford to wait any longer. 
She told him frankly who she was. She knew she was pronouncing her own death sentence, yet she spoke quietly. She must show the same courage that the Earthmen had when they sacrificed themselves in the Guardian Wheel. Listen to me for two minutes more before you blast my ship, she asked. I rode the god car up from Rhydar. I am coming now to spread the sickness on Earth, because I wanted to know the truth about something that puzzled me. I had to know what was above the rain mist. In the answer house, you would not tell us that. Now I understand why. We were children. You were waiting for us to mature. And that is the mistake you made. That blindness nearly destroyed your civilization. You will have to build another guardian wheel. This time, don't hide anything from us because we're children. The truth makes us mature, not illusions or taboos. Never forget that. It is easier to face a fact than to have to give up a dream we've been taught to believe. Tell your children the truth when they ask for it. Tell us, please. We can adjust to it. We're just as human as you are. Myrna drew a long breath. Her lips were trembling. Did this man understand what she had to say? She would never know. If she failed, Earth, in spite of its generosity and its courage, would one day be destroyed by children bred on too many delusions. I'm ready, Myrna said steadily. Send up your warships and destroy me. She waited. Less than ten minutes were left. Her shuttle began to move more slowly. She was no more than a mile above Earth. She saw the soaring cities and the white highways twisting through green fields. Seven minutes left. Where were the warships? She looked anxiously through the viewport, and the sky was empty. Desperately, she closed the voice toggle again. Send them quickly, she cried. You must not let me land. No reply came from the speaker. Her auto shuttle began to circle a large city, which lay at the southern tip of an inland lake. Three minutes more, the ship nosed toward the spaceport. Why don't you do something? Myrna screamed. What are you waiting for? The shuttle settled into a metal rack. The lock hissed open. Myrna shrank back against the wall, looking out at what she would destroy, what she had already destroyed. A dignified, portly man came panting up the ramp toward her. No, she whispered. Don't come in here. I am Senator Bryson, he said shortly. For ten years, Dr. Jameson has been telling us, from the Guardian Wheel, that we should adopt a different educational policy toward Rythar. Your scare broadcast was clever, but we're used to Jameson's tricks. He'll be removed from office for this, and if I have anything to say about it... You didn't believe me? Myrna gasped. Of course not. If a plague carrier escaped from Rythar... We would have heard about it long before this. The trouble with you scientists is you don't grant the rest of us any common sense. And Jameson's the worst of the lot. He's always contended that the sociologists should determine our Ritharian policy, not the elected representatives of the people. Myrna broke down and began to cry hysterically. The senator put his hand under her arm, none too gently. Let's have no more dramatics, please. You don't know how fortunate you are, young lady. If the politicians were as addle-witted as you scientists claim we are, we might have believed that nonsense and blasted your ship out of the sky. You scientists have to give up the notion that you're our guardians. We're quite able to look out for ourselves. End of The Guardians by Irving Cox The Indulgence of Negu Ma by Robert Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Feaster. The Indulgence of Negu Ma. In his garden, Negu Ma, the Callisto uranium merchant, sat sipping a platinum mug of Molkai with his guest, Sliss the Venusian.
Nanlo, his wife, pushing before her the small serving cart with its platinum mulchai decanter, paused for an instant as she entered the shell of pure vitriite which covered the garden, giving it the illusion of out of doorness. Neguma sat at his ease, his broad, merry, half-oriental face good-humored, his features given a ruddy tinge by the light of rising Jupiter, the edge of whose sphere was beginning to dominate the horizon. Sliss, the intelligent amphibian, squatted across from him in the portable tub of water, which he carried with him whenever absent from the swamps of his native Venus. The amphibian's popping eyes turned towards her, the wide frog face split in a smile of appreciation as Nanlo approached. She refilled their mugs deftly and withdrew, but before she re-entered the house she could not resist hesitating to glance towards rising Jupiter and the slim shaft of the rocket ship silhouetted now against its surface. The ship was the cargo rocket Vulcan, newest and swiftest of Neguma's freighter fleet. Fully fueled and provisioned, storage space jammed with refrigerated foods that in space the cold of the encompassing void would keep perfectly for generations, were it necessary. She would take off in the morning from the close-by landing port for Jupiter's other satellites, then go on to the Saturnian system, returning finally with full holds of uranium for Neguma's refineries on Callisto. She was a beautiful craft, the Vulcan, and one man could manage her, though her normal crew was seven. She had cost a great sum, but Neguma was wealthy. Nanlo's face, sylph-like in its beauty, hardened. Neguma was wealthy indeed. Had he not bought her... And had she not cost him more, much more, than the Vulcan? But no, it was not quite accurate to say that Negoma had bought her. However, since time immemorial, beautiful daughters had been, if not sold, yet urged into marriages to wealthy men for the benefit of their impoverished families. And though science had made great strides, conquering the realms of the telescope and invading those below the level of the microscope, finding cures for almost every disease the flesh of man was heir to, there was one ailment it had not yet conquered poverty. Nanlo's father had been a rocket port attendant. Once he had been a pilot, but a crash had crippled him for life. Thereafter, his wages had been quite insufficient to sustain him, his brood of half a dozen children, and their hard-working mother. But Nanlo, growing up, had developed into a mature beauty that rivaled the exotic loveliness of the wild orchards of Io, and in debarking at the rocket port on a business trip to Earth, because hurricanes had forced him far south of New York, Neguma had seen her. Thereafter? But that is a story as ancient as history, too. It was a truth Nanlo conveniently overlooked now that she had not been unwilling to be Neguma's bride. It was true she had driven a sharp bargain with him, her father's debts paid, and sufficient more to ease her parents' life and educate her brothers and sisters, plus a marriage settlement for herself and a sum in escrow in the Earth Union Bank should she ever divorce him for cruelty or mistreatment. But that had been only innate shrewdness. She would still have married him if he had refused her demands for her family. For his wealth fascinated her, and the prospect of being a virtual queen, even of a distant outpost colony such as that on Callisto, appealed to her, and she had thought that she was taking little risk. For if she were dissatisfied, the law these days was very lenient towards unhappy marital relationships. It required only definite proof of misconduct, mistreatment, or oppression of any kind to win freedom from an unwanted partner. Nanlo had been confident that, after a year or two, she would be able to shake free of the bonds uniting her to Neguma, and take flight for herself into a world made vastly more pleasant by the marriage settlement remaining to her. But now she had been married and had lived on Callisto for a full five years, and her tolerance of Neguma had long since turned to bitter hate, not because he was a bad husband, but because he was too good a one. There was an ironic humor in the situation, but Nanlo was not disposed to recognize it. Lenient as the law was, yet it required some grounds before it could free her, and she had no grounds whatsoever. Neguma was at all times the model of courtesy and consideration towards her. He granted every reasonable wish and some that were unreasonable, although when he refused one of the later, it was with a firmness as unshakable as a rock. Their home was as fine as any on earth. She had more than adequate help in taking care of it. She had ample time for any pursuits that interested her. But she used it only to become more and more bitter against Neguma, because she could find no excuse to divorce him. So great had her bitterness become that, if she could have gotten off Callisto in any way, she would have deserted him. This would have meant forfeiting her marriage settlement and the sum that was in escrow. It would have left her father in debt to Neguma for all that Neguma had given him. But Nanlo's passionate rebellion had reached such a state of ferment in her breast that she would have accepted all this to strike a blow at the plump, smiling man who now sat drinking Molkai in their garden with their guest from Venus. The answer to that was 
Neguma would not let her leave Callisto. The journey to Earth, he logically argued, was still one containing a large element of danger. There was no reason for her to visit any other planet, and law and custom required that she look after their home while he himself was away on business. In this he was unshakable. There was a stern and unyielding side to him, inherited perhaps from his eastern ancestors, that left Nanlo shaken and frightened when it appeared. She had seen it the one time she had seriously gone into a tantrum in an effort to make him let her take a trip to Earth. It had so startled and terrified her that she had never used those tactics again. But now, as she wheeled away the Mulkai decanter and left Neguma and Sliss to themselves, joy and exultation was singing in her, doubly, for she was going to run away from Neguma, run away with the man she loved, and in their flight they were going to steal the Vulcan. Thus Neguma would be doubly punished. He would be hurt in his pride and in his pocketbook. And all through the Jupiter and Saturn systems, where his wealth, his position, and his beautiful wife were openly envied, he would be laughed at and derided. Humming lightly under her breath, Nanlo put the Molkai decanter away in a little pantry and hurried on to her own apartment. Molkai was a powerful, though non-habit-forming drug. Under its influence, one became talkative, but disinclined to movement. Sliss and her husband would remain as they were for hours, leaving her free to do as she would. The servants were asleep in another part of the building, and there was no one to note as she changed her clothes swiftly for a light, warm traveling suit, caught up two small bags, one holding her personal things, the other her jewels, and let herself out through her own private entrance into the darkness of the rear gardens, where in the shadows the tall, blonde young engineer, Hugh Niels, was waiting for her. Neguma, when his beautiful wife had left the garden, sighed and put to one side his mug of molkai. "'Sliss, my friend,' he said to the Venusian, who was regarding him with large and blinking pop-eyes, "'I am troubled in my mind. Tonight I must dispense justice, justice to myself and justice to another. To be just is often to be terribly cruel.' Sliss blinked once, a film moving horizontally across his large eyes and retracting to show that he understood. Due to the difficulty of using his artificial speech mechanism, he refrained from speaking until speech was necessary.' My wife Nan Lo, Negu Ma said heavily, is unhappy. I have done all that is in my power to make her happy, but I have failed. She has made some requests that I have denied, namely to be permitted freedom to visit Earth, that I denied because I know the paths she intended to tread would not have led her to happiness either, and I hoped that in the end, here, she would find contentment. I have hoped in vain. Tonight she intends to take matters into her own hands. Sliss blinked again, politely, to indicate that he was interested if Negoma cared to tell him more. Negoma rose. My friend, he said, if you will come with me, I will show you what I mean. Sliss grasped the edge of his tub with webbed hands and swung his webbed yellow-skinned feet free from the water, which kept the sensitive membranes from drying out, and at the same time supplied his body tissues with liquid. Falling upon all fours like a great misshapen pet, he waddled awkwardly after his host. Neguma led him to an elevator within the house. This took them to a higher floor, and they followed a corridor to the rear of the building. Here Neguma, without showing a light, opened a door, and in silence they moved out upon a small balcony, overlooking the rear gardens, which were shrouded in darkness because rising Jupiter was on the opposite side of the building. They had stood there only a moment, when below them a door opened, and a small figure slipped through. Another figure appeared from beneath the shadows of a cluster of slender purple necklo trees, and moved forward to greet the first. They met in the center of a tiny open space, where a fountain spurting through holes in crystal made a sweet murmuring music, and to the two watchers rose whispered words, "'Nanlo, Nanlo, my darling!' "'Hugh, oh, Hugh, my love, hold me close and tell me that everything is ready for us to leave.' Hugh Neal's arms held her close, and his lips were hot on hers. That he was here as they had planned meant that he had succeeded in the other plans they had agreed upon. Exultation soared higher in Nanlo's breast. "'Then we can go? Go now?' she asked eagerly, as Hugh Neal's released her. "'The crew is asleep. You were able to arrange it?' The young engineer looked down at her, his thin face a pale blur in the darkness. "'In five minutes, just five minutes, Nanlo, my own,' he whispered. "'I left the guard half an hour ago, drinking Molkai, into which I put a sleeping powder. "'Give him five more minutes to fall asleep, then we can go to the ship unseen, unchecked. "'Until then, we can wait here in the garden.' 
he led her towards the trilling fountain, and they sat down upon a bench before it, of rare Callisto crystal. They still were in darkness, but the flame-like Jupiter light touched the tops of the Neclo tree above them with a ruddy light which brought faint glimmerings from the radioactive leaves. Hugh Niels was a recent college graduate whom Nego Ma had hired as an assistant supervisor in the refining mills on Callisto, where the precious uranium-235 was separated from the ordinary metals. It was not a desirable job, but the best Hugh Niels could get. His college record of reckless scrapes and entanglements with women had been against him. Indeed, his position had only come to him because his home was in the same section as Nan Lowe's, and Nego Ma had thought that perhaps his company on occasion would help alleviate Nan Lowe's restlessness. It had, but to an extent Nego Ma had not foreseen. In less than a quarter of an hour, Nan Lowe, my darling, Hugh Niels whispered now, will be gone from here, and you'll belong only to me. We'll leave this infernal barren satellite to spin itself dizzy out here in no place. We'll leave that Humpty Dumpty husband of yours and his hypocritical good nature to whistle for his wife and his ship. We won't care. We'll be together, always together from now on, and he'll never see us again. Nanlo leaned against his shoulder. The prospect that he painted seemed very sweet to her. You're sure you can manage the ship alone? she asked. But of course, I can help a little anyway. You can teach me. Of course, Hugh Niels answered confidently and bent to kiss her again. I've been studying her for a week, asking questions, making friends with the crew. I can handle her one-handed. We'll take off and circle Jupiter first. They may think we landed on the other side, in the outlaw crevice, or they may figure that we went on to Saturn and will hide somewhere in the system there. But we won't do either, and they won't know where to look for us. Instead of turning back to the other side of Jupiter, we'll make a tangential angle out into space. We'll hold it for a month for safety's sake. We could hold it for fifty years, or a hundred if we needed to. There's fuel and provisions meant for the mines, enough to last that long. At the end of the month, we'll swing back, cut into the path of the sun, and pick up Mars as she comes in from behind Sol. On Mars, we can sell the Vulcan. There's an outfit in the equator zone, in the mountains west of the Great Canal, that will buy her, and no questions asked. I learned about them from a fraternity brother when I was in college. He'd run into some hard luck, they gave him a job, and he was making money hand over fist. They're asteroid miners. The work they do is illegal, but it's perfectly justified morally. What right have men with more money than they know what to do with to own everything in the solar system? How can a young fellow get a start any more, when corporations and rich old fogies own everything? Maybe I'll join up with this outfit. After we've sold the ship, I'll see. How does that sound to you? Wonderful, Hugh, Nanlo whispered. But I don't care about all that. All I want is for us to be together, always, you and me, and our love together for eternity. That's all I want. That's all I want, too, darling Nanlo, Hugh Niels told her passionately and kissed her. Together, forever, just you and me. Nanlo sighed with luxuriant happiness and peered at his radiumite wristwatch. The five minutes are up, she murmured. Can't we go now? Hugh Niels nodded. We've waited plenty long enough, he decided. The guard will be asleep by now. The crew were that way when I left them in the dormitory. I saw that they had plenty of spiked mulchai at dinner, pretended it was my birthday celebration, and the ship's all ready and waiting for the takeoff. All we have to do is lock the port and close the rising switch. The two on the bench by the fountain rose, and for a long minute were locked in an embrace. Then they turned towards the dark-shadowed trees and disappeared beneath them in the direction of the nearby spaceport. Neguma silently turned back into the house. Sliss shuffled after him. The uranium merchant led the way back to the vitriite-covered garden and there, a little wearily, resumed his seat and picked up his mug again. Sliss climbed back into his tub of water, sighed gratefully at the comfort it gave him, and then turned his pop eyes towards his host. He blinked once, inquiringly, and Neguma understood that the intelligent amphibian was asking if he intended to do nothing to stop the pair who were running away. Neguma sipped pensively at his drink. "'If only she had told me,' he murmured. "'If she had only come to me and said she desired her freedom, if they had only both come together and faced me, saying that though it gave... saying that though it meant giving up all they had, they wanted each other, I would have been generous. I would have been indulgent.' But they did not. They had not the courage. They were afraid of me, and they hated me. Neguma was silent for a moment. Both he and his guest stared towards the graceful shaft of the Vulcan, now fully silhouetted against the whole tremendous bulk of Jupiter, sitting like a titanic scarlet egg upon the horizon of Callisto. 
The Jupiter light flooded the vitreite garden, gave the plants there, chosen with his eye to this, strange, exotic, glowing colors, flushed Neguma and Sliss with a ruby radiance. Towards that dark waiting craft the two they had watched were even now stealing, tense with the weight of their daring and their crime. In a moment they would reach her, enter her, actuate machinery that was miraculous in its complex simplicity, and be gone then on the wings it gave them into the concealing embrace of universal space. "'You see, my friend Sliss,' Neguma said finally, "'Nanlo is beautiful, but there is nothing within. Her beauty deceived me. I thought that where such loveliness existed, there must be a soul to animate it. I was wrong. She is like an imitation gem, beautiful on the surface, paste within. Yet the mistake was mine. I did not blame her. I indulged her, and still hoped that something real would bloom within her. He drained the Molkai in his mug, one great gulp, then slumped back. The young man, too. Hugh Neils, I thought, he would be a companion for her, but he, too, is weak. Yet they say they love each other. They swear, we heard them, that they want only each other and their love for all time. Sliss blinked twice, and Neguma nodded. Yes. If they carry out their plans as we heard them, that feeling will soon go. The sale of the Vulcan, even as stolen property, would give them many credits. After that, luxury, self-indulgence, and their natures are too weak to withstand the ravages of such things, so I have been troubled to know what to do. You see, my friend from Venus, though I would have let Nanlo go had she asked me, my own honor is at stake when she seeks to deal me an injury by slipping away in the night and stealing from me the Vulcan. She is doing evil and must be punished. The young man, too, indulgent as I am, I cannot let him dishonor me thus without paying any penalty. Sliss's eye meant brains, shut questioningly. Yet, the uranium merchant went on, I have a fondness for Nanlo. I will not prevent her from doing as she has chosen to do, for the intent would still be there, and knowing it as I do, all between us is over. I cannot aid her to fulfill her plans either, for that is to injure her and myself too. But there is another course. I have chosen that. He gestured with one plump hand towards the silhouetted ship. I believe they have entered the Vulcan, he announced. I saw light in the entrance port opened then. The amphibian's great frog head nodded with agreement. So, Neguma continued, I have decided to exercise what indulgence I can in the face of the injury they would do me. They shall have their chance. He fell silent again. Sliss leaned forward in his tub, both of them watching intently. A flare of greenish light had sprung up beneath the black pillar that was the Vulcan. For just an instant the freighter stood there, green radiance expanding around her. Then she leapt into the sky. With her leap she seemed to suck the radiance along. It became a great cone of glowing light that, arrow-like, raced away upwards. For a long instant the black length of the ship and the greenish fan of flame were outlined against the scarlet background of Jupiter. Then the freighter rocket, flinging itself upward at three gravities or better, passed the edge of the planet and vanished. Neguma sat very quiet for some moments, but at last he stirred again. Sliss's eyes turned towards him, immobile. Sometimes love transforms the weak, the uranium merchant said slowly. Like fire giving temper to soft metal, sometimes a mutual love will endure for all eternity, and the two who share it will gain from it a soul they did not have before. Nanlo and Hugh Niels have this chance. Both said they wanted only the other, and their love, for all eternity. To gain this, both were willing to cheat, to steal, to dishonor me and themselves. So, Sliss, my understanding friend, they have paid the price. They shall have what they ask for. As the man Hugh Neal said, there is food and fuel in the holds of the Vulcan to run the motors and last the lifetime of a man, or a man and a woman. Indeed, two lifetimes, or three, for I was aware of their plans and secretly placed aboard the craft many additional supplies. Fuel, and food, and books, and tools, and one additional thing the two who flee now there in space have not counted upon. Into the controls of the Vulcan one of my engineers has placed a small device. After two hundred hours, or when they are well beyond Jupiter, this device will swing the Vulcan straight towards Proxima Centauri, the nearest star. In that position the controls will lock, and for twenty years, 
a generation. It will be impossible either to alter the course of the Vulcan or to shut her blast motors off. At the end of that time, the last tank of reserve fuel will be exhausted, and they will cease automatically. Then, once more, the Vulcan may be controlled by those aboard. They may switch the motors onto the tanks of fuel in the cargo holds and continue onwards. If they were celestial navigators, they might try to turn and seek Earth again. But they are not navigators, and the sun will be but a tiny spark in the limitless darkness, one with a million others, not to be told apart. They will know that only Proxima Centauri in all space may the Vulcan hope to reach in their lifetimes, or perhaps even in that of their descendants, for a message to that effect they will find presently. So it may be that they will continue onward of their own choice. If they make no choice, momentum will carry them onward, perhaps for ever. But in any case, Nanlo and Hugh Niels will have exactly what they asked for, each other, for all eternity. If truly that was what they wanted, a great destiny may be theirs. A lifetime of travel can bring them to the stars. They or their descendants can be the first humans to bridge the gap of nothingness that has thus far daunted the stoutest hearts. As they watched, the green dart of light dwindled and was gone, and quite invisible at last in the arms of outer darkness, the Vulcan sped its two passengers onwards towards the stars. This is the end of The Indulgence of Neguma by Robert Arthur. The Junk Makers by Albert Teichner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. The Junk Makers by Albert Teichner. Eric was the best robot they'd ever had. Perfectly trained, ever thoughtful, a joy to own. Naturally, they had to destroy him. Chapter 1 Wendell Hart had drifted rather than plunged into the underground movement. Later, discussing it with other members of the Savers' conspiracy, he found they had experienced the same slow, almost casual awakening. His own, though, had come at a more appropriate time, just a few weeks before the great ritual sacrifice. The sacrifice took place only once a decade, on High Holy Day, at dawn of the spring equinox. For days prior to it, joyous throngs of workers helped assemble old vehicles, machine tools, and computers in the public squares. In the evening of the day, they proudly made their private heaps on the neat green lawns of their homes. These traditionally consisted of household utensils, electric heaters, air conditioners, and the family servant. The wealthiest, considered particularly blessed, even had two or three automatic servants beyond the public contribution, which they destroyed in private. Their more average neighbors crowded into their gardens for the awesome festivities. The next morning everyone could return to work, renewed by the knowledge that the festival of acute shortages would be with them for months. Like everyone else, Wendell had felt his sluggish pulse gaining new life as the time drew near. A cybernetics engineer and machine tender, he was down to ten hours a week of work. Many others in the luxury-gorged economy had even smaller shares of the purposeful activities that remained. At night he dreamed of the slagger moving from house to house as it burned, melted, and then evaporated each group of junked labor-blocking devices. He even had glorious daydreams about it. Walking down the park side of his home block, he was liable to lose all contact with the outside world and peer through the mind's eye alone at the climactic destruction. Why, he sometimes wondered, are all these things so necessary to our resurrection? Marie had the right answer for him, the one she had learned by rote in early childhood. All life moves in cycles. Creation and progress must be preceded by destruction. In ancient times that meant we had to destroy each other. But for the past century our inherent need for negative moments has been sublimated. That's the word the news broadcasts use. Into proper 
destruction. His wife smiled. I'm only giving the moral reason, of course. The practical one's obvious. Obvious it was. He had to concede. Men needed to work. Not out of economic necessity any more, but for the sake of work itself. Still, a man had to wonder. He had begun to visit the public library archives, poring over musty references that always led to maddeningly frustrating dead ends. For the past century nothing really informative seemed to have been written on the subject. "'You must have government authorization,' the librarian explained when he asked for older references, which naturally made him add a little suspicion to his already large dose of wonder. "'You're tampering with something dangerous,' Marie warned. It would make more sense for you to take long sleep pills until the work cycle picks up. I will get to see those early references, he said through clenched teeth. He did. All he had needed to say at the library was that his work in sociology required investigation of some twentieth-century files. The librarian, a tall, gaunt man, had given him a speculative glance. Of course, you don't have government clearance. but. We get so few inquiries in sociology that I'm willing to offer a little encouragement. He sighed. Don't get many inquiries altogether. Most people just can't stand reading. You might be interested to know this. One of the best headings to research in sociology is Conspicuous Consumption. Then it was Wendell's turn to glance speculatively. The older man, around a healthy hundred and twenty-five, had a look of earnest dedication about him that commanded respect as well as confidence. Conspicuous consumption. An odd combination of words. Never heard of that before. I will look it up. The librarian was nervous as he led his visitor into a reference booth. That's about all the help I can offer. If anything comes up, just ring for me. Burnett's the name. Uh, you won't mention I put you on the file without authorization, I hope. Certainly not. As soon as he was alone, he typed conspicuous consumption into the query machine. It started grinding out long bibliographical sheets, as well as cross-references to obsolescence, comma, natural, obsolescence, comma, technological, obsolescence, comma, planned, plus even odder items, such as waste-making, comma, art of and production, comma, stimulated velocity of. How did such disparate subjects tie in with each other? By the end of the afternoon he began to see, if only dimly, to what the unending stream of words on the viewer pointed. For centuries ruling classes had made a habit of conspicuously wasting goods and services that were necessities for the mass of men. It was the final and highest symbol of social power. By the time of Louis the Fourteenth, the phenomenon had reached its first peak. The second came in the twentieth century, when mass production permitted millions to devote their lives to the acquisition and waste of non-essentials. Hart's twenty-second century sensibilities were repelled by the examples given. He shuddered at the thought of such antisocial behavior. But a parallel development was more appealingly positive in its implications. As the technological revolution speeded up, devices were superseded as soon as produced. The whole last half of the 1900s was filled with instances where the drawing board kept outstripping the assembly line. Hart remembered this last change from early school days, but the latter, final development, was completely new and shocking to him. Advertising had pressured more and more people to replace goods before they wore out with other goods that were essentially no improvement on their predecessors. Eventually just the word new was enough to trigger buying panics. There had been growing awareness of what was happening, even sporadic resistance to it by such varied ideologies as conservative thrift, uh, asocial beatnikism, and radical inquiry. But strangely enough, very few people had cared. Indeed, anything that diminished consumption was viewed as dangerously subversive. And rightly so, was his first instinctive reaction. His second reasoned one, though, was less certain. The contradiction started to give him a headache. He hurried from the scanning room, overtaxed eyes blinking at the rediscovery of daylight. Burnett walked him to the door. Not feeling well? he inquired. I'll be all right. I just need a few days' real work. He stopped. No. 
that's not why. I'm confused. I've been reading crazy things about obsolescence. They used to have strange reasons for it. Why, some people even said replacements were not always improvements and were unnecessary. Burnett could not completely hide his pleasure. You've been getting into rather deep stuff. Deep or nonsensical. True, true. Come back tomorrow and read some more. Maybe I will. But he was happy to get away from the library building. Marie was horrified when he told her that evening about his studies. Don't go back there, she pleaded. It's dangerous. It's subversive. How could people say such awful things? You remember that Mr. Johnson around the corner? He seemed such a nice man, too, until they arrested him without giving a reason. And how messed up he was when he got out last year. I'll bet that kind of talk explains the whole thing. It's crazy. Everyone knows items start wearing out and they have to be replaced. I realize that, honey, but it's interesting to speculate. Don't we have guaranteed freedom of thought? She threw up her hands as if dealing with a child. Naturally we have freedom of thought, but you should have the right thoughts, shouldn't you? Wendell, uh, promise me you won't go back to that library. Well, reading's a very risky thing anyway. Her eyes were saucer round with fright. Please, darling, promise. Sure, you're right, honey, I, I promise. He meant it when he said it, but that night, tossing from side to side, he felt less certain. In the morning, as he went out, Marie asked him where he was going. I want to observe the preparations for the preliminary rites. Now that, she grinned, is what I call healthy thinking. For a while he did stand around the central plaza along with thousands of other idlers, watching the robot dump trucks assemble the piles of discarded equipment. The crowd cheered loudly as an enormous crane was knocked over on its side. There's fifty millions worth out there, a bystander exulted. It's going to be the biggest preliminary I've ever seen. It certainly will be, he said, catching a little of the other man's enthusiasm despite his previous doubts. Preliminary rites were part of the emotion-stoking that preceded the highest holy day. Each rite was greater and more destructive than those that had gone before. As tokens of happy loyalty, viewers threw hats and watches and stick-pins onto the pile just prior to the entry of the slaggers. What better way could be found for each man to manifest his common humanity? After a while, doubt started assailing him again, and Hart found himself returning almost against his will to the library building. Burnett greeted him cordially. Today's visit is completely legal, he said. Anyone doing olden-time research is automatically authorized if he has been here before. I hope my thought can be as legal, Hart blurted out. Well, that was just a joke. Oh, I can recognize a joke when I hear one, my friend. Hart went to his booth, feeling the man's eyes measuring him more intently than ever. It was almost a welcome relief to start reading the reference scanner once more. But not for long. As the wider pattern unfolded, his anxiety stayed intensified. It was becoming perfectly obvious that many, many replacements used to be made long before they were needed. And it was still true. I should not be thinking such thoughts, he told himself. I should be outside in the plaza, being normal and human. But he could see how it had come about, step by step. First there had been pressure from the ruling echelons, many of whose members only maintained their status through excessive production. Then, much more important, there had been the willful blindness of the masses who wanted to keep their cozy, familiar treadmills going. He slammed down the off button and went out to the librarian's desk. Do people want to work all the time, he said, for the sake of work alone? He immediately regretted the question. But Burnett did not seem to mind. You've only stated the positive reason, Mr. Hart. The negative one could be stronger. The fear of what they would have to do if they did not have to work much over a long period. What would it mean? Why, they would have to start thinking. Most people don't mind thought if it's concentrated in a narrow range. But if they have to think in a broad range to keep boredom away, no. That's too high a price for most of them. 
They avoid it when they can, and under present circumstances, they can. He stopped. Of course, that's a purely hypothetical fiction I'm constructing. Hart shook his head. It sounds awfully real to be purely... He, too, caught himself up. Uh, of course, you're only positing a fiction. Burnett started putting his desk papers away. I'm leaving now. The preliminary begins soon. Want to come? The man's face was stolidly blank, except for his brown eyes, which burned like a zealot's. Fascinated by them, Hart agreed. It would be best to return anyway. Some of the bystanders had looked too curiously at him when he had left. Who would willingly leave a right when it was approaching its climax? Chapter 2 The plaza was now thronged, and the sacrificial pile towered over a hundred feet in the cleared center area. Then, as the first collective, ah, arose, a giant slagger lumbered in from the east, the direction prescribed for such commencements. Long polarity arms glided smoothly out of the central mechanism and reached the length for total destruction. That's the automatic setting, parents explained to their children. When? the children demanded eagerly. Any moment now. Then the unforeseen occurred. There was a rumbling from inside the pile, and a huge jagged patchwork of metal shot out, smashing both arms. The slagger teetered swaying more and more violently from side to side until it collapsed on its side. The rumbling grew, and then the pile, like a mechanical cancer, ripped the slagger apart and then absorbed it. The panicking crowd fell back. Somewhere a child began crying, provoking more hubbub. Sabotage! people were crying. Let's get away! Nothing like this had ever happened before, but Hart knew instantly what had caused it. Some high-level servo-mechanisms had not been thoroughly disconnected. They had repaired their damages, then imposed their patterns on the material at hand. A second slagger came rushing into the square. It discharged immediately, and the pile finally collapsed and disintegrated as it was supposed to. The crowd was too shocked to feel the triumph it had come for. But Hart could not share their horror. Burnett eyed him. Better look indignant, he said. They'll be out for blood. Somebody must have sabotaged the setup. Catch the culprits, he shouted, joining the crowd around him. Stop antisocial acts. Stop antisocial acts, roared Burnett, and in a whisper, Hart, let's get out of here. As they pushed their way through the milling crowd, a loudspeaker boomed out. Return home in peace. The instincts of the people are good. Healthy destruction forever. The criminals will be tracked down, if they exist. A terrible thing, friend, a woman said to them. Terrible, friend, Burnett agreed. Smash the antisocial elements without mercy. Three children were clustered together, crying. I wanted to set the right example for them, said the father to anyone who would listen. They'll never get over this. Hart tried to console them. Next week is High Holy Day he said, but the bawling only increased. The two men finally reached a side avenue where the crowd was thinner. Come with me, Burnett ordered. I want you to meet some people. He sounded as if he were instituting military discipline, but Hart, still dazed, willingly followed. It wasn't such a terrible thing, he said, listening to the distant uproar. Why don't they shut up? They will, eventually. Burnett marched straight ahead and looked fixedly in the same direction. The thing could have gobbled up the city if there hadn't been a second slagger, said a lone passerby. Nonsense, Burnett muttered under his breath. You know that, Hart. Any self-regulating mechanism reaches a check limit sooner than that. It has to. They turned into a large building and went up to the fiftieth floor. My apartment, said Burnett as he opened the door. There were about fifteen people in the large living room. They rose, smiling, to greet their host. Let's save these self-congratulations for later, snapped Burnett. These were merely our own preliminaries. We're not out of the woods yet. This, ladies and gentlemen, is our newest recruit. He has seen the light. I have fed him basic data, and I'm sure we're not making a mistake with him. 
Hart was about to demand what was going on when a short man with eyes as intense as Burnett's proposed a toast to the fiasco in the plaza. Everyone joined in, and he did not have to ask. Burnett, I don't quite understand why I am here, but aren't you taking a chance with me? Not at all. I've followed your reactions since your first visit to the library. Others here have also, when you were completely unaware of being observed. The gradual shift in viewpoint is familiar to us. We've all been through it. The really important point is that you no longer like the kind of world into which you were born. That's true, but no one can change that. We are changing it, said a thin-faced young woman. I work in a servo lab, and— Miss Wright, time enough for that later, interrupted Burnett. What we must know now, Mr. Hart, is how much you are willing to do for your new-found convictions. It will be more work than you've ever dreamed possible. He felt as exhilarated as he did in the months after High Holy Day. I'm down to under ten hours labor a week. I'd do anything for your group if I could get more work. Burnett gave him a hearty handshake of congratulation, but was frowning as he did so. You're doing the right thing for the wrong reason. Every member of this group could tell you why. Miss Wright, since you feel like talking, explain the matter. Certainly, Mr. Hart. We are engaged in an activity of so-called subversion for a positive reason, not merely to avoid insufficient workload. Your reason shows you are still being moved by the values that you despise. We want to cut the work production load on people. We want them to face the problem of leisure, not flee from it. There's a heartwarming paradox here, Burnett explained. Every excess eventually undermines itself. Everybody in the movement starts by wanting to act for their beliefs because work appears so attractive for its own sake. I was that way, too, until I studied the dead art of philosophy. Well, Hart sat down, deeply troubled. Look, I, I deplore destroying equipment that is still perfectly useful as much as any of you do, but there is a problem. If the destruction were stopped, there would be so much leisure people would rot from boredom. Burnett pounced eagerly on the argument. Instead, they're rotting from artificial work. Boredom is a temporary, if recurring, phenomenon of living, not a permanent one. If most men face the difficulty of empty time long enough, they will find new problems with which to fill that time. That's where philosophy showed me the way. None of its fundamental mysteries can ever be solved, but as you pit yourself against them, your experience and capacity for being alive grows. Very nice, Hart grinned, wanting all men to be philosophers. They never have been. You shouldn't have brought him here, growled the short man. He's not one of us. Now we have a real mess. Johnson, I'm the leader of this group, Burnett exploded. Credit me with a little understanding. All right, Hart, what you say is true, but why? Because most men have always worked too hard to achieve the fruits of curiosity? I hate to keep being a spoil sport, but what does that prove? Some men who had to work as hard as the rest have been interested in things beyond the end of their nose. They all groaned their disapproval. A good point, Hart, but it doesn't prove what you think. It just shows that a minority enjoy innate capacities and environmental variations that make the transition to philosopher easier. And you haven't proven anything about the incurious majority. This does, though. Whenever there was a favorable period, the majority who could, as you put it, see beyond the ends of their noses, increased. Our era is just the opposite. We are trapped in a vicious circle. Those noses are usually so close to the grindstone that men are afraid to raise their heads. We are breaking that circle. It's a terribly important thing to aim for, Burnett, but... He brought up another doubt, and somebody else answered it immediately. For the next half hour, as one uncertainty was expressed after another, everybody joined in the answers, until inexorable logic forced his surrender. All right, he conceded. I will do anything I can, not to make work for myself, but to help mankind rise above it. Except for a brief triumphant glance in Johnson's direction, Burnett gave no further attention to what had happened and plunged immediately into practical matters. 
to halt the blind worship of work, the rites had first to be discredited, and to discredit the rites, the awe inspired by their infallible performance had to be weakened. The sabotage of the preliminary had been the first local step in that direction. There had been a few similar, if smaller, episodes executed by other groups, but they had received as little publicity as possible. Johnson. You pulled one so big this time that they can't hide it. Twenty thousand witnesses. When it comes to getting things done, you're the best we have. The little man grinned. But you're the one who knows how to pick recruits and organize our concepts. This is how it worked. I refed the emptied cryotron memory box of a robot discarded with patterns to deal with anything it was likely to encounter in a destruction pile. I kept the absolute freeze mechanism in working order, but developed a shield that would hide its activity from the best pile detector. He spread a large tissue schematic out on the floor, and they all gathered around it to study the details. Now, the important thing was to have an external element that could resume contact with a wider circuit, which could in turn start meshing with the whole robot mechanism and then through that mechanism into the pile. This little lever made the contact at a pre-fed time. Miss Wright was enthusiastic. That contact is half the size of any I've been able to make. It's crucially important, she added to Hart. A large contact can look suspicious. While others took many photos of the schematic, Hart studied the contact carefully. I think I can reduce its size by another fifty percent. Alloys are one of my specialties. When I get a chance to work at them... That would be ideal, said Burnett. Then we could set up many more discarded robots without risk. How long will it take? I can rough it out right now. He scribbled down the necessary formulas, and everyone photographed that, too. Maximum security is now in effect, announced Burnett. You will destroy your copies as soon as you have transferred them to edible base copies. At the first hint of danger, you will consume them. Use home enlargers for study. In no case are you to make permanent blow-ups that would be difficult to destroy quickly. He considered them sternly. Remember, you are running a great risk. You are not only opposing the will of the state, but the present will of the vast majority of citizens. If there are as many other underground groups as you indicate, said Hart, they should have this information. We'll get it to them, answered Burnett. I'm going on health leave from my job. And... What will be your excuse? Wright demanded anxiously. Nervous shock, smiled their leader. After all, I did see today's events in the plaza. When Hart reached home, his wife was waiting for him. Why did you take so long, Wendell? I was worried sick. The radio says antisocials are turning wild servos loose. How could human beings do such a thing? I was there. I saw it all happen, he frowned. The crowd was so dense I couldn't get away. But what happened? The way the news broadcast was, I couldn't understand anything. He described the situation in great detail and awaited Marie's reaction. It was even more encouraging than he had hoped for. I understand less than before. How could anything reactivate that rubble? They put everything over five years old into the piles, and the stuff's supposed to be decrepit already. You'd almost think we were destroying wealth before its time, because if those disabled mechanisms reactivate... She came to a dead halt. That's madness. Ugh, oh, I wish High Holy Day were here already so I could get back to work and stop this empty thinking. Her honest face was more painfully distorted than he had ever seen it before, even during the universal pre-write doldrums. Only a few more days to go, he consoled. Don't worry, honey. Everything's going to be all right. Now, I'd like to be alone in the study for a while. I've been through an exhausting time. Aren't you going to eat? The last word triggered the entry of Eric, their domestic robot, pushing the dinner cart ahead of him. No food tonight, Hart insisted. The shining metal head nodded its assent, and the cart was wheeled out. That's not a very humane thing to do she scolded. Eric's not going to be serving many more meals. Good grief, Marie, just leave me alone for a while, will you? He slammed the study door shut, warning himself to display less nervousness in the future as he listened to her pacing outside. Then she went away. 
The projector gave him a good-sized wall image to consider. He spent most of the night calculating where he could place tiny self-activators in the obsolescent robots that were to be donated by his plant. Then he set up the instruction tapes to make the miniature contacts. Production, then, would be a simple job, only taking a few minutes, and during a workday there was always many periods longer than that when he was alone on the production floor. But thinking out the matter without computers was much more difficult. Human beings ordinarily filled their time on a lower, abstracting level. When he unlocked the study door in the morning, he was startled to see Marie bustling down the corridor, pushing the food service cart herself. That did not make sense especially considering last night's statement about Eric. "'I thought you'd want breakfast early,' she coughed. "'You didn't have to bother, honey. Eric could have done it.' If she had been prying, the cart might have been a prop to take up as soon as he came out. On the other hand, what could she, in her technical ignorance, make of such matters anyway? It was best not to rouse any deeper suspicions by openly noticing her wifely nosiness. At breakfast they pretended nothing had happened, devoting the time to mutually disapproved cousins. But all day long he kept wondering whether ignorant knowledge couldn't be as dangerous as the knowing kind. The next morning, after a long sleep, he went to the factory for the first of his semi-weekly work periods. He sat before a huge console, surveying scores of dials at the end of a machine that was over five hundred yards long. Today it was turning out glass paper the color of watered blood made only for ritual publications, packing it in sheets and dispatching them in automatic trucks. But the machine could be adjusted to everything from metal sheeting to plastic felts. At the far end sat another man, diminished by distance, busily tending more dials that could really take care of themselves. After a while the man went out for a break. Hart ran a hundred yards to a section that was not working. He snapped it into the alloy supply and fed in the tape. In a minute several dozen tiny contacts came down a chute. He pocketed them and disconnected the section just before his fellow worker reappeared. The man walked down the floor to him, looking curious. "'Anything the matter?' he asked, hopeful for some break in routine. "'No, just felt like a walk.' "'Know what you mean. I feel restless, too. Too bad this plant's only two years old. Boy, wouldn't she make a great disintegration?' He grinned, slapping a fender affectionately. Hart joined in the joke. Gives us something to look forward to in ten years. A good way to look at things, said the other man. At home he locked the contacts in a desk drawer. Tomorrow he would deliver most of them to Burnett's apartment. But the next morning an emergency letter came from his group leader, warning him not to appear there. I am going completely underground. I think they may suspect my activities. The dispersion plan must go into effect. You know how to reach Johnson and Wright, and they each in turn can get to two others. Good luck." He had just put the letter in his pocket when Eric announced the arrival of a rituals inspector. The man had nervous, close-set eyes and seemed embarrassed by his need to make such a visit. Hart took the offensive as his best defense. "'I don't understand this, inspector,' he protested. You people should be busy with high holy preparations. Are you losing your taste for work? Now, now, Mr. Hart, that's a very unkind remark. I dislike this nonsense as much as anyone. His square jaw chewed into each word as he opened his scanning box. It's the anti-social sabotage. Do you mean to say I'm under suspicion? Marie was now loitering in the doorway. Worse luck. Oh, no, nothing so insulting. This is strictly impersonal. The scanning center has picked apartments at complete random and were to make spot checks. The eye at one end of the box blinked wickedly, waiting for an information feed. Now, sir, if you'll pardon me, I'll just take the records from one of those desk drawers, any drawer, and put them in the box. Hart slid open a drawer. No, sir, I think I'll try the next one. It's regulation not to accept suggestions. With a hand made deft by practice, he scooped out all the sheets and tapes and put them in the box. The scanner's fingers rapidly sorted them past the eye. Hart exhaled, relieved that an innocuous drawer had been selected, and the inspector handed back the material to him. Well, inspector, that's that. Not quite. The inspector selected another drawer at the other end of the desk and dumped everything before the scanner. 
His examination was speeding up, and that was not good. He would have time to take more sample readings. Now, if you'll empty your left pocket. Oh, this is too much, Marie exploded. My husband struggles all night on secret work, studying to find ways to stop the antisocials, and you treat him like one of them. You're working on the problem? The inspector said respectfully. What are you doing? Frying pan to fire. Hart preferred the pan and pulled open a drawer. It's too complicated, too much time needed to explain. The inspector glanced at his watch. I'm falling behind schedule. He closed up his box. Sorry, but I have to leave. Heavy timesheet today. As soon as he was gone, Hart breathed easier. Nothing incriminating would be fed into the central scanner. Marie became apologetic. I'm sorry I said it, Wendell, but I couldn't keep quiet. All I did last night was peek in once or twice. He shrugged. I'm just on a minor project. Every bit counts. She shook her head. Only you have to wonder. I mean, don't think I'm treasoning, but while I was shopping an hour ago, a lot of women said you have to think. How come all that obsolescent junk could work so well after being thoroughly wrecked, too? You almost wonder whether some of it was too good for disintegration. Wendell pretended to be shocked. Just a fluke of circumstance. If something like that happened again, you'd be right to wonder. But it could not ever happen again. But don't get me wrong, Wendell. None of the women attacked anything. It was more like what you just said. They said if it happened again, then you'd have to wonder. But of course it couldn't happen again. How well the tables had turned. Not only had Marie's ignorant knowledge proven helpful, but she had now given him a positive idea also. When he met Wright and Johnson at the latter's apartment that evening, he explained it to them. We can propagate dangerous thoughts and yet appear to be completely loyal. We can set up the reaction to next High Holy Day. How? demanded Johnson. That's having your cake and eating it. Nothing's impossible in the human mind, Wright said. Let's listen. Here's the point. Wherever you go, there will be people tisk-tisking about the preliminary fiasco. Just reassure them. Say it meant nothing at all by itself. If it ever happened again, then there would be room for doubt. But, of course, it could not happen again. Wright smiled. That's almost feminine in its subtlety. He smiled back. My wife inspired it. Don't get nervous. It was unconscious, sheerly by accident. Whatever the cause, it's the perfect result, Johnson conceded. We'll spread it through the net. Along with this, I hope, Wendell dumped the contacts on the tabletop. It's the smallest size possible. A lot should get by unnoticed. Find cell members who can set up cryotrons with a wide range of instructions to cope with anything in the piles. Some weirdly alive concoctions of obsolescent parts ought to result. Some day the world's going to know what you've done for it said Johnson solemnly. That could happen too soon. Miss Wright's face, honest and open in its horse-like length, broke into a wide grin. Amen, said Hart, adding the private hope that Marie, blessed with superior looks, might be able to show as much superior wisdom some day. The hope was not immediately fulfilled. When he reached home, Marie was in a tizzy of excitement. You're just in time, darling. They just caught three subversives. One of them was a woman, she added, as this were compounding an improbability with an impossibility. They're going to show them. He gripped his belt tightly. A woman? That's right. There she is now. A uniformed officer was gently helping a pale little old woman sit down before the camera, as if she were more an object of pity than of fear. Hart relaxed. Caught red-handed with the incriminating papers, shouted an off-stage announcer. Handbills asserting objects declared obsolescent could actually last indefinitely. What do you have to say for yourself? the officer asked gently. You must realize, of course, that such irreligious behavior precludes your moving in general society for a long time to come. I, I don't know what came over me, she sobbed in a tired voice. Curiosity. Yes, curiosity, that's what it was. I, I saw these sheets of paper in the street, and they said we should stop working so hard at compulsory tasks and start working to expand our own interests and personalities. 
"'Self-contradictory nonsense!' said the voice. "'Yes, I know that. But it made me curious, and I took it home to read, and it said our compulsory tasks were artificially manufactured. And if you didn't believe that, look at the pile that reactivated itself the other day.' She stopped, reorganizing her thoughts. "'Of course, though, that thing in the plaza was unique, you know. I, I don't think it could mean a thing, unless it happened a few times. And the fact is, it won't ever happen again.' "'Well, that much makes very good sense.' said Marie. You said the same thing, Wendell. I, I don't think that poor woman knew what she was doing. Just a dupe for subversive propaganda. A dupe for subversive propaganda, the announcer was saying. See? Exactly what I said. Yes, dear. How swiftly the decentralized underground was working. Hart could not tell whether the old woman was an active member or just a passive responder. But it did not matter. She was now spreading the seeds for future doubt across the land. Two old men were brought in, and they mumbled the same disconnected story as their sister. "'We have intensively interrogated these prisoners,' boomed the announcer, "'and know there is nothing more to the rumored antisocial plot than this stupid chatter. Remain vigilant, and you have nothing to fear. "'You are sentenced to five years' isolation from general society.' said the officer, in a voice dulcet enough to sell advance orders for replacement products that had not yet been made. Our intention is to protect you from bad influences. Our hope is that others will take your lesson to heart. "'God bless you,' said the woman, and her brothers joined in effusive thanks. "'Makes you proud to be a human being,' Marie said. "'I was getting some stupid doubts myself, dear. I, I must admit it. But that's all past.' I can hardly wait for the highest holy day. Neither can I, sighed her husband. Chapter 3 The next day at noon Eric came to him, functioning on the final set of servo instructions that had been installed in him at the factory of his birth eight years before. He shook hands with the two of them and said, Now I am prepared for death. Marie was tearful. I will miss you, Eric. If you were only under five years old, your span could be extended. Everything that happens is right, Eric said impassively. He clambered onto the operation table, instinctively knowing which flat surface was for him, and, breaking all his major circuits, gave up the ghost that only man could restore to him. Hart found his wife's grief easy to bear. The day after tomorrow she would join in the general exaltation of High Holy Day, with Eric well forgotten. He methodically began smashing the surface of the limbs and torso. The greater the visible damage, the greater the honor redounding to the sacrificed donor. This will be our gift to the general pile, he said. I thought we could keep him for our garden sacrifice, Marie protested meekly. Most people do. But the other way is the greater sacrifice. There was no reply, because she knew he spoke for the deeper, more moving custom. But suddenly he began to act depressed himself. I know we say it every ten years, but Eric was really the best companion we ever had. He gestured toward the table. I, I want to sit here with him for a while. Alone. That's carrying things too far, Wendell. A little grief is proper, but this much is actually morbid. It's all within my rights. She tossed her head petulantly. Well, I've done my share. I can't stand any more. It makes a person think and get depressed. I don't care what you're going to do. I'm going out to enjoy a preliminary. Can't blame you for that, he nodded. When she had gone, he started to work on new instruction tapes for activating the servo cryotron. Nothing could be surrendered to chance. Every possible circumstance in the pile had to be anticipated. There had to be instructions for action if Eric was crushed below fifty feet of metal, for assembling any kind of scrambled wiring, for adapting all types of parts in its immediate surroundings, for using these parts to absorb parts further away, and for timing the operation to the start of the highest right. Some tapes had been prepared earlier so it was possible to put everything in the cryotron box before Marie returned, as well as to attach the tiny contact that would reach out from the box until it reached its first external scrap of wire or metal. "'You poor darling,' she pouted. 
You missed the most wonderful thing. They demolished a whole thirty-story building. His blood, atavistically affected, pulsed faster until his new creed came to grips with his old emotions. They usually don't bother with buildings for the rights. I know. That's what was so wonderful. The State has decided to make this one the biggest day of all time. We'll have enough work to fill the whole ten years. Everybody was so happy. I'm sure they were. He caught himself in mid-sarcasm and said, I'm sorry I missed it. And I'm sorry I've been so selfishly self-centered, she frowned. I forgot about it, but there were people in the crowd boasting they had been assigned to fight antisocial movements. I had to boast back that my husband had been honored, too. He tensed. Oh? What did they say to that? Frankly, they laughed. I should think so. The central scanner didn't pick up anything except a lot of ineffective propaganda. The sabotage business was all hysteria. That's just what they said. The assignments were an empty honor. She coldly considered Eric. I want to wreck him, too. I've smashed the insides, he said. You better just work the surface. That's all I want to do, she answered, starting to scratch traditional marks all over the dead robot. It gave her a full afternoon of happy, busy labor. The next day a large open truck came around and the street echoed to the appeal for contributions. Festival spirit was running high everywhere, and when the neighborhood crowd saw the young robot porters carry Eric out, there was a loud cheer of appreciation. My husband decided on a major contribution right away, Marie announced to them. It's the least we could do, he said modestly. Many onlookers, swept away by their example, rushed indoors to bring out additional items of sacrifice. But only two others gave up their robots. The rest clung to them for private holy night ceremonies. Soon Eric disappeared under the renewed deluge of egg-beaters and washers. The best collection I've seen today, said the inspector accompanying the truck. You people are to be congratulated for your exceptional patriotism. Destroy! they shouted back joyously. Make work! At dawn the central plaza was already crowded, and new hordes kept pouring in from the outlying areas. Wendell and his wife had been among the first to arrive. They waited impatiently in their separate ways on the borderline five hundred yards from the ten-story pyre. Martial music roared from the loudspeakers, interrupted by the mellifluous boom of a merchandising announcer. New product! Better models! One hundred years of high holy days! New! 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 Destroy! came the returning shout. Make work! Make work! All the sounds echoed back and forth until baffled away by the open areas across the plaza, where one large structure had already been destroyed. Three others were slated for collapse today. The biggest holy day ever, a restless old woman said to Marie. I've seen all nine of them. Eric's in there. Marie chatted back, superficially sad, deeply happy. Who? Our house robot. Imagine that. Did you hear that? People gathered round them and cheered. The good-natured jostling continued until someone said, Five minutes to go. Wendell checked his watch. Somewhere in the pile at least one element was coming to life, a metal arm reaching out for brother metal to engulf in its cybernetic sweep. They're coming! A line of six shiny new slaggers came rumbling into the open with military precision. They moved along slowly, prolonging the pleasures of anticipation, then broke rank, each seeking its assigned point around the pile of appliances gathered for destruction. The latest improved models, said the loudspeakers. They will first perform fifteen minutes of automatic maneuvers. The military music resumed, and each slagger turned as if circling a coin in clanking rhythm to it. The three hundred and sixty degree turn. Next, making a box on the plaza floor. The voice stopped, appalled. An avalanche of metal slid down one side of the pile, and the crowd gasped. The downward movement viscously slowed. Then the metal, suddenly alive with the capacity to defy gravity, circled upward. Jagged limbs started flailing about. Disintegrator attack, screamed the loudspeakers. Attack! The maneuvers stopped. For one brief moment prior to the changeover, the plaza was dead still, except for the deafening rumble in the pile. 
The slaggers broke the spell, rushing full speed toward the pile, evaporator beams working. One by one they faltered and were sucked into the destructive pyre. The crowd fell further back. The whole pile came alive like a mineral octopus. Then the squirming thing collapsed, every makeshift circuit irreparably broken and dead. Everything had been happening too fast for any pronounced reaction to accompany it. But now the world went crazy. "'Stand firm!' pleaded the loudspeakers. "'We will get reinforcements as soon as celebrations are finished elsewhere.' A barrage of enormous boos came from the disintegrating mob. "'Never again! Fakes! It's finished! Done for! Stand firm!' But the break-up down side avenues continued. "'I don't understand!' Marie shuddered. Everything's crazy. We've been deceived, Wendell. Who's been deceiving us? Nobody, unless it's ourselves. I don't understand that either. Saucer-eyed, she watched a great clump of disgruntled people push past. I have to think. Suddenly, as they came around a corner, they were facing Burnett. Hart tried to disregard him, but the group leader would have none of that. He rushed up to Hart. Good to see a friendly face. Shocking developments. His face was grim, but tiny wrinkles at the corners of his eyes betrayed an amusement that could only be discovered by those who looked for it. Mr. Burnett, he explained to Marie, a librarian at the main building. Mr. Burnett, my wife, Marie. I am most happy to meet you, Mrs. Hart. Have you heard the latest? No, Mr. Burnett. The same things have been happening everywhere. They announced it on the radio, and they're saying it's due to antisocial elements. Shocking!" She shook her head stubbornly. I, I don't know what to think. Maybe we shouldn't be shocked. Maybe we should be. I, I just don't know, Mr. Burnett. I came to enjoy myself, and look how it's ended. She bravely held back a sob. Maybe we'd have been better off if we never heard about High Holy Days. Burnett looked about with feigned apprehension. You have to be careful what you say. The government says there's even talk, subversive handbills, about trying to rehabilitate some of the stuff in the piles. The government ought to keep quiet, she exploded. They said this couldn't happen. You can't believe anything they say any more. The people decide, and the government will have to listen. That's what I say. And I'm a pretty typical person, not one of your intellectual kind. No criticism of present company intended. None taken, Mrs. Hart. Our human future, said Burnett, exchanging a grin with his aide, remains as it always has really been. Interesting, to say the least. End of The Junk Makers by Albert Teichner Martian V. F. W. by G. L. Vandenberg. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Franklin Paul. Martian V. F. W by G. L. Vandenberg. There's nothing like a parade, I always say. Of course, I'm a Martian. Mr. Crothers was a busy man. Coordinating the biggest parade in New York's history is not easy. He was maneuvering his 200 pounds around Washington Square with the agility of a quarterback. He had his hands full organizing marchers, locating floats, placing their many brass bands in their proper order, and barking commands to assistance. But Mr. Crothers approached the job with all the zeal of an evangelist at a revival meeting. As he approached the southwest corner of the square, he saw something that jarred his already frayed nerves. He stopped, abruptly. The mass of clipboards and papers he was carrying fell to the street. There before him were one hundred and fifty ants, each of them at least six feet tall. His first impulse was to turn and run for the nearest doctor. 
he was certain that the strain of his job was proving too much for him. But one of the ants approached him. It seemed friendly enough, so Mr. Crothers stood his ground. My group is waiting for their assignment, the ant's voice seemed to be coming from the very core of his thorax, which was a violent red. Good Lord! Mr. Crothers' mouth opened as wide as an oven door. Mr. Crothers, I believe the parade is about to start, and my group... Mr. Crothers managed to blurt out, what the, what the devil are you, anyway? This is the parade marking the International Geophysical Year, is it not? The ant had a pleasant, friendly voice. Well, yes, but... And you are Mr. Crothers, the manager of the parade. Is that not correct? Mr. Crothers rubbed his eyes and took another look at the strange creature. Its head was brilliant yellow. It had two large goggle eyes, which rolled like itinerant marbles when it spoke. The low-slung abdomen was burnt brown. It was bad enough, Crothers thought, that these ants were six feet tall, but it was nightmarish to see them in three colors. Mr. Crothers... The ant continued, haven't you been instructed by the National Academy of Sciences that the Martian VFW is to participate in this parade? The Martian, Mr. Crothers' mouth was open again. Then he realized that when the ant spoke, its mouth didn't move. He picked up his clipboard and papers from the street. His voice was hostile now. What the hell is this, some kind of gag? What are you trying to do, scare a man half to death? Oh, we're not joking, Mr. Crothers. The National Academy, they didn't say anything to me about a bunch of clowns dressed up like ants. Mr. Crothers' indignation became intensified. He was loath to admit that he'd been taken in by such obviously animated costumes. Now look here, I I'm a very busy man. The arrangements have been made, Mr. Crothers. If my group is refused a place in this parade, we shall file suit immediately. As manager, you'll be named co-defendant. The ant was gentle, but firm. The thought of being sued softened Mr. Crothers' attitude. Well, I'm very sorry, pal, but every contingent in this parade is listed on my clipboard, and you're not. I know this list by heart. What did you say the name of your group was? The Martian VFW. Mr. Crothers was amused. Those sure are the craziest outfits I've ever seen, he chuckled. Where'd you get them? Walt Disney make them for you? He followed his own little joke with a long, throaty laugh. The ant was impatient. About the parade, Mr. Crothers, there isn't much time. Oh, yes, the parade. Well, let me see. He thumbed through his clipboard. I guess there's always room for a few laughs. How many in your group? One hundred and fifty. And we also have a float with us. Not a very large one. It measures twenty by twenty. Tell you what. You move your group to the corner of Thompson Street and 3rd Street. Get behind the Tiffany float and follow them, okay? The ant paused a moment to record the instruction in his mind. Then he turned to leave. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Crothers cried before the ant could rejoin his group. Just who did you speak to at the uh, National Academy of Sciences? I believe it was Mr. Canfield. Mr. Crothers' face lit up. Well, why didn't you say that in the first place? I'd have placed you right away. That's perfectly all right, Mr. Crothers. Listen, I don't know what you guys do, but those costumes should certainly bring the house down. There's going to be four million people watching this parade. I bet that's the biggest audience you've ever seen. It certainly is. With that, the ant strode away. Good luck!
Mr. Crothers shouted after him. Daddy, Daddy, look! Look at the big rocket! The little boy jumped up and down gleefully. It must be a whole mile long, Daddy. What kind is it? That's the Vanguard, son. An autumn breeze from the East River chilled their vantage point at 61st Street and 5th Avenue. The Vanguard? The name meant nothing to the boy. Gee, I'll bet it can fly all the way to the stars. It's the rocket that carried the first artificial satellite to space. The parade, now three hours old, continued past the reviewing stand. I want to get a better look at the Vanguard, the boy shouted. The father lifted the boy onto his shoulders. The little fellow laughed and whooped it up, firing several shots from his Captain Video ray gun at the passing missile. The rocket moved on and the noise of the crowd diminished slightly. A 100-piece brass band was passing in front of them. They were playing The Stars and Stripes Forever. They were followed by the Saks Fifth Avenue display. Nine small floats, each depicting life on another planet. The National Academy of Sciences had a success on its hands. Wow! Daddy, I want to ride on it. I want to ride on that float and visit all the planets. Can I, Daddy? The boy became all limbs, trying to squirm down from his father's shoulders. You stay right where you are, young man. The father struggled to hold his balance. But I want to go to the stars. I can watch the rest of the parade from Venus or Mercury. Please, Daddy. The father grinned. Not just yet, son. But it won't be long before man will go to the stars. Who lives up there, Daddy? Oh, there isn't any life up there yet. If no one's living up there... Why does anyone want to go there? Well, maybe there'll be too many people on Earth someday, and then we'll have to find another planet with more room. Another monstrous brass band was going by. The boy became restless. He began to toy with his ray gun, half interested in seeing if there were any sparks left in it. Why can't there be something beside so many bands in a parade? I want to see another float. The father tried to interest the boy by pointing out all the famous people who were also there. A variety of statesmen, the world's leading scientists and religious and cultural leaders. The President of the United States. The boy was interested, but not in what his elder was saying to him. He was looking downtown, his eyes squinting, trying to make out figures as far away as 56th Street. Then his mouth opened, not uttering a sound yet, just waiting to burst with joy at what was coming toward them. His father looked up at him. I wish you'd tell me what you're looking at. I'm all the way down here on the street level, remember? Daddy, they look like ants. What? Ants, Daddy, ants. A whole army of them. Ain't it exciting? What on earth are you talking about? They're doing somersaults and backflips and everything. They're coming right this way. Gee, there's hundreds of them. And they got a float behind them, Daddy. A great big float with something burning on it. The child sitting on his shoulders made mobility impossible for the father. And he couldn't see around the spectators. He resigned himself to stand and wait for this new spectacle to overtake them. The reaction to this new sight had already begun to work its way uptown. In the distance, but getting closer every second, he could hear unrestrained laughter and rejoicing. Hey, take it easy! The boy was beginning to ride the shoulders like a bronco buster. By the time they get here, I won't have any shoulders left. Where are they now? They're almost here, Daddy. And they aren't ants at all. They're just a bunch of clowns dressed up like it. He began to giggle hysterically. Golly, they're funny. Can you see them yet, Daddy? Before the father could produce an answer, the ants were in view. They were a sight that couldn't fail to stimulate the funny bone. By comparison with real ants, 
everything about them had been grossly exaggerated to achieve the proper effect. They walked on their two back legs, but the four front apertures were far from idle. Some of them turned somersaults, others did complicated flips, consisting of two or three spins in mid-air. Still others, doing a kind of animated cakewalk, carried toy ray guns, which they fired at random into the crowd. The guns were something like the little boy's Captain Video ray gun, only larger. They emitted little streaks of blue sparks, which shone brightly but disappeared when contact was made with air. They were easily the hit of the parade, a three-ring circus all by themselves, as they pranced and clowned their way up Fifth Avenue, giving the spectators a wail of a show that was completely new. The guests on the reviewing stand refrained from any hilarity until they saw the float that four of the ants were pulling behind them. It was in keeping with the rest of the nonsense that they were perpetrating. The float boasted eight larger ray guns, three on each side and two in the rear, that fired the same fascinating blue sparks. Behind each gun, an ant stood on its head, wildly waving six legs in the breeze, begging to be noticed and laughed at. Above the guns, emblazoned in fiery orange letters, were the words, Martian VFW. This was interpreted by one and all as a punchline, and was treated accordingly. It was heartwarming to be able to see the President and so many other dignitaries abandon composure in favor of a good old-fashioned belly laugh. Daddy, I, I can't laugh anymore. The boy had to pause between every other word. My stomach hurts. Aren't they the funniest thing you ever saw? The father was too convulsed to be able to answer him. Daddy, one of them is coming this way. He's firing his Captain Video Ray gun at us. The boy squeezed his father and held on tight. The father took a deep breath in order to be able to speak. Take your gun and fire back at him, son. Fire away. Go on, he's just being playful. He broke forth with another gust of laughter. I won't see anything as funny as this again if I live to be a hundred. The ant pranced over to where they were standing, firing its gun in every direction. The boy fired back. The ant took one look at the lad's gun and let out a long cackling sound which built to a crescendo and then stopped as though it had been turned off. The ant rejoined the group and they continued on their merry way. The boy fired several shots into the float as it passed. He wanted to see if he could knock out the blazing orange letters, Martian VFW. The letters continued to burn, but in the boy's mind, he was certain he had made several direct hits. The boy and his father watched the float until it was out of sight. They knew there wouldn't be another attraction like those ants. They must have been real professionals, the father thought. Such teamwork, such precision. Each one of them having a specific job to do, and each doing it to perfection. After them, everything was bound to be anticlimactic. More marchers, more bands, a few more floats. The boy was beginning to tire. It had been a long day. Now everything was dull. Daddy, I don't want to see any more. Let's go home. We'll stay another five minutes. The parade somehow seemed to be slowing down. The father yawned and let his son down from his shoulders. He looked across the street at the president and the other dignitaries on the reviewing stand. All were slowly raising their hands in salute as another color guard drowsily made its way by. Soon, the last group in the parade was passing the review stand, another brass band. They were moving with the speed of a glacier. A full five seconds elapsed between each note of music. Everything was happening in slow motion. On the reviewing stand, the dignified hands went up agonizingly slow to a final salute, and they stayed there. 
the greatest minds in the world stood motionless, unalterably still. Just as each wave of pandemonium had unfurled itself up Fifth Avenue during the parade, so now did silence take command. The little boy tugged at his father's coat. Daddy, Daddy, he pleaded. Why has the parade stopped? I want to go home. His words came more slowly with each passing second, like a high-speed phonograph playing at 33 and a third RPM. Daddy, why don't you answer me, Daddy? Why don't... His father never heard him. Fifty miles across the Atlantic, the fleet of spaceships hung suspended like lanterns. In the lead ship, the ant in charge of communications reported to the commander. We've just received the first communique from the advance guard, sir. Read it to me. The communications chief read from a large, perforated paper. Time, 0600. Mission accomplished. Manhattan Island cut down the middle. Immediate result of supersonic rays. Four million dead. Rays spreading east and west. Estimated time of rays full effect? 0800. Island will then be neutralized. Awaiting further orders. The ant folded the paper and looked up at the commander. Shall I relay further orders, sir? No. The commander of the ants paused and stroked his chin. We're moving in. The End Martian VFW by G. L. Vandenberg Recorded by Franklin Paul New York The Most Sentimental Man by Evelyn E. Smith this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Sexton. The Most Sentimental Man by Evelyn E. Smith. Johnson went to see the others off at Idlewild. He knew they'd expect him to, and, since it would be the last conventional gesture he'd have to make, he might as well conform to their notions of what was right improper. For the past few centuries the climate had been getting hotter. Now, even though it was not yet June, the day was uncomfortably warm. The sun's rays glinting off the bright metal flanks of the ship dazzled his eyes, and perspiration made his shirt stick to his shoulder blades beneath the jacket that the formality of the occasion had required. He wished Clifford would hurry up and get the leave-taking over with. But, even though Clifford was undoubtedly even more anxious than he to finish with all this ceremony and take off, he wasn't the kind of man to let inclination to influence his actions. Sure you won't change your mind and come with us? Johnson shook his head. The young man looked at him, hatred for the older man's complication of what should have been a simple departure showing through the pellicle of politeness. He was young for, since this trip had only slight historical importance and none of any other kind, the authorities had felt a junior officer entirely sufficient. It was clear, however, that Clifford attributed his commandership to his merits, and he was very conscious of his great responsibility. "'We have plenty of room on the ship,' he persisted. "'There weren't many left to go. We could take you easily enough, you know.' Johnson made a negative sign again. The rays of the sun beating full upon his head made apparent the gray that usually blended into the still thick, blonde hair. Yet— Though past youth, he was far from being an old man. I've made my decision, he said, remembering that anger now was pointless. If it's... If you're just too proud to change your mind, the young commander said, less certainly. I'm sure everyone will understand if... If... Johnson smiled. No, it's just that I want to stay. That's all. But the commander's clear blue eyes were still baffled, uneasy, as though he felt he had not done the utmost that duty. Not duty to the service, but to humanity, required. That was the trouble with people, Johnson thought. 
When they were most well-meaning, they became most troublesome. Clifford lowered his voice to an appropriately funeral hush, as a fresh thought obviously struck him. I know, of course, that your loved ones are buried here, and perhaps you feel it's your duty to stay with them? At this, Johnson almost forgot that anger no longer had any validity. By loved ones, Clifford undoubtedly had met Eleanor and Paul. It was true that Johnson had had a certain affection for his wife and son when they were alive. Now that they were dead, they represented an episode in his life that had not, perhaps, been unpleasant, but was certainly over and done with now. Did Clifford think that was his reason for remaining? Why, he must believe Johnson to be the most sentimental man on earth. And come to think of it, Johnson said to himself, amused, I am, or soon will be, just that. The commander was still unconsciously pursuing the same train of thought. It does seem incredible, he said in a burst of boyish candor that did not become him, for he was not that young that you'd want to stay alone on a whole planet, I mean to say, entirely alone. There'll never be another ship, you know, at least not in your lifetime. Johnson knew what the other man was thinking. If there'd been a woman with Johnson now, Clifford might have been able to understand a little better how the other could stick by his decision. Johnson wriggled, as sweat oozed stickily down his back. For God's sake, he said silently, Take your silly ship and get the hell off my planet. Aloud, he said. It's a good planet. A little worn out, but still in pretty good shape. Pity you can't trade in an old world like an old car, isn't it? If it weren't so damned far from the center of things, the young man replied, defensively assuming the burden of all civilization, we wouldn't abandon it. After all, we hate leaving the world on which we originated. But it's a long haul to Alpha Centauri. You know that and the tremendously expensive one. Keeping up this place solely out of sentiment would be a sheer waste. The people would never stand for the tax burden. A costly museum, yes, Johnson agreed. How much longer were these dismal farewells going to continue? How much longer would the young man still feel the need to justify himself? If only there were others full enough. If only there were others with you. But... Even if anybody else would be willing to cut himself off entirely from the rest of the civilized universe, the Earth won't support enough of a population to keep it running. Not according to our present living standards, anyway. Most of its resources are gone now, you know. Hardly any coal or oil left. And that's not worth digging for when there are better and cheaper fuels in the system. He was virtually quoting from the Colonial Officer's Manual. Were there any people left able to think for themselves? Johnson wondered. Had there ever been? Had he thought for himself in making his decision, or was he merely clinging to a childish dream that all men had had and lost? With man gone, earth will replenish herself, he said aloud. First, the vegetation would begin to grow thick. Already it had released itself from the restraint of civilization. Soon it would be spreading out over the continent, overrunning the cities with delicately persistent green tendrils. Some the harsh winters would kill, but others would live on and would multiply. Vines would twist themselves about the tall buildings and tenderly, passionately squeeze them to death, eventually sending them tumbling down. And then the trees would rear themselves in their places. The swamps that man had filled in would begin to reappear one by one, as the land sank back to a pristine state. The sea would go on changing her boundaries, with no dikes to stop her. Volcanoes would heave up the land into different configurations. The heat would increase until it grew unbearable. Only there would be no one, no human anyway, to bear it. Year after year the leaves would wither and fall and decay. Rock would cover them, and some day, billions of years thence, there would be coal and oil, and nobody to want them. Very likely Earth will replenish herself, the commander agreed. But not in your time, or your children's time. That is, not in my children's time, he added hastily. The handful of men lined up in a row before the airlock shuffled their feet and allowed their muttering to become a few decibels louder. Clifford looked at his wrist chronometer. Obviously he was no less anxious than the crew to be off, but for the sake of his conscience he must make a last try. Damn your conscience, Johnson thought. I hope that for this you feel guilty as hell. 
that you wake up nights in a cold sweat remembering that you left one man alone on the planet you and your kind discarded. Not that I don't want to stay, mind you, but that I want you to suffer the way you're making me suffer now, having to listen to your platitudes. The commander suddenly stopped paraphrasing the manual. Capping out's fun for a week or two, you know, but it's different when it's for a lifetime. Johnson's fingers curled in his palms. He was even angrier now that the commander had struck so close to home. Camping out. Was that all he was doing? Fulfilling childhood desires? Nothing more? Fortunately, Clifford didn't realize that he had scored, and scuttled back to the shelter of the manual. Perhaps you don't know enough about the new system in Alpha Centauri, he said, a trifle wildly. It has two suns, surrounded by three planets, Thalia, Aglaia, and Euphrosine. Each of these planets is slightly smaller than Earth, so that the decrease in gravity is just great enough to be pleasant, without being so marked as to be inconvenient. The atmosphere is almost exactly like that of Earth, except that it contains several beneficial elements which are absent here, and the climate is more temperate. Owing to the fact that the planets are partially shielded from the suns by cloud layers, the temperature, except immediately at the poles and the equators, where it is slightly more extreme, is always equable, resembling that of Southern California. Sounds charming, said Johnson. I, too, have read the Colonial Office handouts. I wonder what the people who wrote them will do now that there's no longer any necessity for attracting colonists. Everybody's already up in Alpha Centauri. Oh, well, there will be other systems to conquer and colonize. The word conquer is hardly correct, the commander said stiffly, since not one of the three planets had any indigenous life forms that was intelligent. Or life forms that you recognize as intelligent, Johnson suggested gently. Although why should there be such a premium place on intelligence, he wondered. Was intelligence the sole criterion on which the right to life and to freedom should be based? The commander frowned and looked at his chronometer again. Well, he finally said, since you feel that way and you're sure you've quite made up your mind, my men are anxious to go. Of course they are, Johnson said, managing to convey just the right amount of reproach. Clifford flushed and started to walk away. I'll stand out of the way of your jets, Johnson called after him. It would be so anticlimactic to have me burnt to a crisp after all this. Bon voyage. There was no reply. Johnson watched the silver vessel shoot up into the sky and thought, Now is the time for me to feel a pang, or even a twinge, but I don't at all. I feel relieved, in fact. But that's probably the result of getting rid of that fool Clifford. He crossed the field briskly, pulling off his jacket and discarding his tie as he went. His ground car remained where he had parked it, in an area clearly marked no parking. They'd left him an old car that wasn't worth shipping to the stars. How long it would last was anybody's guess. The government hadn't been deliberately illiberal in leaving him such a shabby vehicle. If there had been any way to ensure a continuing supply of fuel, they would probably have left him a reasonably good one. But, since only a little could be left, allowing him a good car would have been simply an example of conspicuous waste and the government had always preferred its waste to be inconspicuous. He drove slowly through the broad boulevards of Long Island, savoring the loneliness. New York as a residential area had been a ghost town for years, since the greater part of its citizens had been among the first to emigrate to the stars. However, since it was the capital of the world, and most of the interstellar ships, particularly the last few, had taken off from its spaceports, it had been kept up as an official embarkation center, Thus, paradoxically, it was the last city to be completely evacuated. And so, although the massive but jerry-built apartment houses that lined the streets were already crumbling, the roads had been kept in fairly good shape and were hardly cracked at all. Still, here and there the green was pushing its way up in unlikely places. A few more of New York's tropical summers, and Long Island would soon become a wilderness. The streets were empty except for the cats sunning themselves on long abandoned doorsteps, or padding about on obscure errands of their own. Perhaps their numbers had not increased since humanity had left the city to them, but there certainly seemed to be more, striped and solid, black and gray, and white and tawny, accepting their citizenship with equanimity. They paid no attention to Johnson. They had long since disassociated themselves from a humanity that had not concerned itself greatly over their welfare. On the other hand, neither he nor the surface car appeared to startle them. The old ones had seen such before, and to kittens, the very fact of existence is the ultimate surprise. The Queensboro Bridge was deadly silent. 
It was completely empty except for a calico cat moving purposefully toward Manhattan. The structure needed a coat of paint, Johnson thought vaguely, but of course it would never get one. Still, even uncared for, the bridges should outlast him. There would be no heavy traffic to weaken them. Just in case of unforeseeable catastrophe, however, he didn't want to be trapped on an island, even Manhattan Island. He had remembered to provide himself with a rowboat. A motorboat would have been preferable, but then the fuel difficulty would arise again. How empty the East River looked without any craft on it. It was rather a charming little waterway in its own right, though nothing to compare with the stately Hudson. The water scintillated in the sunshine, and the air was clear and fresh, for no factories had spewed fumes and smoke into it for many years. There were few gulls, for nothing was left for the scavenger. Those remaining were forced to make an honest living by catching fish. In Manhattan, where the buildings had been soundly constructed, the signs of abandonment were less evident. Empty streets, an occasional cracked window, not even an unusual amount of dirt, because, in the past, the normal activities of an industrial and ruggedly individual city had provided more grime than years of neglect could ever hope to equal. No, it would take Manhattan longer to go back than Long Island. Perhaps that, too, would not happen during his lifetime. Yet, after all, when he reached Fifth Avenue, he found that Central Park had burst its boundaries. Fifty-ninth Street was already half jungle, and a lush growth spilled down the avenues and spread raggedly out into the side streets, pushing its way up through the cracks it had made in the surface of the road. Although the plaza fountain had not flowed for centuries, water had collected in the leaf-choked basin from the last rain, and a group of gray squirrels were gathered around it, shrilly disputing possession with some starlings. Except for the occasional cry of a cat in the distance, these voices were all that he heard, the only sound. Not even the sudden blast of a jet regaining power. He would never hear that again. Never hear the strider of a human voice piercing with anger. The cacophony of a hundred television sets, each playing a different program. The hoot of a horn. Off-key singing. The thin, uncertain notes of an amateur musician. These would never be heard on earth again. He sent the car gliding slowly. No more traffic rules. Down Fifth Avenue. The buildings here also were well built. They were many centuries old and would probably last as many more. The shop windows were empty except for tangles of dust, an occasional broken, discarded mannequin. In some instances the glass had already cracked or fallen out. Since there were no children to throw stones, however, others might last indefinitely, carefully glassing in nothingness. Doors stood open and he could see rows of empty counters and barren shells fuzzed high with the dust of the years since a customer had approached them. Cats sedately walked up and down the avenue, or sat genteelly with tails tucked in on the steps of the cathedral, as if the place had been theirs all along. Dusk was falling. Tonight, for the first time in centuries, the street lamps would not go on. Undoubtedly, when it grew dark, he would see ghosts, but they would be the ghosts of the past, and he had made his peace with the past long since. It was the present and the future with which he had not come to terms, and now there would be no present, no past no future, but all merged into one, and he was the only one. At 42nd Street, pigeons fluttered thickly around the public library, fat as ever, their numbers greater, their appetites grosser. The ancient library, he knew, had changed little inside. Stacks and shelves would still be packed thick with reading matter. Books are bulky, so only the rare editions had been taken beyond the stars. The rest had been microfilmed, and their originals left to Johnson and Decay. It was his library now, and he had all the time in the world to read all the books in the world, for there were more than he could possibly read in the years that, even at the most generous estimate, were left to him. He had been wondering where to make his permanent residence, for, with the whole world his, he would be a fool to confine himself to some modest dwelling. Now he fancied it might be a good idea to move right into the library. He stopped the car to stare thoughtfully at the little park behind the grimy monument, to neoclassism. Like Central Park, Bryant had already slipped its boundaries and encroached upon Sixth Avenue. Avenue of the World, the street sign said now, and before it had been Avenue of the Nations and Avenue of the Americas. But to the public it had always been Sixth Avenue, and to Johnson, the last man on earth, it was Sixth Avenue. He'd lived in the library, well, he stayed in New York, that was. He'd thought that in a few weeks, when it got really hot, he might strike north. He had always meant to spend a summer in Canada. 
His service car would probably never last a trip, but the Museum of Ancient Vehicles had been glad to bestow half a dozen of the bicycles from their exhibits upon him. After all, he was, in effect, a museum piece himself, and so as worth preserving as the bicycles. Moreover, bicycles are difficult to pack for an interstellar trip. With reasonable care, these might last him his lifetime. But he had to have a permanent residence somewhere, and the library was an elegant and commodious dwelling, centrally located. New York would have to be his headquarters, for all the possessions he had carefully amassed and collected and begged and, since money would do him no good any more, bought, were here. And there were by far too many of them to be transported to any really distant location. He loved to own things. He was by no means an advocate of Rousseau's complete return to nature. Whatever civilization had left that he could use without compromise he would, and thankfully. There would be no electricity, of course, but he had provided himself with flashlights and bulbs and batteries. Not too many of the last, of course, because they'd grow stale. However, he'd also laid in plenty of candles and a vast supply of matches. Tins of food and concentrates and synthetics. Packages of seed, should he grow tired of all these and want to try growing his own. Fruit, he knew, would be growing wild soon enough. Vitamins and medicines, of course, were he to be really ill or get hurt in some way, it might be the end. But that was something he wouldn't think of. Something that couldn't possibly happen to him. For his relaxation, he had an antique hand-wound phonograph, together with thousands of old-fashioned records. And then, of course, he had the whole planet, the whole world to amuse him. He even had provided himself with a heat-ray gun and a substantial supply of ammunition, although he couldn't imagine himself ever killing an animal for food. It was squeamishness that stood in his way rather than any ethical considerations, although he did indeed believe that every creature had the right to live. Nonetheless, there was the possibility that the craving for fresh meat might change his mind for him. Besides, although hostile animals had long been gone from this part of the world, the only animals would be birds and squirrels, and farther up the Hudson, rabbits and chipmunks and deer, perhaps an occasional bear in the mountains. Who knew what harmless life form might become a threat now that its development would be left unchecked? A cat, sitting atop one of the stately stone lions outside in the library, met his eye with such a steady gaze of understanding, though not of sympathy, that he found himself needing to repeat the by now almost magic phrase to himself, not in my lifetime anyway. Would some intelligent life form develop to supplant man, or would the planet revert to a primeval state of mindless innocence? He would never know, and he didn't really care, no point in speculating over unanswerable questions. He settled back luxuriously on the worn cushions of his car. Even so little as twenty years before, it would have been impossible for him, for anyone, to stop his vehicle in the middle of 42nd Street and 5th Avenue, purely to meditate. But it was his domain now. He could go in the wrong direction on one-way streets, stop wherever he pleased, drive as fast or as slowly as he would, and could, of course. If he wanted to do anything as vulgar as spit in the street, he could but they were his streets now, not to be sullied. Cross the roads without waiting for the lights to change. It would be a long, long wait if he did. Go to sleep where he wanted, eat as many meals as he wanted whenever he chose. He could go naked in hot weather, and there'd be no one to raise an eyebrow, deface public buildings, except that they were private buildings now, his buildings. Idle without the guilty feeling that there was always something better he could and should be doing, even if there were not. There would be no more guilty feelings. Without people and their knowledge, there was no more guilt. A flash of movement in the bushes behind the library caught his eye. Surely that couldn't be a fawn in Bryant Park. So soon? He'd thought it would be another ten years at least before the wild animals came sniffing timidly along the Hudson, venturing a little farther each time they saw no sign of their age-old enemy. But probably the deer was only his imagination. He would investigate further after he had moved into the library. Perhaps a higher building than the library. But then he would have to climb too many flights of stairs. The elevators wouldn't be working. Silly of him to forget that. There were a lot of steps outside the library, too. It would be a chore to get his bicycles up those steps. Then he smiled to himself. Robinson Crusoe would have been glad to have had bicycles and steps, and such relatively harmless animals as bears to worry about. 
No, Robinson Crusoe never had it so good as he, Johnston, would have. And what more could he want? For, whoever before in history had had his dreams, and what was wrong with dreams, after all, so completely gratified? What child, envisioning a desert island all his own, could imagine that his island would be the whole world? Together Johnson and the earth would grow young again. No, the stars were for others. Johnson was not the first man in history who had wanted the earth, but he had been the first man, and probably the last, who had actually been given it. And he was well content with his bargain. There was plenty of room for the bears, too. End of the Most Sentimental Man by Evelyn E. Smith No Pets Allowed by M. A. Cummings This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times No Pets Allowed by M. A. Cummings M. A. Monette to her friends, Cummings, returns with another hauntingly persuasive tale of a tomorrow that may not be as gleaming as we hope. Her recent story, The Weirdies, apparently delighted some and startled others, and this in Los Angeles. What's happening there? He didn't know how he could have stood the four months there alone. She was company, and one could talk to her. I can't tell anyone about it. In the first place, they'd never believe me. And if they did, I'd probably be punished for having her, because we aren't allowed to have pets of any kind. It wouldn't have happened if they hadn't sent me way out there to work. But, you see, there are so many things I can't do. I remember the day the chief of vocation took me before the council. I've tried him on a dozen things, he reported. People always talk about me as if I can't understand what they mean, but I'm really not that dumb. There doesn't seem to be a thing he can do, the chief went on. Actually, his intelligence seems to be no greater than that which we believe our ancestors had back in the twentieth century. As bad as that, observed one of the council members, you do have a problem. But we must find something for him to do, said another. We can't have an idle person in the state. It's unthinkable. But what, asked the chief, he's utterly incapable of running any of the machines. I've tried to teach him. The only things he can do are already being done much better by robots. There was a long silence, broken at last by one little old council member. I have it, he cried. The very thing will make him guard of the treasure. But there's no need of a guard. No one will touch the treasure without permission. We haven't had a dishonest person in the state for more than three thousand years. That's it exactly. There aren't any dishonest people, so there won't be anything for him to do. But we will have solved the problem of his idleness. It might be a solution, said the chief, at least a temporary one. I suppose we will have to find something else later on, but this will give us time to look for something. So I became guard of the treasure, with a badge and nothing to do, unless you count watching the key. The gates were kept locked, just as they were in the old days but the large key hung beside them. Of course, no one wanted to bother carrying it around. It was too heavy. The only ones who ever used it, anyway, were members of the council. As the man said, we haven't had a dishonest person in the state for thousands of years. Even I know that much. Of course, this left me with lots of time on my hands. That's how I happened to get her in the first place. I'd always wanted one, but pets were forbidden. Busy people didn't have time for them, so I knew I was breaking the law, but I figured that no one would ever find out. First I fixed a place for her, and made a brush screen, so that she couldn't be seen by anyone coming to the gates. Then one night I sneaked into the forest and got her. It wasn't so lonely after that. Now I had something to talk to. She was small when I got her. It would be too dangerous to go near a full-grown one. But she grew rapidly. That was because I caught small animals and brought them to her. Not having to depend on what she could catch, she grew almost twice as fast as usual, and was so sleek and pretty. Really, she was a pet to be proud of. 
I don't know how I could have stood the four months there alone, if I hadn't had her to talk to. I don't think she really understood me, but I pretended she did, and that helped. Every three or four weeks, three of the council members came to take a part of the treasure, or to add to it, always three of them. That's why I was so surprised one day to see one man coming by himself. It was Grimm, the little old member, who had recommended that I be given this job. I was happy to see him, and we talked for a while, mostly about my work and how I liked it. I almost told him about my pet, but I didn't, because he might be angry at me for breaking the law. Finally, he asked me to give him the key. I've been sent to get something from the treasure, he explained. I was unhappy to displease him, but I said, I can't let you have it. There must be three members. You know that. Of course I know it, but something came up suddenly, so they sent me alone. Now let me have it. I shook my head. That was the one order they had given me, never to give the key to any one person who came along. Grimm became quite angry. You idiot! he shouted. Why do you think I had to put out here? It was so I could get in there and help myself to the treasure. But that would be dishonest, and there are no dishonest people in the state. For three thousand years, I know. His usually kind face had an ugly look I had never seen before. But I'm going to get part of that treasure, and it won't do you any good to report it, because no one is going to take the word of a fool like you. Against a respected council member, they'll think you are the dishonest one. Now, give me that key. It's a terrible thing to disobey a council member, but if I obeyed him, I would be disobeying all the others, and that would be worse. No, I shouted. He threw himself upon me. For his size and age, he was very strong, stronger even than I. I fought as hard as I could. But I knew I wouldn't be able to keep him away from the key for very long, and if he took the treasure, I would be blamed. The council would have to think a new punishment for dishonesty. Whatever it was, it would be terrible indeed. He drew back and rushed at me. Just as he hit me, my foot cut upon a root and I fell. His rush carried him past me, and he crashed through the brush screen beside the path. I heard him scream twice. Then there was silence. I was bruised all over, but I managed to pull myself up and take away what was left of the screen. There was no sign of Grim, but my beautiful pet was waving her pearl green feelers as she always did in thanks for a good meal. That's why I can't tell anyone what happened. No one would believe that Grim would be dishonest, and I can't prove it because she ate the proof. Even if I did tell them. No one is going to believe that a flycatcher plant, even a big one like mine, would actually be able to eat a man. So they think that Grim disappeared, and I'm still out here with her. She's grown so much larger now and more beautiful than ever. But I hope she hasn't developed a taste for human flesh. Lately, when she stretches out her feelers, it seems that she's trying to reach me. End of No Pets Allowed by M. A. Cummings. One out of ten by J. Anthony Furlane. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie Carter. One out of ten by J. Anthony Furlane. Television quiz programs with an aspect of having just staged a raid on Fort Knox are very much in the news these days. Certainly, the prizes to be won are astronomical, and the contestants scarcely less so. Step right up, little lady, and tell us why your eyes look so strange. What's that? You want us to read this astounding science fantasy documentary by J. Anthony Furlane first? Well, perhaps we should play it safe, while the flying saucer folk are watching us. 
I watched Don Phillips, the commercial announcer, out of the corner of my eye. The camera in front of me swung around and lined up on my set. And now, on with the show, Phillips was saying. And here, ready to test your wits, is your quizzing quiz master, smiling Jim Parsons. I smiled into the camera and waited while the audience applauded. The camera tally light went on and the stage manager brought his arm down and pointed at me. Good afternoon, I said into the camera. Here we go again with another half hour of fun and prizes on television's newest, most exciting game, Parlor Quiz. In a moment, I'll introduce you to our first contestant. But first, here is a special message to you mothers. The baby powder commercial appeared on the monitor, and I walked over to the next set. They had the first contestant lined up for me. I smiled and took her card from the floor man. She was a middle-aged woman with a faded print dress and old-style shoes. I never saw the contestants until we were on the air. They were screened before the show by the staff. They usually tried to pick contestants who would make good show material, an odd name or occupation or somebody with twenty kids, something of that nature. I looked at the card for the tip-off. Mrs. Frida Dunny, the card said. Ask her where she comes from. I smiled at the contestant again and took her by the hand. The tally light went on again and I grinned into the camera. Well, now we're all set to go, and our first contestant today is this charming little lady right here beside me, Mrs. Frida Dunny. I looked at the card. How are you, Mrs. Dunny? Fine, just fine. All set to answer a lot of questions and win a lot of prizes? Oh, I'll win all right, said Mrs. Dunny, smiling around at the audience. The audience tittered a bit at the remark. I looked at the card again. Where are you from, Mrs. Dunny? Mars said Mrs. Dunny. Mars, I laughed, anticipating the answer. Mars, Montana? Mars, Peru? No, Mars, up there, she said, pointing in the air. The planet Mars, the fourth planet out from the sun. My assistant looked unhappy. I smiled again, wondering what the gag was. I decided to play along. Well, well, I said. All the way from Mars, eh? And how long have you been on Earth, Mrs. Dunny? Oh, about thirty or forty years. I've been here nearly all my life. Came here when I was a wee bit of a girl. Well, I said, you're practically an Earth woman by now, aren't you? The audience laughed. Do you plan on going back some day, or have you made your mind up to stay here on Earth for the rest of your days? Oh, I'm just here for the invasion, said Mrs. Dunny. When that's over, I'll probably go back home again. The invasion? Yes, the invasion of Earth. As soon as enough of us are here, we'll get started. You mean there are others here, too? Oh, yes, there are several million of us here in the United States already, and more are on the way. There are only about a 170 million people in the United States, Mrs. Dunny, I said. If there are several million Martians among us, one out of every hundred would have to be a Martian. One out of every ten, said Mrs. Dunny. That's what the boss said just the other day. We're getting pretty close to the number we need to take over Earth. What do you need? I asked. One to one? One Martian for every Earthman? Oh, no, said Mrs. Dunny. One Martian is worth ten Earthmen. The only reason we're waiting is we don't want any trouble. You don't look any different from us Earth people, Mrs. Dunny. How does one tell the difference between a Martian and an Earthman when one sees one? Oh, we don't look any different, said Mrs. Dunny. Some of the kids don't even know they're Martians. Most mothers don't tell their children until they're grown up. And there are other children who are never told because they just don't develop their full powers. What powers? Oh, telepathy, thought control, that sort of thing. You mean that Martians can read people's thoughts? Sure, it's no trouble at all. It's very easy, really, once you get the hang of it. Can you read my mind? I asked, smiling. Sure, said Mrs. Dunny, smiling up at me. That's why I said that I'd know the answers. I'll be able to read the answers from your mind when you look at that sheet of paper. Now that's hardly sporting, is it, Mrs. Dunny? I said, turning to the camera. The audience laughed. Everybody else has to do it the hard way, and here you are reading it from my mind. All's fair in love and war, said Mrs. Dunny. Tell me, Mrs. Dunny, why are you telling me about all this? Isn't it supposed to be a secret? 
I have my reasons, said Mrs. Dunny. Nobody believes me anyhow. Oh, I believe you, Mrs. Dunny, I said gravely. And now, let's see how you do on the questions. Are you ready? She nodded. Name the one and only mammal that has the ability to fly, I asked, reading from the script. A bat, she said. Right. Did you read that from my mind? Oh, yes, you're coming over very clear, said Mrs. Dunny. Try this one, I said. A princess is any daughter of a sovereign. What is a princess royale? The eldest daughter of a sovereign, she said. Correct. How about this one? Is a Kodiak a kind of simple box camera, a type of double-bowed boat, or a kind of Alaskan bear? A bear, said Mrs. Dunny. Very good, I said. That was a hard one. I asked her seven more questions, and she got them all right. None of the other contestants even came close to her score, so I wound up giving her the gas range and a lot of other smaller prizes. After we were off the air, I followed the audience out into the hall. Mrs. Dunny was walking toward the lobby with an old paper shopping bag under her arm. An attendant was following her with an armful of prizes. I caught up with her before she reached the door. Mrs. Dunny, I said, and she turned around. I want to talk to you. When do I get the gas stove? she said. Your local dealer will send it to you in a few days. Did you give them your address? Yes, I gave it to them. My Philadelphia address, that is. I don't even remember my address at home anymore. Come now, Mrs. Dunny, you don't have to keep up that Mars business now that we're off the air. It's the truth, and I didn't come here just by accident, said Mrs. Dunny, looking over her shoulder toward the attendant, who was still holding the prizes. I came here to see you. Me? Mrs. Dunny set the paper bag down on the floor and dug down into her pocketbook. She took out a dog-eared piece of white paper and bent it up in her hand. Yes, she said finally. I came to see you, and you didn't follow me out here because you wanted to. I commanded you to come. Commanded me to come? I spluttered. What for? To prove something to you. Do you see this piece of paper? She held out the paper in her hand with the blank side toward me. My address is on this paper. I am reading the address. Concentrate on what I'm reading. I looked at her. I concentrated. Suddenly, I knew. 251 South 8th Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I said aloud. You see, it's very easy once you get the hang of it, she said. I nodded and smiled down at her. Now I understood. I picked up her bag and put my hand on her shoulder. Let's go, I said. We have a lot to talk about. End of One Out of Ten by J. Anthony Furlane Postmark Ganymede by Robert Silverberg. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darcy Smitenar. Postmark Ganymede by Robert Silverberg. Consider the poor mailman of the future. To sleet and snow and dead of night, things that must not keep him from his appointed rounds, will be added. Sub-zero void, meteors, and planets that won't stay put. Maybe he'll decide that for six cents an ounce it just ain't worth it. I'm washed up, Preston growled bitterly. They made a postman out of me. Me, a postman. He crumpled the assignment memo into a small, hard ball and hurled it at the bristly image of himself in the bar mirror. He hadn't shaved in three days which was how long it had been since he had been notified of his removal from Space Patrol Service and his transfer to postal delivery. Suddenly, Preston felt a hand on his shoulder. He looked up and saw a man in the trim gray of a patrolman's uniform. What do you want, Dawes? Chief's been looking for you, Preston. It's time for you to get going on your run. Preston scowled. Time to go deliver the mail, eh? He spat. 
Don't they have anything better to do with good spacemen than make letter carriers out of them? The other man shook his head. You won't get anywhere grousing about it, Preston. Your papers don't specify which branch you're assigned to, and if they want to make you carry the mail, that's it. His voice became suddenly gentle. Come on, Prez. One last drink and then let's go. You don't want to spoil a good record, do you? No, Preston said reflectively. He gulped his drink and stood up. Okay, I'm ready. Neither snow nor rain shall stay me from my appointed rounds, or however the damn thing goes. That's a smart attitude, Preston. Come on, I'll walk you over to administration. Savagely, Preston ripped away the hand that the other had put around his shoulders. I can get there myself. At least give me credit for that. Okay, Dodge said, shrugging. Well, good luck, Preston. Yeah, thanks. Thanks real lots. He pushed his way past the man in space grays and shouldered past a couple of barflies as he left. He pushed open the door of the bar and stood outside for a moment. It was near midnight, and the sky over Nome spaceport was bright with stars. Preston's trained eye picked out Mars, Jupiter, Uranus. There they were, waiting. But he would spend the rest of his days ferrying letters on the Ganymede run. He sucked in the cold night air of summertime Alaska and squared his shoulders. Two hours later, Preston sat at the controls of a one-man patrol ship, just as he had in the old days. Only the control panel was bare where the firing studs for the heavy guns was found in regular patrol ships. And in the cargo hold instead of crates with spare ammo, there were three bulging sacks of mail destined for the colony on Ganymede. Slight difference, Preston thought as he set up his blasting pattern. Okay, Preston, came the voice from the tower. You've got clearance. Cheers, Preston said, and yanked the blast lever. The ship jolted upward, and for a second he felt a little of the old thrill, until he remembered. He took the ship out in space, saw the blackness in the viewplate. The radio crackled. Come in, postal ship. Come in, postal ship. I'm in. What do you want? We're your convoy, a hard voice said. Patrol ship 08756, Lieutenant Mellor is above you. Down at three o'clock, patrol ship 10732, Lieutenant Gunderson. We'll take you through the pirate belt. Preston felt his face go hot with shame. Mellor's. Gunderson. They would stick two of his old sidekicks on the job of guarding him. Please acknowledge, Melor said. Preston paused. Then, Postal Ship 1872, Lieutenant Preston aboard. I acknowledge message. There was a stunned silence. Preston? Hal Preston? The one and only, Preston said. What are you doing on a postal ship, Melors asked. Why don't you ask the chief that? He's the one who yanked me out of the patrol and put me here. Can you beat that? Gunderson asked incredulously. Hal Preston, on a postal ship. Yeah, incredible, isn't it? Preston asked bitterly. You can't believe your ears. Well, you better believe it, because here I am. Must be some clerical error, Gunderson said. Let's change the subject, Preston snapped. They were silent for a few moments, as the three ships... Two armed, one loaded with mail for Ganymede, streaked outward away from Earth. Manipulating his controls with the ease of long experience, Preston guided the ship smoothly toward the gleaming bulk of far-off Jupiter. Even at this distance, he could see five or six bright pips surrounding the huge planet. There was Callisto, and, ah, there was Ganymede. He made computations, checked his controls, figured orbits. Anything to keep from having to talk to his two ex-patrol mates or from having to think about the humiliating job he was on. Anything to... Pirates, moving up at two o'clock. Preston came awake. He picked off the location of the pirate ships. There were two of them. Coming up out of the asteroid belt. Small, deadly, compact, they orbited toward him. He pounded the instrument panel in impotent rage, looking for the guns that weren't there. Don't worry, Prez, came Meller's voice. We'll take care of them for you. Thanks, Preston said bitterly. He watched as the pirate ships approached, longing to trade places with the men in the patrol ships above and below him. Suddenly, a bright spear of flame lashed out across space, and the hull of Gunderson's ship glowed cherry red. I'm okay, Gunderson reported immediately. Screens took the charge. 
Preston gripped his controls and threw the ship into a plunging dive that dropped it back behind the protection of both patrol ships. He saw Gunderson and Mellors converge on one of the pirates. Two blue beams licked out, and the pirate ship exploded. But then the second pirate swooped down in an unexpected dive. Look out, Preston yelled helplessly, but it was too late. Beams ripped into the hull of Mellor's ship, and a dark fissure line opened down the side of the ship. Preston smashed his hand against the control panel. Better to die in an honest dogfight than to live this way. It was one against one now, Gunderson against the pirate. Preston dropped back again to take advantage of the patrol ship's protection. I'm going to try a diversionary tactic, Gunderson said on untappable tight beam. Get ready to cut under and streak for Ganymede with all you got. Check. Preston watched as the tactic got underway. Gunderson's ship traveled in a long, looping spiral that drew the pirate into the upper quadrant of space. His path free, Preston guided his ship under the other two and toward unobstructed freedom. As he looked back, he saw Gunderson steaming for the pirate on a shore collision orbit. He turned away. The score was two patrolmen dead, two ships wrecked, but the males would get through. Shaking his head, Preston leaned forward over his control board and headed on toward Ganymede. The blue-white, frozen moon hung beneath him. Preston snapped on the radio. Ganymede Colony, come in, please. This is your postal ship. The words tasted sour in his mouth. There was silence for a second. Come in, Ganymede, Preston repeated impatiently, and then the sound of a distress signal cut across his audio pickup. It was coming on wide beam from the satellite below and they had cut out all receiving facilities in an attempt to step up their transmitter. Preston reached for the wide beam stud and pressed it. Okay, I pick up your signal, Ganymede. Come in now. This is Ganymede, a tense voice said. We've got trouble down here. Who are you? Mail ship, Preston said, from Earth. What's going on? There was a sound of voices whispering somewhere near the microphone. Finally, hello, mail ship? Yeah? You're going to have to turn back to Earth, fellow. You can't land here. It's rough on us, missing a mail trip, but... Preston said impatiently, Why can't I land? What the devil's going on down there? We've been invaded, the tired voice said. The colony's been completely surrounded by ice worms. Ice worms? The local native life, the colonists explained. They're about 30 feet long, a foot wide, and mostly mouth. There's a ring of them about a 100 yards wide surrounding the dome. They can't get in, and we can't get out, and we can't figure out any possible approach for you. Pretty, Preston said. But why didn't the things bother you while you were building your dome? Apparently they have a very long hibernation cycle. We've only been here two years, you know. The ice worms must all have been asleep when we came. But they came swarming out of the ice by the hundreds last month. How come Earth doesn't know? The antenna for our long-range transmitter was outside the dome. One of the worms came by and chewed the antenna right off. All we've got left is this short-range thing we're using, and it's no good more than 10,000 miles from here. You're the first one who's been this close since it happened. I get it. Preston closed his eyes for a second, trying to think things out. The colony was under blockade by hostile alien life, thereby making it impossible for him to deliver the mail. Okay. If he'd been a regular member of the Postal Service, he'd have given it up as a bad job and gone back to Earth to report the difficulty. But I'm not going back. I'll be the best damned mailman they've got. Give me a landing orbit anyway, Ganymede. But you can't come down. How will you leave your ship? Don't worry about that, Preston said calmly. We have to worry. We don't dare open the dome with those creatures outside. You can't come down, postal ship. You want your mail or don't you? The colonist paused. Well... Okay then, Preston said. Shut up and give me landing coordinates. There was a pause, and then the figures started coming over. Preston jotted them down on a scratch pad. Okay, I've got them. Now sit tight and wait. He glanced contemptuously at the three mail pouches behind him, grinned, and started setting up the orbit. Mailman, am I? I'll show them. He brought the postal ship down with all the skill of his years in the patrol, spiraling in around the big satellite of Jupiter as cautiously and as precisely as if he were zeroing in on a pirate lair in the asteroid belt. In its own way, this was as dangerous, perhaps even more so. Preston guided the ship into an ever-narrowing orbit, which he stabilized about a 100 miles over the surface of Ganymede. As his ship swung around the moon's poles in its tight orbit, he began to figure some fuel computations. His scratch pad began to fill with notations. 
fuel storage, escape velocity, margin of error, safety factor. Finally, he looked up. He had computed exactly how much spare fuel he had, how much he could afford to waste. It was a small figure, too small, perhaps. He turned to the radio. Ganymede? Where are you, postal ship? I'm in a tight orbit about a hundred miles up, Preston said. Give me the figures on the circumference of your dome, Ganymede. Seven miles, the colonist said. What are you planning to do? Preston didn't answer. He broke contact and scribbled some more figures. Seven miles of ice worms, eh? That was too much to handle. He had planned on dropping flaming fuel on them and burning them out, but he couldn't do it that way. He'd have to try a different tactic. Down below, he could see the blue-white ammonia ice that was the frozen atmosphere of Ganymede. Shimmering gently amid the whiteness was the transparent yellow of the dome beneath whose curved walls lived the Ganymede colony. Even forewarned, Preston shuddered. Surrounding the dome was a living, writhing belt of giant worms. Lovely, he said. Just lovely. Getting up, he clambered over the mail stacks and headed toward the rear of the ship, hunting for the auxiliary fuel tanks. Working rapidly, he lugged one out and strapped it into an empty gun turret, making sure he could get it loose again when he'd need it. He wiped away sweat and checked the angle at which the fuel tank would face the ground when he came down for a landing. Satisfied, he knocked a hole in the side of the fuel tank. Okay, Ganymede, he radioed, I'm coming down. He blasted loose from the tight orbit and rocked the ship down on a manual. The forbidding surface of Ganymede grew closer and closer. Now he could see the ice worms plainly. Hideous, thick creatures lying coiled in masses around the dome. Preston checked his spacesuit, making sure it was sealed. The instruments told him he was a bare ten miles above Ganymede now. One more swing around the poles would do it. He peered out as the dome came below and once again snapped on the radio. I'm going to come down and burn a path through those worms of yours. Watch me carefully and jump to it when you see me land. I want that airlock open or else. But, no buts. He was right overhead now. Just one ordinary type gun would solve the whole problem, he thought. But postal ships didn't get guns. They weren't supposed to need them. He centered the ship as well as he could on the dome below and threw it into automatic pilot. Jumping from the control panel, he ran back toward the gun turret and slammed shut the plexolite screen. Its outer wall opened and the fuel tank went tumbling outward and down. He returned to his control panel seat and looked at the view screen. He smiled. The fuel tank was lying near the dome, right in the middle of the nest of ice worms. The fuel was leaking from the puncture. Ice worms writhed in from all sides. Now, Preston said grimly. The ship roared down, jets blasting. The fire licked out, heated the ground, melted snow, ignited the fuel tank. A gigantic flame blazed up, reflected harshly off the snows of Ganymede. And the mindless ice worms came, marching toward the fire, being consumed as still others devoured the bodies of the dead and dying. Preston looked away and concentrated on the business of finding a place to land the ship. The Holocaust still raged as he leapt down from the catwalk of the ship, clutching one of the heavy mail sacks, and struggled through the melting snows to the airlock. He grinned. The airlock was open. Arms grabbed him, pulled him through. Someone opened his helmet. Great job, postman. There are two more mail sacks, Preston said. Get men out after them. The man in charge gestured to two young colonists who donned spacesuits and dashed through the airlock. Preston watched as they raced to the ship, climbed in, and returned a few moments later with the mail sacks. You've got it all, Preston said. I'm checking out. I'll get word to the patrol to get here and clean up that mess for you. How can we thank you? The official-looking man asked. No need to, Preston said casually. I had to get that mail down here some way, didn't I? He turned away, smiling to himself. Maybe the chief had known what he was doing when he took an experienced patrolman and dumped him into postal. Delivering the mail to Ganymede had been more hazardous than fighting off half a dozen space pirates. I guess I was wrong, Preston thought. This is no snap job for old men. Preoccupied, he started out through the airlock. The man in charge caught his arm. Say, we don't even know your name. Here you are a hero and... Hero? Preston shrugged. All I did was deliver the mail. It's all in a day's work, you know. The mail's got to get through. The End End of Postmark Ganymede by Robert Silverberg Recording by Darcy Smitanar
There is a Reaper by Charles V. DeVette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ed Smithson. There is a Reaper by Charles V. DeVette. The amber brown of the liquor disguised the poison it held, and I watched with a smile on my lips as he drank it. There was no pity in my heart for him. He was a jackal in the jungle of life, and I, I was one of the carnivores. It is the lot of the jackals of life to be devoured by the carnivore. Suddenly the contented look on his face froze into a startled stillness. I knew he was feeling the first savage twinge of the agony that was to come. He turned his head and looked at me, and I saw suddenly that he knew what I had done. "'You murderer!' he cursed me, and then his body arched in the middle and his voice choked off deep in his throat. For a short minute he sat, tense, his body stiffened by the agony that rode it, unable to move a muscle. I watched the torment in his eyes build up to a crescendo of pain, until the suffering became so great that it filmed his eyes, and I knew that, though he still stared directly at me, he no longer saw me. Then, as suddenly as the spasm had come, the starch went out of his body and his back slid slowly down the chair edge. He landed heavily with his head resting limply against the seat of the chair. His right leg doubled up in a kind of jerk before he was still. I knew the time had come. "'Where are you?' I asked. This moment had cost me sixty thousand dollars. Three weeks ago, the best doctors in the state had given me a month to live, and with seven million dollars in the bank I couldn't buy a minute more. I accepted the doctor's decision philosophically, like the gambler that I am. But I had a plan, one which necessity had never forced me to use until now. Several years before, I had read an article about the medicine men of a certain tribe of aborigines living in the jungles at the source of the Amazon River. They had discovered a process in which the juice of a certain bush, known only to them, could be used to poison a man. Anyone subjected to this poison died but for a few minutes after the life left his body, the medicine men could still converse with him. The subject, though ostensibly and actually dead, answered the medicine men's every question. This was their primitive, though reportedly effective, method of catching glimpses of what lay in the world of death. I had conceived my idea at the time I read the article, but I had never had the need to use it until the doctors gave me a month to live. Then I spent my sixty thousand dollars, and three weeks later I held in my hands a small bottle of the witch doctor's fluid. The next step was to secure my victim, my collaborator, I prefer to call him. The man I chose was a nobody, a homeless, friendless non-entity picked up off the street. He had once been an educated man, but now he was only a bum, and when he died he'd never be missed perfect man for my experiment. I'm a rich man because I have a system. The system is simple. I never make a move until I know exactly where that move will lead me. My field of operations is a stock market. I spend money unstintingly to secure the information I need before I take each step. I hire the best investigators, bribe employees and persons in position to give me the information I want and only when I am as certain as humanly possible that I cannot be wrong do I move. And the system never fails. Seven million dollars in the bank is proof of that. Now, knowing that I could not live, I intended to make the system work for me one last time before I died. I'm a firm believer in the adage that any situation can be whipped, given prior knowledge of its coming, and, of course, its attendant circumstances. For a moment he did not answer, and I began to fear that my experiment had failed. "'Where are you?' I repeated, 
louder and sharper this time. The small muscles about his eyes puckered with an unnormal tension, while the rest of his face held its death frost. Slowly, slowly, unnaturally, as though energized by some hyper-rational power, his lips and tongue moved. The words he spoke were clear. I am in a, a tunnel, he said. It is lighted, dimly, but there is nothing for me to see. Blue veins showed through the flesh of his cheeks like watermarks on translucent paper. He paused, and I urged, Go on. I am alone, he said. The realities I knew no longer exist, and I am damp and cold. All about me is a sense of gloom and dejection. It is an apprehension, an emanation, so deep and real as to be almost a tangible thing. The walls to either side of me seem to be formed, not of substance, but rather of the soundless cries of melancholy of spirits I cannot see. I am waiting, waiting in the gloom for something which will come to me. That need to wait is an innate part of my being, and I have no thought of questioning it. His voice died again. What are you waiting for? I asked. I do not know, he said his voice dreary with the despair of centuries of hopelessness. I only know that I must wait. That compulsion is greater than my strength to combat. The tone of his voice changed slightly. The tunnel about me is widening, and now the walls have receded into invisibility. The tunnel has become a plain, but the plain is as desolate, as forlorn and dreary as was the tunnel, and still I stand and wait. How long must this go on? He fell silent again, and I was about to prompt him with another question. I could not afford to let the time run out in long silences. But abruptly the muscles about his eyes tightened, and subtly a new aspect replaced their hopeless dejection. Now they expressed a black, bottomless terror. For a moment I marveled that so small a portion of a facial anatomy could express such horror. There is something coming toward me, he said. A beast of brutish foulness. Beast is too inadequate a term to describe it, but I know no words to tell its form. It is an intangible and evasive thing, but very real, and it is coming closer. It has no organs of sight as I know them, but I feel that it can see me, or rather that it is aware of me with a sense sharper than vision itself. It is very near now. Oh, God, the malevolence, the hate, the potentiality of awful, fearsome destructiveness that is its very essence, and still I cannot move. The expression of terrified anticipation centred in his eyes lessened slightly, and was replaced instantly by its former deep, deep despair. I am no longer afraid, he said. Why? I interjected. Why? I was impatient to learn all that I could before the end came. Because, he paused, because it holds no threat for me. Somehow, some day, I understand. I know that it too is seeking that for which I wait. What is it doing now? I asked. It has stopped beside me, and we stand together gazing across the stark, empty plain. Now a second awful entity, with the same leashed virulence about it, moves up and stands at my other side. We all three wait, myself with a dark fear of this dismal universe, my unnatural companions with patient, malicious menace. Bits of, he faltered, of, I can name it only aura, go out from the beasts like an acid stream and touch me, and the hate and the venom chill my body like a wave of intense cold. Now there are others of the awful breed behind me. We stand, waiting, waiting for that which will come. What it is, I do not know. I could see the power of death creeping steadily into the last corners of his lips, and I knew that the end was not far away. 
Suddenly a black frustration built up within me. "'What are you waiting for?' I screamed, the tenseness and the importance of this moment forcing me to lose the iron self-control upon which I have always prided myself. I knew that the answer held the secret of what I must know. If I could learn that, my experiment would not be in vain, and I could make whatever preparations were necessary for my own death. I had to know that answer. "'Think! Think!' I pleaded. "'What are you waiting for?' "'I do not know.' The dreary despair in his eyes, sightless as they met mine, chilled me with a coldness that I felt in the marrow of my being. "'I do not know,' he repeated. "'I... yes, I do know.' Abruptly the plasmatic film cleared from his eyes, and I knew that for the first time since the poison struck he was seeing me clearly. I sensed that this was the last moment before he left, for good. It had to be now. "'Tell me, I command you,' I cried. "'What are you waiting for?' His voice was quiet as he murmured, softly, implacably, before he was gone. "'We are waiting,' he said, "'for you.'" End of There Is a Reaper by Charles V. DeVette Recording by Ed Smithson Vanishing Point by C. C. Beck This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Seneca Souter Vanishing Point by C. C. Beck That? Oh, that's a perspective machine. Well, not exactly, but that's what I call it. No, I don't know how it works. Too complicated for me. Carter could make it go, but after he made it, he never used it. Too bad. He thought he'd make a lot of money with it there for a while, while he was working it out. Almost had me convinced, but I told him, Get it to work in first, Carter, and then show me what you can do with it better than I can do without it. I'm doing pretty well as is. Picture's selling good, even if I do make them all by guesswork, as you call it. That's what I told him. You see... Carter's one of them that artists that think they can work everything out by formulas and stuff. Me, I just paint things as I see them. Never worry about perspective and all that kind of mechanical aids. Never even went to art school, but I do all right. Carter now was a different sort of artist. Well, he wasn't really an artist, more of a draftsman. I first got him in to help me with a series of real estate paintings I got in order for. Big aerial views of land developments and drawings of buildings, roads and causeways, that kind of stuff, was a little too much for me to handle alone because I never studied that kind of things, you know. I thought he'd do the mechanical drawings, which should have been simple for anybody trained that way, and I'd throw in the colors, figures, and trees and so on. He did fine. Job came out good. Client was real happy. We made a pretty good amount of the job. Enough to keep us for a couple of months without working afterwards. I took it easy, fishing and so on, but Carter stayed here in the studio working on his own stuff. I let him keep an eye on things for me around the place and just dropped in now and then to check up. The guy was nuts on the subject of perspective. I thought he knew all there was to know about it already, but he claimed nobody knew anything about it really. Said he'd been studying it for years and the more he learned about it, the more there was to learn. He used to cover big sheets of paper with complicated diagrams, trying to prove something or other to himself. I'd come into the studio and find him with thumbtacks and strings and stuff all over the place. He'd get big, long rulers and draw lines to various points all over the room and end up with a little drawing of a cube about an inch square that anybody could have made in about a half a minute without all the apparatus. Seemed pretty silly to me. Then he brought in some books on mathematics and physics and other things, and a bunch of slide rules, calculators, and junk. He must have been a pretty smart guy to know how to handle all those things, even if he was kind of dopey about other things. You know, women and fishing and sports and drinking. He was lousy at everything except working on those perspective problems. Personally, I couldn't see much sense to what he was doing. The guy could draw all right already, so I asked him what more did he want. Let me see if I can remember what he said. 
I'm trying to get at things as they really are, not as they appear, he said. I think those were his words. Art is an illusion, a bag of tricks. Reality is something else, not what we think it is. Drawings are two-dimensional projections of a world that is not merely three, but four-dimensional, if not more, he said. Yeah, kind of a crackpot Carter was. Just on that one subject, though. Nice enough guy otherwise. Here, look at some of the drawings he made, working out uh, all his formulas. Nice designs, huh? Might make good wallpaper or fabric patterns. Real abstract. That's what people seem to like. See all these little letters scattered around among the lines? Different kinds of vanishing points they are. Carter claimed the whole world was full of vanishing points. You don't know what a vanishing point is? Let me see if I can explain. Come over to the window here. You see how that road out there gets smaller and smaller in the distance? Of course the road doesn't really get smaller. It just looks that way. That's what we call a vanishing point in drawing. Simple, isn't it? Never could understand why Carter went to so much trouble working out all those ways to locate vanishing points. Me, I just throw them in wherever I need them. But Carter claimed that was wrong. Said they were all connected together some way, and he was going to work out a method to prove it. Here, here's a little gadget he made up to help his calculations. Bunch of discs all pivoted together at the center. You're supposed to turn them around so the arrows point to the different figures and things. Here's the square root sign. I remember Carter telling me that. This one is the tangent function, whatever that means. Log there is short for logarithm. Oh, he had a bunch of that scientific stuff in his head all the time. Don't know whether he understood it all himself. He built this thing just before he put together the perspective machine there. Silly looking gadget, huh? All them pipes and wires and that little cube in the center. Don't try to touch it. It ain't really there. You just think it is. It's what Carter called a tetteract or a cataract. No, that ain't, that ain't the right word. Something like that. Tesser something or other. There's a picture like it in one of Carter's books. Hurt your eyes. Look at it, don't it? That's what Carter thought was going to make him a lot of fame and money. That perspective machine. I told him nobody had ever made a drawing machine yet that worked, but he said it wasn't supposed to make drawings. It was just supposed to give people a view of what reality is instead of what they think it is. I don't know whether he expected to charge money to look through it or whether he was going to look through it himself and make some kind of new drawings and sell them. No, I can't tell you how it works. I said before I don't know. Carter only used it once himself. I came in here the day he finished it, just as he was ready to turn it on. He was just putting the finishing touches on it. In a few minutes, he told me, I'll have the answer to a question that may never have been answered before. What is reality? Is the world a thing by itself, and all we know illusion? Why do things grow smaller the further away they, from us they appear? Why can't we see more than one side of anything at a time? What happens to the far side of an object? Does it cease to exist just because we can't see it? Are objects not present, non-existent? Because artists draw things vanishing to points, does that mean that they really vanish? A whack. That's what he was. Nice guy, but sort of screwy. He kept saying more goofy things while he was finishing up the machine about how he figured out that all we knew about vision and drawing and so on must be wrong, and that once he got a look at the real world, he'd prove it. How about cameras? I asked him. Take a picture with a camera and it looks just about the same as a drawing, don't it? That's because cameras are built to take pictures like we're used to seeing them, he said. Flat, two-dimensional slices of reality without depth or motion. Even 3D moving pictures? I asked. They're closer to reality, he admitted, but they are still only cross-sections of it. The shutter of a movie camera is closed as much of the time as it is open. What happens in between the times it's open? You know, he went on, people used to think that matter and motion were continuous, but scientists have proved that they are discontinuous. Now some of them think time may be too. 
Maybe everything is just imaginary and appears to our senses in whatever way we want it to appear. We are so well trained that we see everything just as we are taught to see it by generations of artists, writers, and other symbol makers. If we could see things as they really are, what might happen? We'd probably all go nuts, I told him. He just smiled. Well, here goes, he said. It's finished. Now to find out who is right, the scientists and philosophers who say reality is forever unreachable, or the artists who say there isn't any reality, that we make the whole thing up to suit ourselves. He moved one of those pointed things you see there and squinted around at the different scales and dials and then stepped back. That little Tessie thing appeared, real small at first, just a point. You could hardly see it. I couldn't see anything else happening and thought he was going to do something else in the machine. I turned to look at Carter and saw his face was white as a sheet. Good God, he says, just like that. Good God. That's all. Well, I says to him, who was right, the scientists or the artists? The artist, he sort of screeches, the artists were right all the time. There is no reality. It's all a fabric of illusion we've created ourselves. And now I've ripped a hole in that. He gives a strangled hoot and goes hightailing out of here like something was after him, jumps in his car and roars off down the road and disappears. No, I don't mean he really disappeared, are you nuts? Just roared on down the road till he got so small I couldn't see him no more. You know, the way things do when they go farther and farther away happens every day. That's what us artists mean by perspective. The machine? Well, I don't know what to do with it. If Carter ever comes back, he might not like my getting rid of it. I was thinking maybe I'd put it in the hobby show at the county fair next week, though. You notice how that funny-looking cube inside there gets bigger every time you look at it? There, it just doubled its size again, see? People at the fair ought to get a big kick out of that. No telling how big it'll get with all those people looking at it. But come on, let's go fishing. You better hurry or it'll be too late. The End End of Vanishing Point by C.C. C. Beck Recording by Seneca Suter, Denver, Colorado Youth by Isaac Asimov. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. Youth by Isaac Asimov. Red and Slim found the two strange little animals the morning after they heard the thunder sounds. They knew that they could never show their new pets to their parents. Chapter One There was a splatter of pebbles against the window, and the youngster stirred in his sleep. Another, and he was awake. He sat up stiffly in bed. Seconds passed while he interpreted his strange surroundings. He wasn't in his own home, of course. This was out in the country. It was colder than it should be, and there was green at the window. Slim! The call was a hoarse, urgent whisper, and the youngster bounded to the open window. Slim wasn't his real name, but the new friend he had met the day before had needed only one look at his slight figure to say, You're Slim. He added, I'm Red. Red wasn't his real name either, but its appropriateness was obvious. They were friends instantly, with the quick, unquestioning friendship of young ones not yet quite in adolescence, before even the first stains of adulthood began to make their appearance. Slim cried, Hi, Red, and waved cheerfully, still blinking the sleep out of himself. Red kept to his croaking whisper, Quiet! You want to wake somebody? Slim noticed all at once that the sun scarcely topped the low hills in the east, that the shadows were long and soft, and that the grass was wet. Slim said more softly, What's the matter? Red only waved for him to come out. Slim dressed quickly, gladly confining his morning wash to the momentary sprinkle of a little lukewarm water. 
He let the air dry the exposed portions of his body as he ran out, while bare skin grew wet against the dewy grass. Red said, You've got to be quiet. If Mom wakes up, or, or Dad, or your Dad, or even any of the hands, then it'll be, Come on in, or you'll catch your death of cold. He mimicked voice and tone faithfully, so that Slim laughed and thought that there had never been so funny a fellow as Red. Slim said eagerly, Do you come out here every day like this, Red? Real early? It's like the whole world is just yours, isn't it, Red? No one else around, and all like that. He felt proud at being allowed entrance into this private world. Red stared at him sidelong. He said carelessly, I've been up for hours. Didn't you hear it last night? He hear what? Thunder. Was there a thunderstorm? Slim never slept through a thunderstorm. I guess not, but there was thunder. I heard it, and then I went to the window, and it wasn't raining. It was all stars, and the sky was just getting sort of almost gray. You know what I mean? Slim had never seen it so, but he nodded. So I just thought I'd go out, said Red. They walked along the grassy side of the concrete road that split the panorama right down the middle all the way down to where it vanished among the hills. It was so old that Red's father couldn't tell Red when it had been built. It didn't have a crack or a rough spot in it. Red said, Can you keep a secret? Sure, Red. What, what kind of secret? Just a secret. Maybe I'll tell you, and maybe I won't. I, I don't know yet. Red broke a long, supple stem from a fern they passed methodically, stripping it of its leaflets, and swung what was left whip-fashion. For a moment he was on a wild charger, which reared and champed under his iron control. Then he got tired tossed the whip aside, and stowed the charger away in a corner of his imagination for future use. He said, There'll be a circus around. Slim said, That's no secret. I knew that. My dad told me even before we came here. That's not the secret. Fine secret. Ever see a circus? Oh, sure, you bet. Like it? Say, there isn't anything I like better. Red was watching out of the corner of his eyes again. Ever think you would like to be with a circus? I mean, for good? Slim considered. I guess not. I think I'll be an astronomer like my dad. I think he wants me to be. Huh, <laughs> astronomer, said Red. Slim felt the doors of the new private world closing on him, and astronomy became a thing of dead stars and black empty space. He said placatingly, a circus would be more fun. You're just saying that. No, I, I'm not. I, I mean it. Red grew argumentative. Suppose you had a chance to join the circus right now. What would you do? I... I... See? Red affected scornful laughter. Slim was stung. I, I join up. Go on. Try me. Red whirled at him, strange and intense. You mean that? You want to go in with me? What do you mean? Slim stepped back a bit, surprised by the unexpected challenge. I got something that can get us into the circus. Maybe some day we can even have a circus of our own. We could be the biggest circus fellows in the world. That's if you want to go in with me. Otherwise, well, I guess I can do it on my own. I just thought, let's give good old Slim a chance. The world was strange and glamorous, and Slim said, Sure thing, Red. I, I'm in. What is it, huh, Red? Tell me, what is it? Figure it out. What's the most important thing in the circuses? Slim thought desperately. He wanted to give the right answer. Finally, he said, Acrobats? Holy smokes! I, I wouldn't go five steps to look at acrobats. I, I, I don't know, then. Animals, that's what. What's the best sideshow? Where are the biggest crowds? Even in the main rings, the best acts are the animal acts. There was no doubt in Red's voice. Do you think so? Everyone thinks so. You ask anyone. Anyway, I, I found animals this morning. Two of them. And you've got them? Sure, that's the secret. Are you telling? 
Of course not. Okay. I've got them in the barn. Do you want to see them? They were almost at the barn. Its huge open door, black, too black. They had been heading there all the time. Slim stopped in his tracks. He tried to make his words casual. Are they big? Would I fool with them if they were big? They can't hurt you. They're only about so long. I've got them in a cage. They were in the barn now, and Slim saw the large cage suspended from a hook in the roof. It was covered with stiff canvas. Red said, We used to have some bird there or something. Anyway, they can't get away from there. Come on, let's go up to the loft. They clambered up the wooden stairs, and Red hooked the cage toward them. Slim pointed and said, There's sort of a hole in the canvas. Red frowned. How'd that get there? He lifted the canvas, looked in, and said with relief, They're still there. The canvas appeared to be burned, worried Slim. You want to look or don't you? Slim nodded slowly. He wasn't sure he wanted to, after all. They might be. But the canvas had been jerked off, and there they were, two of them, the way Red said. They were small and sort of disgusting-looking. The animals moved quickly as the canvas lifted, and were on the side toward the youngsters. Red poked a cautious finger at them. Watch out, said Slim in agony. They don't hurt you, said Red. Ever see anything like them? No. Can't you see how a circus would jump at a chance to have these? Maybe they're too small for a circus. Red looked annoyed. He let go the cage, which swung back and forth pendulum fashion. You're just trying to back out, aren't you? No, I, I, I'm just... it's just... They're not too small. Don't worry. Right now I've only got one worry. What's that? Well, I've got to keep them till the circus comes, don't I? I've got to figure out what to feed them meanwhile. The cage swung, and the little trapped creatures clung to its bars, gesturing at the youngsters with queer, quick motions, almost as though they were intelligent. CHAPTER Two. The astronomer entered the dining-room with decorum. He felt very much the guest. He said, Where are the youngsters? My son isn't in his room. The industrialist smiled. They've been out for hours. However, breakfast was forced into them among the women some time ago, so there is nothing to worry about. Youth, doctor, youth. Youth. The words seemed to depress the astronomer. They ate breakfast in silence. The industrialist said once, You really think they'll come? The day looks so normal. The astronomer said, They'll come. That was all. Afterward, the industrialist said, You'll pardon me. I can't conceive you're playing so elaborate a hoax. You really spoke to them. As I speak to you, at least in a sense, they can project thoughts. I gathered that must be so from your letter. How, I wonder? I could not say. I asked them, and of course they were vague, or perhaps it was just that I could not understand. It involves a projector for the focusing of thought, and even more than that, conscious attention on the part of both projector and receptor. It was quite a while before I realized they were trying to think at me. Such thought projectors may be part of the science they will give us. Perhaps, said the industrialist, yet think of the changes it would bring to society, a thought projector. Why not? Change would be good for us. I don't think so. It is only in old age that change is unwelcome, said the astronomer, and races can be old as well as individuals. The industrialist pointed out the window. You see that road? It was built before the wars. I don't know exactly when. It is as good now as the day it was built. We couldn't possibly duplicate it now. The race was young when that was built, eh? Then... Yes, at least they weren't afraid of new things. No, I wish they had been. Where is the society of before the wars? Destroyed, doctor. What good were youth and new things? We are better off now. The world is peaceful and jogs along. The race goes nowhere, but, after all, there is nowhere to go. 
They proved that. The men who built the road. I will speak with your visitors as I agreed if they come, but I think I will only ask them to go. The race is not going nowhere, said the astronomer earnestly. It is going toward final destruction. My university has a smaller student body each year. Fewer books are written, less work is done. An old man sleeps in the sun, and his days are peaceful and unchanging, but each day finds him nearer death all the same. Well, well, said the industrialist. No, don't dismiss it. Listen, before I wrote you, I investigated your position in the planetary economy. And you found me solvent? interrupted the industrialist, smiling. Why, yes. Oh, I see you are joking, and yet perhaps the joke is not far off. You are less solvent than your father, and he was less solvent than his father. Perhaps your son will no longer be solvent. It becomes too troublesome for the planet to support even the industries that still exist, though they are toothpicks to the oak trees of before the wars. We will be back to village economy. And then, to what? The caves? And the infusion of fresh technological knowledge will be the changing of all that? Not just the new knowledge, rather the whole effect of change, of a broadening of horizons. Look, sir, I, I chose you to approach in this matter not only because you were rich and influential with government officials, but because you had an unusual reputation for these days, of daring to break with tradition. Our people will resist change, and you would know how to handle them, how to see to it that, that, that the youth of the race is revived? Yes. With atomic bombs? The atomic bombs, returned the astronomer, need not be the end of civilization. These visitors of mine had their atomic bomb, or whatever their equivalent was, on their own worlds, and survived it, because they didn't give up. Don't you see, it wasn't the bomb that defeated us, but our own shell shock. This may be the last chance to reverse the process. Tell me said the industrialist. What do these friends from space want in return? The astronomer hesitated. He said, I will be truthful with you. They come from a denser planet. Ours is richer in the lighter atoms. They want magnesium, aluminum? No, sir. Carbon and hydrogen. They want coal and oil. Really? The astronomer said quickly, you are going to ask why creatures who have mastered space travel and therefore atomic power would want coal and oil. I can't answer that. The industrialist smiled. But I can. This is the best evidence yet of the truth of your story. Superficially, atomic power would seem to preclude the use of coal and oil. However, quite apart from the energy gained by their combustion, they remain, and always will remain, the basic raw material for all organic chemistry. Plastics, dyes, pharmaceuticals, solvents. Industry could not exist without them, even in an atomic age. Still, if coal and oil are the low price for which they would sell us the troubles and tortures of racial youth, my answer is that the commodity would be dear if offered gratis. The astronomer sighed and said, There are the boys. They were visible through the open window, standing together in the grassy field and lost in animated conversation. The industrialist's son pointed imperiously, and the astronomer's son nodded and made off at a run toward the house. The industrialist said, There is the youth you speak of. Our race has as much of it as it ever had. Yes, but we age them quickly and pour them into the mold. Slim scuttled into the room. The door banged behind him. The astronomer said in mild disapproval, What's this? Slim looked up in surprise and came to a halt. I, I, I beg your pardon. I didn't know anyone was here. I, I'm sorry to have interrupted. His enunciation was almost painfully precise. The industrialist said, It's all right, youngster. But the astronomer said, even if you had been entering an empty room, son, there would be no cause for slamming a door. Nonsense, insisted the industrialist. The youngster has done no harm. You simply scold him for being young. You, with your views. He said to Slim, Come here, lad. 
Slim advanced slowly. How do you like the country, eh? Very much, sir. Thank you. My son has been showing you about the place, hasn't he? Yes, sir. Red, I, I mean... No, no. Call him Red. I call him that myself. Now, tell me, what are you two up to, eh? Slim looked away. Why, just exploring, sir. The industrialist turned to the astronomer. There you are. Youthful curiosity and adventure lust. The race has not yet lost it. Slim said, Sir? Yes, lad. The youngster took a long time in getting on with it. He said, Red sent me in for something good to eat, but I don't exactly know what he meant. I, I didn't like to say so. Why, just ask Cook. She'll have something good for youngins to eat. Oh, no, sir. I, I mean for animals. For animals? Yes, sir. What do animals eat? The astronomer said, I am afraid my son is city-bred. Well, said the industrialist, there's no harm in that. What, what kind of an animal, lad? A, a small one, sir. Then try grass or leaves, and if they don't want that, nuts or berries would probably do the trick. Thank you, sir. Slim ran out again, closing the door gently behind him. The astronomer said, Do you suppose they've trapped an animal alive? He was obviously perturbed. That's common enough. There's no shooting on my estate, and it's tame country, full of rodents and small creatures. Red is always coming home with pets of one sort or another. They rarely maintain his interest for long. He looked at the wall clock. Your friends should have been here by now, shouldn't they? Chapter 3 The swaying had come to a halt, and it was dark. The explorer was not comfortable in the alien air. It felt as thick as soup, and he had to breathe shallowly. Even so, he reached out in a sudden need for company. The merchant was warm to the touch. His breathing was rough. He moved in an occasional spasm, and was obviously asleep. The explorer hesitated and decided not to wake him. It would serve no real purpose. There would be no rescue, of course. That was the penalty paid for the high profits which unrestrained competition could lead to. The merchant who opened a new planet could have a ten-year monopoly of its trade, which he might hug to himself, or, more likely, rent out to all comers at a stiff price. It was followed that planets were searched for in secrecy and preferably away from the usual trade routes. In a case such as theirs, then, there was little or no chance that another ship would come within range of their sub etherics except for the most improbable of coincidences. Even if they were in their ship, that is, rather than in this, this cage. The explorer grasped the thick bars. Even if they blasted those away, as they could, they would be stuck too high in the open air for leaping. It was too bad. They had landed twice before in the scout ship. They had established contact with the natives, who were grotesquely huge, but mild and unaggressive. It was obvious that they had once owned a flourishing technology, but hadn't faced up to the consequences of such a technology. It would have been a wonderful market. And it was a tremendous world. The merchant especially had been taken aback. He had known the figures that expressed the planet's diameter, but from a distance of two light seconds he had stood at the visiplate and muttered, Unbelievable! Oh, there are larger worlds, the explorer said. It wouldn't do for an explorer to be too easily impressed. Inhabited? Well, no. Why, you could drop your planet into that large ocean and drown it. The explorer smiled. It was a gentle dig at his Arcturan homeland, which was smaller than most planets. He said, Not quite. The merchant followed along the lines of his thoughts. And the inhabitants are large in proportion to their world? He sounded as though the news struck him less favorably now. Nearly ten times our height. Are you sure they're friendly? That is hard to say. Friendship between alien intelligence is an imponderable. They are not dangerous, I think. 
We've come across other groups that could not maintain equilibrium after the atomic war stage, and you know the results. Introversion, retreat, gradual decadence, and increasing gentleness. Even if they are such monsters? The principle remains. It was about then that the explorer felt the heavy throbbing of the engines. He frowned and said, We are descending a bit too quickly. There had been some speculation on the dangers of landing some hours before. The planetary target was a huge one for an oxygen water world, though it lacked the size of the uninhabitable hydrogen ammonia planets, and its low density made its surface gravity fairly normal. Its gravitational forces fell off, but slowly, with distance. In short, its gravitational potential was high, and the ship's calculator was a run-of-the-mill model not designed to plot landing trajectories at that potential range. That meant the pilot would have to use manual controls. It would have been wiser to install a more high-powered model, but that would have meant a trip to some outpost of civilization. Lost time, perhaps a lost secret. The merchant demanded an immediate landing. The merchant felt it necessary to defend his position now. He said angrily to the explorer, don't you think the pilot knows his job? He landed you safely twice before. Yes, thought the explorer, in a scout ship, not in this unmaneuverable freighter. Aloud, he said nothing. He kept his eye on the visiplate. They were descending too quickly. There was no room for doubt. Much too quickly. The merchant said peevishly, Why do you keep silence? Well, then, if you wish me to speak, I would suggest that you strap on your floater and help me prepare the ejector. The pilot fought a noble fight. He was no beginner. The atmosphere, abnormally high and thick in the gravitational potential of this world, whipped and burned about the ship. But to the very last it looked as though he might bring it under control despite that. He even maintained course, following the extrapolated line to the point on the northern continent toward which they were headed. Under other circumstances, with a shade more luck, the story would eventually have been told and retold as a heroic and masterly reversal of a lost situation. But within sight of victory, tired body and tired nerves clamped a control bar with a shade too much pressure. The ship, which had almost leveled off, dipped down again. There was no room to retrieve the final error. There was only a mile left to fall. The pilot remained at his post to the actual landing, his only thought that of breaking the force of the crash, of maintaining the spaceworthiness of the vessel. He did not survive. With the ship buckling madly in a soupy atmosphere, few ejectors could be mobilized, and only one of them in time. When, afterwards, the explorer lifted out of unconsciousness and rose to his feet, he had the definite feeling that but for himself and the merchant there were no survivors. And perhaps that was an overcalculation. His floater had burned out while still sufficiently distant from surface to have the fall stun him. The merchant might have had less luck, even than that. He was surrounded by a world of thick, ropey stalks of grass, and in the distance were trees that reminded him vaguely of similar structures on his native Arcturan world, except that their lowest branches were high above what he would consider normal treetops. He called his voice sounding basso in the thick air, and the merchant answered. The explorer made his way toward him, thrusting violently at the coarse stalks that barred his path. "'Are you hurt?' he asked. The merchant grimaced. "'I've sprained something. It hurts to walk.' The explorer probed gently. "'I don't think anything is broken. You'll have to walk despite the pain. "'Can't we rest first? It's important to try to find the ship. If it's spaceworthy, or if it can be repaired, we may live. Otherwise, we won't. Just a few minutes. Let me catch my breath. The explorer was glad enough for those few minutes. The merchant's eyes were already closed. He allowed his to do the same. He heard the trampling, and his eyes snapped open. Never sleep on a strange planet, he told himself futilely. The merchant was awake, too, and his steady screaming was a rumble of terror. The explorer called. It's only a native of this planet. It won't harm you. But even as he spoke, the giant had swooped down, and in a moment they were in its grasp, being lifted closer to its monstrous ugliness. The merchant struggled violently, and, of course, quite futilely. Can't you talk to it? he yelled. 
The explorer could only shake his head. I can't reach it with the projector. It won't be listening. Then blast it! Blast it down! We can't do that. The phrase, you fool, had almost been added. The explorer struggled to keep his self-control. They were swallowing space as the monster moved purposefully away. Why not? cried the merchant. You can reach your blaster. I see it in plain sight. Don't be afraid of falling. It's simpler than that. If this monster is killed, you'll never trade with this planet. You'll never even leave it. You probably won't live the day out. Why? Why? Because this is one of the young of the species. You should know what happens when a traitor kills a native young, even accidentally. What's more, if this is the target point, then we are on the estate of a powerful native. This might be one of his brood. That was how they entered their present prison. They had carefully burnt away a portion of the thick, stiff covering, and it was obvious that the height from which they were suspended was a killing one. Now, once again, the prison cage shuddered and lifted in an upward arc. The merchant rolled to the lower rim and startled awake. The cover lifted and light flooded in. As was the case the time before, there were two specimens of the young. They were not very different in appearance from adults of the species, reflected the explorer though, of course, they were considerably smaller. A handful of reedy green stalks was stuffed between the bars. Its odor was not unpleasant, but it carried clods of soil at its ends. The merchant drew away and said huskily, What are they doing? The explorer said, Trying to feed us, I should judge. At least this seems to be the native equivalent of grass. The cover was replaced, and they were set swinging again, alone with their fodder. Chapter 4 Slim started at the sound of footsteps and brightened when it turned out to be only red. He said, No one's around. I had my eye peeled. You bet. Red said, Shh! Look! You take this stuff and stick it in the cage. I've got to scoot back to the house. What is it? Slim reached reluctantly. Ground meat! Holy smokes! Haven't you ever seen ground meat? That's what you should have got when I sent you to the house instead of coming back with that stupid grass. Slim was hurt. How do I know they don't eat grass? Besides, ground meat doesn't come loose like that. It comes in cellophane, and it isn't that color. Sure, in the city. Out here we grind our own, and it's always this color till it's cooked. You mean it isn't cooked? Slim drew away quickly. Red looked disgusted. Do you think animals eat cooked food? Come on, take it. It won't hurt you. I tell you, there isn't much time. Why? What's doing back at the house? I don't know. Dad and your father are walking around. I think maybe they're looking for me. Maybe the cook told them I took the meat. Anyway, we, we don't want them coming here after me. Didn't you ask the cook before you took the stuff? Who? That crab? Shouldn't wonder if she only let me have a drink of water because Dad makes her. Come on, take it. Slim took the large glob of meat, though his skin crawled at the touch. He turned toward the barn, and Red sped away in the direction from which he had come. He slowed when he approached the two adults, took a few deep breaths to bring himself back to normal, and then carefully and nonchalantly sauntered past. They were walking in the general direction of the barn, he noticed, but not dead on. He said, Hi, Dad. Hello, sir. The industrialist said, Just a moment, Red. I have a question to ask you. Red turned a carefully blank face to his father. Yes, Dad? Mother tells me you were out early this morning. Not real early, Dad. Just a little before breakfast. She said you told her it was because you had been awakened during the night and didn't go back to sleep. Red waited before answering. Should he have told Mom that? Then he said, Yes, sir. What was it that awakened you? Red saw no harm in it. He said, I don't know, Dad. It sounded like thunder, sort of, and like a collision, sort of. Could you tell me where it came from? It sounded like it was out by the hill. That was truthful and useful as well, since the direction was almost opposite that in which the barn lay. The industrialist looked at his guest. I suppose it would do no harm to walk toward the hill. The astronomer said, 
I am ready. Red watched them walk away, and when he turned he saw Slim peering cautiously out from among the briars of a hedge. Red waved at him. Come on! Slim stepped out and approached. Did they say anything about the meat? No, I guess they don't know about that. They went down to the hill. What for? Search me. They kept asking about the noise I heard. Listen, did the animals eat the meat? Well, said Slim cautiously, they were sort of looking at it and smelling it or something. Okay, Red said. I guess they'll eat it. Holy smokes, they've got to eat something. Let's walk along toward the hill and see what Dad and your father are going to do. What about the animals? They'll be all right. A, a fellow can't spend all his time on them. Did you give them water? Sure. They drank that. See? Come on. We'll look at them after lunch. I tell you what, we'll bring them fruit. Anything will eat fruit. Together they trotted up the rise, red as usual in the lead. Chapter 5 The astronomer said, Do you think the noise was their ship landing? Don't you think it could be? If it were, they may all be dead. Perhaps not, the industrialist frowned. If they have landed and are still alive, where are they? Think about that for a while. He was still frowning. The astronomer said, I don't understand you. They may not be friendly. Oh, no, I I've spoken with them. They're... You've spoken with them. Call that reconnaissance. What would their next step be? Invasion? But they only have one ship, sir. You know that only because they say so. They might have a fleet. I've told you about their size. They... Their size would not matter if they have hand weapons that may well be superior to our artillery. That is not what I meant. I had this partly in mind from the first, the industrialist went on. It is for that reason I agreed to see them after I received your letter, not to agree to an unsettling and impossible trade, but to judge their real purposes. I did not count on their evading the meeting. He sighed. I suppose it isn't our fault. You are right in one thing, at any rate. The world has been at peace too long. We are losing a healthy sense of suspicion. The astronomer's mild voice rose to an unusual pitch, and he said, I will speak. I tell you that there is no reason to suppose they can possibly be hostile. They are small, yes, but that is only important because it is a reflection of the fact that their native worlds are small. Our world has what is for them a normal gravity, but because of a much higher gravitational potential, our atmosphere is too dense to support them comfortably over sustained periods. For a similar reason, the use of the world as a base for interstellar travel, except for trade in certain items, is uneconomical. And there are important differences in chemistry of life due to the basic differences in soils. They couldn't eat our food or we theirs. Surely all this can be overcome. They can bring their own food, build domed stations of lowered air pressure, devise specially designed ships. They can. And how glibly you can describe feats that are easy to erase in its youth. It is simply that they don't have to do any of that. There are millions of worlds suitable for them in the galaxy. They don't need this one which isn't. How do you know? All this is their information again. This I was able to check independently. I am an astronomer, after all. That is true. Let me hear what you have to say, then, while we walk. Then, sir, consider that for a long time our astronomers have believed that two general classes of planetary bodies exist. First, the planets which formed at distances far enough from their stellar nucleus to become cool enough to capture hydrogen. These would be large planets, rich in hydrogen, ammonia, and methane. We have examples of these in the giant outer planets. The second class would include those planets formed so near the stellar center that the high temperature would make it impossible to capture much hydrogen. These would be smaller planets, comparatively poorer in hydrogen and richer in oxygen. We know that type very well, since we live on one. 
Ours is the only solar system we know in detail, however, and it has been reasonable for us to assume that these were the only two planetary classes. I take it, then, that there is another. Yes, there is a super-dense class, still smaller, poorer in hydrogen than the inner planets of the solar system. The ratio of occurrence of hydrogen-ammonia planets and these super-dense water-oxygen worlds of theirs over the entire galaxy, and remember that they have actually conducted a survey of significant sample volumes of the galaxy which we without interstellar travel cannot do, is about three to one. This leaves them seven million super-dense worlds for exploration and colonization. The industrial looked at the blue sky and the green-covered trees among which they were making their way. He said, And worlds like ours? The astronomer said softly, Ours is the first solar system they have found which contains them. Apparently the development of our solar system was unique and did not follow the ordinary rules. The industrialist considered that. What it amounts to is that these creatures from space are asteroid dwellers. No, no. The asteroids are something else again. They occur, I was told, in one out of eight stellar systems, but they're completely different from what we've been discussing. And how does your being an astronomer change the fact that you are still only quoting their unsupported statements? But they did not restrict themselves to bald items of information. They presented me with a theory of stellar evolution which I had to accept, and which is more nearly valid than anything our own astronomy has ever been able to devise, if we accept possible lost theories dating from before the wars. Mind you, their theory had a rigidly mathematical development, and it predicted just such a galaxy as they describe. So you see, they have all the worlds they wish. They are not land-hungry. Certainly not for our land. Reason would say so if what you say is true, but creatures may be intelligent and not reasonable. Our forefathers were presumably intelligent, yet they were certainly not reasonable. Was it reasonable to destroy almost all their tremendous civilization in atomic warfare over causes our historians can no longer accurately determine? The industrialist brooded over it. From the dropping of the first atomic bomb over those islands, I forget the ancient name, there was only one end in sight, and in plain sight. Yet events were allowed to proceed to that end. He looked up, said briskly, Well, where are we? I wonder if we are not on a fool's errand after all. But the astronomer was a little in advance, and his voice came thickly. No fool's errand, sir. Look there. Chapter 6 Red and Slim had trailed their elders with the experience of youth aided by the absorption and anxiety of their fathers. Their view of the final object of the search was somewhat obscured by the underbrush behind which they remained. Red said, Holy smokes, look at that, it's all shiny silver or something. But it was Slim who was really excited. He caught at the other. I know what this is. It's a spaceship. That must be why my father came here. He's one of the biggest astronomers in the world, and your father would have to call him if a spaceship landed on his estate. What are you talking about? Dad didn't even know that that thing was there. He only came here because I told him I heard the thunder from here. B besides, there isn't any such thing as a spaceship. Sure there is. Look at it. See those round things? They are ports, and you can see the rocket tubes. How do you know so much? Slim was flushed. He said, I read about them. My father has books about them, old books, from before the wars. Huh? Now I know you're making it up. Books from before the wars? My father has to have them. He teaches at the university. It's his job. His voice had risen, and Red had to pull at him. You want them to hear us? He whispered indignantly. Well, it is, too, a spaceship. Look here, Slim. You mean that's a ship from another world? It's got to be. L look at my father going around and around it. He wouldn't be so interested if it was anything else. Other worlds? W where are there other worlds? Everywhere. How about the planets? They're worlds just like ours, some of them. And other stars probably have planets. There's probably zillions of planets. 
Red felt outweighed and outnumbered. He muttered, You're crazy. All right, then, I'll show you. Hey, where are you going? Down there, I'm going to ask my father. I suppose you'll believe it if he tells you. I suppose you'll believe a professor of astronomy knows what— He had scrambled upright. Red said, Hey, you don't want them to see us. We're not supposed to be here. Do you want them to start asking questions and find out about our animals? I don't care. You said I was crazy. Snitcher, you promised you wouldn't tell. I'm not going to tell. But if they find out themselves, it's your fault for starting an argument and saying I was crazy. I take it back, then, grumbled Red. Well, all right, you better. In a way, Slim was disappointed. He wanted to see the spaceship at close quarters. Still, he could not break his vow of secrecy, even in spirit, without at least the excuse of a personal insult. Red said, It's awfully small for a spaceship. Sure, because it's probably a scout ship. I'll bet Dad couldn't even get into the old thing. So much Slim realized to be true. It was a weak point in his argument, and he made no answer. His interest was absorbed by the adults. Red rose to his feet, an elaborate attitude of boredom all about him. Well, I guess we better be going. There's business to do, and I can't spend all day here looking at some old spaceship or whatever it is. We've got to take care of the animals if we're going to be circus folks. That's the first rule with circus folks. They've got to take care of the animals. And, he finished virtuously, that's what I aim to do anyway. Slim said, What for, Red? They've got plenty of meat. Let's watch. There's no fun in watching. Besides, Dad and your father are going away, and I guess it's about lunchtime. Red became argumentative. Look, Slim, we can't start acting suspicious or they're going to start investigating. Holy smokes, don't you ever read any detective stories? When you're trying to work a big deal without being caught, it's practically the main thing to keep on acting, just like always. Then they don't suspect anything. That's the first law. Oh, all right. Slim rose resentfully. At the moment, the circus appeared to him a rather tawdry and shoddy substitute for the glories of astronomy, and he wondered how he had come to fall in with Red's silly scheme. Down the slope they went, slim, as usual, in the rear. Chapter 7 The industrialist said, It's the workmanship that gets me. I never saw such construction. What good is it now? said the astronomer bitterly. There's nothing left. There'll be no second landing. This ship detected life on our planet through accident. Other exploring parties would come no closer than necessary to establish the fact that there were no super-dense worlds existing in our solar system. Well, there's no quarreling with a crash landing. The ship hardly seems damaged. If only some had survived, the ship might have been repaired. If they had survived, there would be no trade in any case. They're too different, too disturbing. In any case, it's over. They entered the house, and the industrialist greeted his wife calmly. Lunch about ready, dear? I'm afraid not. You see, she looked hesitantly at the astronomer. Is anything wrong? asked the industrialist. Why not tell me? I'm sure our guest won't mind a little family discussion. Pray don't pay any attention whatever to me, muttered the astronomer. He moved miserably to the other end of the room. The woman said in low, hurried tones, Really, dear, Cook's that upset. I've been soothing her for hours, and honestly, I, I don't know why Red should have done it. Done what? The industrialist was more amused than otherwise. It had taken the united efforts of himself and his son months to argue his wife into using the name Red, rather than the perfectly ridiculous, viewed youngster fashion, name which was his real one. She said, He's taken most of the chopped meat. He's eaten it? Well, I hope not. It was raw. Then what would he want it for? I haven't the slightest idea. I haven't seen him since breakfast. Meanwhile, Cook's just furious. She caught him vanishing out the kitchen door, and there was the bowl of chopped meat just about empty, and she was going to use it for lunch. Well, you know Cook. She has to change the lunch menu, and that means she won't be worth living with for a week. 
You'll just have to speak to Red, dear, and make him promise not to do things in the kitchen any more. And it wouldn't hurt to have him apologize to Cook. Oh, come. She works for us. If we don't complain about a change in lunch menu, why should she? Because she's the one who has double work made for her. And she's talking about quitting. Good cooks aren't easy to get. Do you remember the one before her? It was a strong argument. The industrialist looked about vaguely. He said, I suppose you're right. He isn't here, I suppose. When he comes in, I'll, I'll talk to him. You'd better start. Here he comes. Red walked into the house and said cheerfully, Time for lunch, I guess. He looked from one parent to the other in quick speculation at their fixed stares and said, Got to clean up first, though, and made for the other door. The industrialist said, One moment, son. Sir? Where's your little friend? Red said carelessly, He's around somewhere. We were just sort of walking, and I looked around, and he wasn't there. This was perfectly true, and Red felt on safe ground. I told him it was lunchtime. I said, I suppose it's about lunchtime, I said, and we got to be getting back to the house. And he said, yes. And I just went on, and then when I was about at the creek, I looked around, and— The astronomer interrupted the voluble story, looking up from a magazine he had been sightlessly rummaging through. I wouldn't worry about my youngster. He's quite self-sufficient. Don't wait lunch for him. Lunch isn't ready in any case, doctor. The industrialist turned once more to his son. And talking about that, son, the reason for it is that something has happened to the ingredients. Do you have anything to say? Sir? I hate to feel that I have to explain myself more fully. Why did you take the chopped meat? The chopped meat? The chopped meat. He waited patiently. Red said, Well, I was sort of hungry, prompted his father, for raw meat. No, sir, I, I just sort of needed it. For what, exactly? Red looked miserable and remained silent. The astronomer broke in again. If you don't mind my putting in a few words, you'll remember that just after breakfast my son came in to ask what animals ate. Oh, you're right. How stupid of me to forget. Look here, Red. Did you take it for an animal pet you've got? Red recovered indignant breath. He said, You mean Slim came in here and said I had an animal? He came in here and said that? He said I had an animal? No, he didn't. He simply asked what animals ate. That's all. Now, if he promised he wouldn't tell on you, he didn't. It's your own foolishness in trying to take something without permission that gave you away. That happened to be stealing. Now, have you an animal? I ask you a direct question. Yes, sir. It was a whisper so low as hardly to be heard. All right. You'll have to get rid of it. Do you understand? Red's mother intervened. Do you mean to say you're keeping a meat-eating animal, Red? It might bite you and give you blood poison. They're only small ones, quavered Red. They hardly budge if you touch them. They? How many do you have? Two. Where are they? The industrialist touched her arm. Don't chivy the child any further, he said in a low voice. If he says he'll get rid of them, he will, and that's punishment enough. He dismissed the matter from his mind. Chapter 8 Lunch was half over when Slim dashed into the dining room. For a moment he stood abashed, and then he said in what was almost hysteria, I I've got to speak to Red. I've got to say something. Red looked up in fright, but the astronomer said, I don't think, son, you're being very polite. You've kept lunch waiting. I I'm sorry, father. Oh, don't rate the lad, said the industrialist's wife. He can speak to Red if he wants to, and there was no damage done to the lunch. I've got to speak to Red alone, Slim insisted. Now that's enough, said the astronomer, with a kind of gentleness that was obviously manufactured for the benefit of strangers, and which had beneath it an easily recognized edge. Take your seat. Slim did so, but he ate only when somebody looked directly at him. Even then he was not very successful. Red caught his eyes. 
He made soundless words. Did the animals get loose? Slim shook his head slightly. He whispered, No, it's... The astronomer looked at him hard, and Slim faltered to a stop. With lunch over, Red slipped out of the room with a microscopic motion at Slim to follow. They walked in silence to the creek. Then Red turned fiercely upon his companion. Look here! What's the idea of telling my dad we were feeding animals? Slim said, I, I didn't. I asked what you feed animals. That's not the same as saying we were doing it. Besides, it's something else, Red. But Red had not used up his grievances. And where did you go, anyway? I thought you were coming to the house. They acted like it was my fault you weren't there. But I I'm trying to tell you about that if you'd only shut up a second and let me talk. You don't give a fellow a chance. Well, go on and tell me if you've got so much to say. I'm trying to. I went back to the spaceship. The folks weren't there anymore, and I wanted to see what it was like. It isn't a spaceship, said Red sullenly. He had nothing to lose. It is, too. I looked inside. You could look through the ports, and I looked inside, and they were dead. He looked sick. They were dead. Who were dead? Slim screeched. Animals! Like our animals! Only they aren't animals. They're people-things from other planets. For a moment Red might have been turned to stone. It didn't occur to him to disbelieve Slim at this point. Slim looked too genuinely the bearer of just such tidings. He said finally, Oh, my. Well, what are we going to do? Golly, we will get a whopping if they find out. He was shivering. We better turn them loose, said Red. They'll tell on us. They can't talk our language, not if they're from another planet. Yes, they can, because I remember my father talking about some stuff like that to my mother when he didn't know I was in the room. He was talking about visitors who could talk with the mind, telepathy or something. I thought he was making it up. Well, holy smokes, I mean, holy smokes, Red looked up. I tell you, my dad said to get rid of them. Let's sort of bury them somewhere, or throw them in the creek. He told you to do that? He made me say I had animals, and then he said, Get rid of them. I got to do what he says. Holy smokes, he's my dad. Some of the panic left Slim's heart. It was a thoroughly legalistic way out. Well, let's do it right now, then, before they find out. Oh, golly, if they find out, we will be in trouble. They broke into a run toward the barn, unspeakable visions in their minds. Chapter 9 it was different looking at them as though they were people. As animals, they had been interesting. As people, horrible. Their eyes, which were neutral little objects before, now seemed to watch them with active malevolence. They're making noises, said Slim in a whisper which was barely audible. I guess they're talking or something, said Red. Funny that those noises which they had heard before had not had significance earlier. He was making no move toward them. Neither was Slim. The canvas was off, but they were just watching. The ground meat, Slim noticed, hadn't been touched. Slim said, Aren't you going to do something? Aren't you? You found them. It's your turn now. No, it isn't. You found them. It's your fault. The whole thing. I was watching. You joined in, Slim. You know you did. I don't care. You found them, and that's what I'll say when they come here looking for us." Red said, All right for you. But the thought of the consequences inspired him anyway, and he reached for the cage door. Slim said, Wait! Red was glad to. He said, Now what's biting you? One of them's got something on him that looks like it might be iron or something. Where? Right there. I, I saw it before, but I thought it was just part of him. But if he's people, maybe it's a disintegrator gun. What's that? I read about it in the books from before the wars. Mostly people with spaceships have disintegrator guns. They point them at you, and you get disintegrated. They didn't point it at us till now, pointed out Red with his heart not quite in it. 
I don't care. I'm not hanging around here and getting disintegrated. I'm getting my father. Cowardly cat. Yellow cowardly cat. I don't care. You can call all the names you want, but if you bother them now, you'll get disintegrated. You wait and see. It'll be all your fault. He made for the narrow spiral stairs that led to the main floor of the barn, stopped at its head, then backed away. Red's mother was moving up, panting a little with the exertion and smiling a tight smile for the benefit of Slim in his capacity as guest. Red? You? Red, are you up there? Now don't try to hide. I know this is where you're keeping them. Cook saw where you ran with the meat. Red quavered. Hello, Ma. Now show me those nasty animals. I'm going to see to it that you get rid of them right away. It was over. And despite the imminent corporeal punishment, Red felt something like a load fall from him. At least the decision was out of his hands. Right there, Ma. I didn't do anything to them, Ma. I, I didn't know. They just looked like little animals, and I thought you'd let me keep them, Ma. I, I wouldn't have taken the meat, only they wouldn't eat grass or leaves, and we couldn't find good nuts or berries, and Cook never lets me have anything, or I would have asked her, and I didn't know it was for lunch, and— He was speaking on the sheer momentum of terror, and did not realize that his mother did not hear him, but, with eyes frozen and popping at the cage, was screaming in thin, piercing tones. Chapter 10 The astronomer was saying, A quiet burial is all we can do. There is no point in any publicity now, when they heard the screams. She had not entirely recovered by the time she reached them, running and running. It was minutes before her husband could extract sense from her. She was saying finally, I, I tell you, they're in the barn. I don't know what they are. No, no. She barred the industrialist's quick movement in that direction. She said, Don't you go. Send one of the hands with a shotgun. I, I tell you, I never saw anything like it. Little horrible beasts with, with, I, I can't describe it. To think that Red was touching them and trying to feed them. He was holding them and feeding them meat. Red began, I, I only, and Slim said, I, It was not. The industrialist said quickly, Now, you boys have done enough harm today. March into the house, and not a word, not one word. I'm not interested in anything you have to say. After this is all over, I'll hear you out. And as for you, Red, I'll see that you're properly punished. He turned to his wife. Now, whatever the animals are, we'll have them killed, he added quietly once the youngsters were out of hearing. Come, come, the, the children aren't hurt, and after all, they haven't done anything really terrible. They just found a new pet. The astronomer spoke with difficulty. Pardon me, ma'am, but can you describe these animals? She shook her head. She was quite beyond words. Can you just tell me if they— I'm sorry, said the industrialist apologetically, but I think I had better take care of her. Will you excuse me? A moment, please, one moment. She said she had never seen such animals before. Surely it is not unusual to find animals that are completely unique on an estate such as this. I'm sorry, let's not discuss that now. Except that unique animals might have landed during the night. The industrialist stepped away from his wife. What are you implying? I think we had better go to the barn, sir. The industrialist stared a moment, turned, and suddenly and quite uncharacteristically began running. The astronomer followed, and the woman's wail rose unheeded behind them. Chapter 11 The industrialist stared, looked at the astronomer, turned to stare again. Those? Those, said the astronomer. I have no doubt we appear strange and repulsive to them. What do they say? Why, that they are uncomfortable and tired and even a little sick, but that they are not seriously damaged and that the youngsters treated them well. Treated them well? Scooping them up, keeping them in a cage, giving them grass and raw meat to eat? Tell me how you speak to them. It may take a little time. Think at them. Try to listen. It will come to you, but perhaps not right away. The industrialist tried. He grimaced with the effort of it, thinking over and over again. The youngsters were ignorant of your identity. 
and the thought was suddenly in his mind. We were quite aware of it, and because we knew they meant well by us according to their own view of the matter, we did not attempt to attack them. Attack them, thought the industrialist, and said it aloud in his concentration. Why, yes, came the answering thought, we, we are armed. One of the revolting little creatures in the cage lifted a metal object, and there was a sudden hole in the top of the cage and another in the roof of the barn, each hole rimmed with charred wood. We hope, the creatures thought, it will not be too difficult to make repairs. The industrialist found it impossible to organize himself to the point of directed thought. He turned to the astronomer. And with that weapon in their possession they let themselves be handled and caged? I, I don't understand it. But the calm thought came. We would not harm the young of an intelligent species. Chapter 12 It was twilight. The industrialist had entirely missed the evening meal and remained unaware of the fact. He said, Do you really think the ship will fly? If they say so, said the astronomer, I'm sure it will. They'll be back, I hope, before too long. And when they do, said the industrialist energetically, I will keep my part of the agreement. What is more, I will move sky and earth to have the world accept them. I was entirely wrong, doctor. Creatures that would refuse to harm children under such provocation as they received are admirable. But, you know, I almost hate to say this. Say what? The kids, yours and mine. I'm almost proud of them. Imagine seizing these creatures, feeding them or trying to, and keeping them hidden. The amazing gall of it. Red told me it was his idea to get a job in a circus on the strength of them. Imagine. The astronomer said, Youth. Chapter 13 The merchant said, We will be taking off soon? Half an hour, said the explorer. It was going to be a lonely trip back. All the remaining seventeen of the crew were dead, and their ashes were to be left on a strange planet. Back they would go with a limping ship, and the burden of the controls entirely on himself. The merchant said, It was a good business stroke, not harming the young ones. We will get very good terms, very good terms. The explorer thought, Business. The merchant then said, They've lined up to see us off, all of them. You don't think they're too close, do you? It would be bad to burn any of them with the rocket blast at this stage of the game. They're safe. Horrible-looking things, aren't they? Pleasant enough inside. Their thoughts are perfectly friendly. You wouldn't believe it of them. That immature one, the one that first picked us up. They call him Red, provided the explorer. That's a queer name for a monster. Makes me laugh. He actually feels bad that we're leaving. Only I can't make out exactly why. The nearest I can come to it is something about a lost opportunity with some organization or other that I can't quite interpret. A circus, said the explorer briefly. What? Why the impertinent monstrosity? Why not? What would you have done if you had found him wandering on your native world? Found him sleeping on a field on earth? Red tentacles, six legs, pseudopods, and all. Chapter 14 Red watched the ship leave. His red tentacles, which gave him his nickname, quivered their regret at lost opportunity to the very last, and the eyes at their tips filled with drifting yellowish crystals that were the equivalent of earthly tears. End of Youth by Isaac Asimov